All right, good morning, everyone. Let's gather together, get this meeting started. Thanks for everyone's patience. Uh, so welcome to our March uh, Office of Healthcare Affordability uh, board meeting. Thanks to the board members for uh, being here in a timely way. I couldn't reciprocate that. Sorry, air travel was a little slower than expected. Uh, so with that, let's uh, bring the meeting to order and take roll. Morning, Dr. Mark Galley. Present. Dr. David Carlisle. Present. Dr. Sandra Hernandez. Present. Richard Kronick. Present. Ian Lewis. Present. Elizabeth Mitchell. Present. Dr. Richard Pan. Present. Don Moulds. All right, seven present, one absent. Great. Um, thank you, and again, welcome to the board and the public. Appreciate everyone being here for this important conversation. Elizabeth, I'll turn it to you for updates. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, and note that this meeting is being recorded, and we'll start just with a review of our agenda. So in terms of our agenda today, after executive updates from Vishal and myself, we will focus today's meeting on the spending growth targets. First, we have follow-up items that the board requested information about, and then we will present information on the approach to analyzing entities against the spending growth target, including some, uh, some considerations that are specific to Medi-Cal and Medicare. We got a lot of questions and comments about Medi-Cal at the last meeting we heard you um, and, and want um, to talk a little bit about that. The team has done a careful job of summarizing the input we got on the office's proposed target. We got very robust feedback, 224 comments. Um, they have had the unenviable task of summarizing those comments. I think they did an excellent job. Um, we then got uh, feedback from the advisory committee uh, about our summary and, and heard their additional feedback. Appreciate um, board member David Carlisle attending um, virtually the advisory committee meeting and he will um, have the opportunity to add anything that we missed, and of course, we'll have public comment. Um, Rick Kronick asked at the last meeting that the office respond to the stakeholder input that we have received vis-a-vis -vis the proposed target, which we will do. So that four, uh, number four on the agenda is very lengthy, so we have, we will stop four times for public comment um, during that agenda item to make sure you have ample opportunity um, to give public comment on the various information that we will cover. And with that, I will um, move on to the executive uh, updates. So for our health workforce development program, um, which seeks to increase access to healthcare in underserved areas, we know and we've heard um, about the healthcare workforce crisis that California's um, facing. Two quick updates I wanted to give. One is the Song Brown Primary Care Residency Program awarded more than $72 million to 121 different institutions supporting almost 300 residency slots. We know we need to train more um, professionals, every, everything from community health workers um, up to doctors. So we are wor busily working on that. And then we're excited that the Certified Wellness Coach cert Certification Portal launched in mid-February and is currently accepting applications from individuals that meet the workforce pathway to become certified as wellness coaches. So we're excited that we already have some certified uh, wellness coaches and we are working to with schools and community-based organizations to best uh, use those professionals. For the healthcare payments data program, I'm pleased to note that on March 1st, HCI submitted a report to the California legislature on the HPD program, focusing on the completeness and quality of the data collected. So we believe that the HPD has data on 82% of Californians um, and their healthcare services. We don't have all of the self-insured lines of business, but that's a pretty robust uh, data set. Um, efforts to expand the HPD are underway, including add, adding data from dental plans and insurers, as well as capitation payments and, and other non-claims um, payment data. So we've had a great collaboration between our OCA teams and our HPD teams about how to collect that non-claims data. The report that we submitted to the legislature also notes that HCI will need long-term funding for the HPD program. So those are a few um, general HCI updates. And with that, I will turn it over to Deputy Director Pagani. Thank you, Director Landsberg. Um, I'm going to be providing an update on our total healthcare expenditures rulemaking. 
I'm pleased to announce that OCA's total healthcare expenditures data collection. Um, next slide, please. I'm pleased to announce that OCA's total healthcare expenditures data collection emergency regulations were approved by the Office of Administrative Law on March 4th and became effective immediately for a period of five years. I'd like to thank OCA staff and all of you who provided written comments, participated in the regulations workshop, and provided comment at our various meetings to help us get this package over the finish line. Data collection is a first step in our efforts to bend the cost curve and make healthcare more affordable. Um, so not listed on this slide, I, I, I wanna remind everyone that OCA is accepting submissions of interest to serve as a member of the healthcare um, affordability advisory committee. Um, a link is now available on our website through April 1st um, for those who would like more information or would like to complete an interest form. The term for those appointments will begin on July 1st, 2024 and last through June 30th, 2026. If you have any questions, you could email our inbox at OCA at hcaihkai.ca.gov. And uh, on the next slide, um, as we do at every meeting, um, I'd like to remind both the board and the public about our slide formatting key. Um, as, as you all know, that the yellow arrow in the, the presentation are areas for which OCA has decision-making authority, um, but it's important for us to get stakeholder input on these areas. And the green areas denote uh, decision-making uh, that rests with the board. And with that, um, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Sure, thank you, both Elizabeth and Vishal. Before we turn to public comment on the items that Vishal and Elizabeth shared, want to turn to the board and see if there's any comments, questions on these. Turn to the left and the right. Okay, so we'll take a moment for public comment. Thank you. We will now recognize members of the public for comment on this agenda item, the executive director's update. Please reserve comments on other items for other public comment periods or the general public comment period at the end. To ensure equitable access to verbal public comment, we will alternate between members of the public present in this room and those attending virtually. <clears throat> those in this room may line up at the podium. Those attending virtually who wanna comment should click the raised hand button. If you're dialing in this meeting on the conference line and you would like to provide public comment, we ask that you submit your comments via email at oka at hki.ca.gov, or please join this meeting online if you would like to make comment. Please keep your comments to two minutes or less if possible, so we can hear from as many members of the public as we can. Please note that while the Healthcare Affordability Board is committed to communication and transparency, board members and staff will not be responding to public comment. Additionally, the board may not discuss or act on any matter raised during the public comment period that is not included on the meeting agenda, except to place the matter on a future meeting agenda. Looking to individuals in the room, if you'd like to make a public comment, please step to the podium. Looking to individuals online, noting we have roughly 90 attendees online, seeing no hands raised and seeing no members uh, of the public at the podium. That concludes public comment on this item. Great, thank you. So moving on to our uh, consent items, I'm gonna turn it over to Vishal to review the February minutes. I just wanna say personal thank you to Ian for chairing that meeting. Thank you so much. Heard it went fantastic and nearly didn't show up today so you could replicate <laughs> that performance. But uh, whew. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, I know Sandra wasn't able to make the meeting either. So uh, we appreciate you stepping in. So, so we just have the February meeting minutes. Um, they've been distributed and include written public comments received since the meeting. Um, they include all the public comments um, that were part of the 45 day notice as well as any letters we received after March 11th. I will move uh, approval of the minutes. Second. Okay. Uh, before we go to a full vote, are there any public comment on this uh, agenda item? 
So if members of the public would like to make a public comment on the meeting minutes, please step to the podium. Those attending virtually, please raise your hand. Seeing none, that concludes public comment on this item. Great, could we go to a vote? Dr. Mark Galley. I'll abstain. Dr. David Carlisle. Aye. Dr. Sandra Hernandez. I abstain. Dr. Richard Kronick. I mean, excuse me, Richard Kronick. Aye. Ian Lewis. Aye. Elizabeth Mitchell. Aye. Dr. Richard Pan. Aye. That's five yeses, two abstains. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so moving swiftly to our big one, uh, item four, I think I'll turn it over to you first, Elizabeth, or Vishal right away, okay. So uh, for this action item, we'll be covering the statewide spending target, including public comments, advisory committee feedback, board follow-up items, uh, and consideration of uh, Medi-Cal spending. For uh, board follow-up items, um, today we'll provide information about two items listed here. Uh, the first one is uh, publicly available total cost of care data from the Integrated Healthcare Association. And the second one is an estimate of the number of entities subject to the, the target when it becomes enforceable. Next slide. And one more. Um, so at the uh, last month's board meeting, um, board member Lewis requested a, a presentation on IHA's work on total cost of care. Since the data is publicly available, I, I will be summarizing key findings. Uh, the Integrated Healthcare Association, or IHA, is a nonprofit industry association that brings together the healthcare community to solve industry-wide challenges that stand in the way of high-value equitable care. IHA publishes the California Regional Healthcare Cost and Quality Atlas, which aggregates and reports data to help purchasers, health plans, and policymakers reduce variation and achieve high quality, affordable patient-centered care. OCA has re reviewed available total cost of care data between 2017 and 2021 on California's commercial market from the IHA Atlas tool a summary of the findings from this data, uh, as listed here, um, align with OCA's findings on the five-year rate of growth in statewide spending for healthcare. I want to caveat that the measures and populations are not identical. Uh, the, the findings also demonstrate substantial variation in growth rates from year to year by product type and by geography. Uh, the findings also highlight the feasibility of achieving OCA's proposed target of 3% annual spending growth over five years, um, at least for a subset of products and payment arrangements. Next slide. So uh, what data is in the IHA Atlas? Uh, the data analysis for total cost of care uh, for a is for that that we looked at is for a continuous set of five years, um, uh, which focuses on the commercial um, market data, because data is not available for um, Medicare fee for service or um, the Medi-Cal market for for the, the five years that uh, we looked at. For PPO, um, it does include a portion of uh, ASO enrollment or administrative services only or self-insured enrollment. And then on the next slide, you'll see the, the plans that contribute their data to the Atlas. And they include uh, the, the, the major health plans in California. Next slide. Uh, this slide here shows that the average annual increase in the total cost of care during 2017 to 2021 for the overall commercial market was roughly 5%. The individual year over year changes are shown in the table to the right. We want to note that these trends include two years that overlap with the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Um, so this slide focuses on the, the HMO market uh, line or line of business within the commercial market. And we see here um, the average annual increase in the total cost of care for the HMO line of business was roughly 
3% during that five-year period. Next slide. Um, this slide shows the average annual increase in the total cost of care for the PPO line of business, um, which was roughly uh, 10%. Next slide. The, the data shows tremendous uh, regional variation um, as, you, as, you, as you see here. As part of OCA's public reporting of statewide spending, uh, we intend to report data by geographic regions, including by Covered California rating regions and the Los Angeles County service planning areas. And moving on to the next slide, um, so uh, key takeaways, um, while commercial market average annual growth rate in total cost of care was 5% during that five-year period, there was substantial variation in annual rates of growth. Uh, this includes, um, you know, by year between 2017 and 2021, um, there was, a, 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 you know, for, for the pandemic year of 2020, a 6% drop. And then for 2021, a rebound of 16%. By product, um, there's um, significant variation uh, of HMOs performing at 3% for that period, while uh, PPOs or fee-for-service products um, having a, a average annual uh, growth at 10%. And then for ge geography, there's also large differences. Um, for, for San Francisco, the total cost of care increased from about 6,600 in 2017 to 7,700 in 2021. And the, the figures for Kern County are also listed here. And then uh, looking, looking at it in a different way, um, looking at it in terms of cumulative five-year growth, um, the Central Valley uh, North increased by 14%, while Northern counties increased by 34%. And then, Going on to the last slide, um, so for, for this slide, I, I want to note that these implications are are, um, are solely identified by OCA. Um, first, OCA finds that it's uh, feasible to, to hold year-over-year -year spending growth um, to, to 3%, but there is substantial variation by year, by product and geography, um, in, in indicating that some uh, types of products um, um, may face challenges in meeting the target. Um, second, um, cost reducing strategies um, can contribute to meeting the target. So based on uh, IHA Atlas data, HMO products have lower cost growth trends on average compared to, to PPO fee-for-service products. Um, however, um, there have been some decline in, in HMO enrollment over time when, when you exclude Kaiser um, OCA's effort to showcase effective cost reducing strategies has identified several uh, to date um, that can be um, implemented and um, by healthcare entities. These, these include population health and chronic condition management, improving maternity quality equi uh, equity and outcomes, um, lowering the total cost of care through uh, appropriate site of care, and then many other promising approaches um, are identified in the literature that, that we shared back in January. And um, with that, um, I just have kind of one more section to cover and then uh, we, we, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Um, so um, for the next section, um, estimate of entities, subject to the target. Um, this was also a board follow-up item. Uh, so we've uh, listed the estimated number of entities here. Uh, these include um, health plans, which meet our 40,000 covered lives threshold that's um, outlined in our THCE data collection regulations. So uh, based on enrollment data that we've looked at, about 33 health plans would, would meet this threshold. For hospitals, um, based on publicly available data, um, more than 400 general acute care facilities operate in California. We do want to note that many of these are part of systems. And then for physician organizations, um, 
as part of our THC data collections regulations, um, we had a, we had an attribution addendum, which was part of the data submission guide, and approximately 300 physician organizations have been identified there. We we do want to note that um, there is currently no single source of, source of truth for um, the universe of provider organizations in California. It is an incomplete list. We have what's available for, for RBOs and capitated providers from DMHC. Our payer partners um, have been helpful in us, for, w helpful in identifying physician organizations as well. Um, so, um, you know, this will be an iterative process to identify additional physician organizations. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there's there's no source of truth um, that that systematically captures um, and reports on structure, affiliation, and ownership, especially for physician organizations. And um, I'll now turn it back over to um, the chair for. Great. Thanks, uh, Vishal, and as we sort of highlighted, uh, there's quite a few elements that we'll be talking about before the robust uh, discussion at the end. So I want to pause now uh, and get comments from the board and then we'll go to public comment. I just want to say on this last point that Vishal made about uh, uh, physician entities, physician organizations, we currently have an RFI out to uh, find a partner to capture this across California, not just in a point in time, but in an ongoing way. It's obvious in this work, uh, a bl an important blind spot that we need to fill. Uh, we'll do our best with what we have now, but hopefully as the work of this uh, office continues, that's something we're able to keep track of in a better way in California. So with that comment, uh, Richard Pan, I see your hand up and then Elizabeth will go to you. Go ahead, Richard. All right. Um, actually, I have several questions, but uh, um, first of all, maybe we'll start with this entity question. So, uh, just to be clear, because um, I understand you said many hospitals are part of systems, are we regulating individual hospitals or are we regulating systems? So, I think the original, I think I was the one who posed the initial question about number of entities. Uh, it really is about who are we regulating and exactly who has to essentially we're assessing against the cost target. So I assume the 33 plans are the one and plans. Is Kaiser considered one entity? I believe in the, so that's all their hospitals and plan and everything, right? So are the hospital, are Kaiser hospitals part of the hospital section or they're, because they're supposed to be one. I, I'm interested in how many entities we're actually regulating uh, directly against, um, you know, uh, setting the, going to be, Essentially, when we have the cost target, we're going to be going, you entity, we're going to assess against that cost target. Okay. So exactly how many are there? So we'd say 33 plans, 400 hospitals, is that? So when you say part of systems, are we regulating the system or the individual facilities? So I'd like to have clarity on that. I get the question on the physician organizations. I guess one of the other things is, is I don't know if the RFI, um, so in the end, when, you know, and as we, Set the car target. Um, is the is this whoever has the RFI? Um, are they going to identify all the physician organizations that need to meet the cost target? Or what happens if we go, oops, we missed one? Or oh, we regulated you and we didn't. What's the result of that? So if we can provide some clarity as to exactly how many organizations and who they are, that's going to be regulated. That's really the crux of the question, and I'm not sure if this slide really answers it. Yeah, I think. Um... Just maybe Vishal or Elizabeth or whoever can answer that, but certainly within health plans, I mean, there's, you know, speak about Kaiser, right? Plan, system, multiple hospitals, entities. Right. Do they so, roll up into one or yeah, not? I think yeah. is, is a good question. And I hope that the effort to identify all of the physician organizations now helps us be ready for when sure. the cost targets take form and even, you know, of course, when they're quote enforceable so that we have some runway on that. And I think the work starting now is going to help us be ready for then. But on the first question, yeah. Vishal or Elizabeth, do you want to? Yeah, for for the hospitals, um, that number, uh, well, f first I'll start off with Kaiser. Um, they do have their own definition in the statute for right. fully integrated yeah. delivery system. Um, and the way we're going to measure that is through um, in the attribution addendum. Uh, Kaiser Permanente um, 
Medical Group, which is the, the Northern California uh, uh, Physician Organization, and then their Southern California Permanente Group is the Southern, the one for the Southern California. So those two physician organizations are identified in the addendum and total medical expenses will be attributed to those, including so th for their so hospital spend. So they will actually be separate. The med two, med two Permanente Medical Groups will be viewed separately uh, from Kaiser overall. They're they're separate, fully integrated delivery systems. Okay, no, you're saying the medical groups because you just mentioned medical groups. Permanente Medical Group will be viewed separately from because you have Kaiser Hospitals, you have Kaiser Health Plan. But the hospital spending will be um, rolled up because um, all all the members are attributed to the medical group, and that'll include their inpatient care. So the Kaiser the spending from the Kaiser Hospitals will be um, attributed to the medical group. Okay, you know, I, I think, well, first of all, there's some clarity it's trying to serve for Kaiser and of the interest of what Kaiser has to think about that um, uh, and also others. Uh, but then also, when you said many hospitals are part of systems, are we going to be regulating systems or are we regulating individual hospitals? We're regulating both. So we put, we apply cost target both to the system and to their individual hospitals. So they get double jeopardy. Uh, it, it depends on how, um, they roll up to the parent organization and we're still working through that process. Okay, so it'd be helpful to have clarity. I just, I think it's important to have clarity as to who exactly, what entity yeah. we're actually regulating, right? And, you know, are we regulating bits and pieces? And then we're also then regulating the whole or we, because, I mean, I think there's an issue of clarity and fairness and, uh, and of course, adherence to the intent of the statute. Well, and I think it's a it's a good point maybe to sort of galvanize the question, not now, but maybe in our next meeting, we can use Kaiser as an example and we can break down how the Kaiser system, right, breaks into medical groups, the hospitals sure. fit into that, how we capture costs, uh, inpatient costs and where it flows into, because then we can imagine what, uh, how many entities under the Kaiser umbrella are going to be right. uh, uh, monitored and looked at? And I think that's part of the question. So we can maybe okay. carve All that right. out so, so I think, yeah. so as an get... illustration of how other systems might also be. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, actually, Kaiser would be one example, although Kaiser is treated slightly differently in the statute. And then maybe we can take another health system, right? Where there may be, but they aren't explicitly named <laughs> our, our or I should say Kaiser isn't explicitly named, but they're described. Uh, but um, anyway, but there's also other health systems as well, maybe less integrated, but again, it's important to have clarity as to what, right? Um, uh, what, are, what are we actually applying this to? Okay, I yeah, appreciate that. I could also add that um, if they're part of a health system that has a physician organization, some of that, that will be captured through the, the payer data submission and there's a methodology in how they attribute spending. Um, so the, the, that attribution addendum is gonna include some uh, physician organizations that are part of health systems, and that's how we'll measure systems that way. Um, but for hospitals that aren't part of systems, um, as we talked about in our January meeting, we're gonna have to develop additional um, measurement um, for, 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 for standalone hospitals. Okay, all right, well, I, I think it's gonna be important to have clarity on exactly how we're going about doing this because I'm not sure it's necessarily fair to take one entity and says we're going to measure you in five different ways and five different bits and so forth, right? Um, and gotcha on this one, even though everything else is okay, right? Et cetera. So uh, that that can create all sorts of problems. Um, the other uh, question I have, uh, and I appreciate, again, looking at the IHA, da IHA data, um, are, so, because now I have to admit that your, the conclusion that's feasible doesn't seem concordant with the data you presented, uh, especially since it is higher than, than, than 3%. The only group that was close to 3% was the HMOs. Uh, the other, I guess the question is then is, is that, and, we, and you also note that more people are moving away from HMOs to essentially PPO products, at least on the commercial side. Um, and of course we don't have Medicare or Medi-Cal data in there, but the, um, I guess the question I also have is, is that, well, let's put it this way. I mean, there's some, sometimes people don't have a choice because that's what their employer, they only offer one plan. Sometimes people do have a choice. Generally, um, 
I would say, and I, and I, I assume consumers are pretty intelligent most of the time, uh, having dealt with many of them, um, the, uh, that if you have, you know, basically a more significant illness, i.e. you're more expensive uh, as well, uh, and you want flexibility, you pick a PPO plan. If everything's pretty much okay, you pick an HMO plan. So, um, is, so are we also looking at the risk profile of the people who sign up for the relative plans? Because the fact that the PPO is at 9%, HMO is at uh, 3%, is that because of behaviors that perhaps are related to uh, need or desire for healthcare uh, collectively, right? Um, and um, so I think we need to be cautious that what we're not doing is we're sticking a lid and basically telling people who are looking for are requiring more, you know, specialty care or something that we're basically trying to cap them off uh, by, by an amount that really applies mainly, you know, to people who mainly are choosing it because they're generally okay, right? Maybe a few minor stuff, et cetera. Uh, um, uh, so, I, so have we looked at the difference between the populations picking the PPO versus the HMO plans? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Pan. The, the IHA data does uh, risk adjust, so it's not, it's not an adjusted figures. So that these are adjusted or unadjusted figures? risk adjusted. So, so, so you could come. You so, could the, so you're saying the, 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 so the percentage amount, so they adjust the amount of money that of spend and the increase in spend by risk. No, it's more of a risk adjustment that's applied so that you could compare two different market segments. Okay. I, okay. I, I, be interested in looking exactly how they do that. Um, but again, you know, if you look at the market, basically you're telling me the average is much higher than from the, the data that you're presenting is higher than 3%. Yeah, this is under the status quo um, that PPOs are, are, and we're trying to change that through um, the work of the office. No, sure, yeah. sure. No, I get it. Yeah. But but the thing is, and I'm not saying we set them, you know, that the, the growth is 4.98%, right? Uh, the average annual growth. I'm not saying that's, you know, we pick that number, right? Which, by the way, is the average. Uh, so, uh, but I think, you know, three and essentially almost five is a big difference. So, um, so, you know, I, uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm just yeah, yeah. saying that there seemed to be a little discordance there. And then um, you're saying it's fuel because the HMOs, which are basically the best performing, were only 3%, and the PPOs were 10%. So I, I think something, you know, we, we need to look at that. And as you should point out, there's a lot of variation. The other thing I'd also make note, and because um, uh, in our previous uh, meeting, um, you know, we had some presentations about affordability and so forth. Um, and one of the things I think, one of the comments I made at the time was about the Affordable Care Act. In fact, we were just celebrated the uh, 14th, yeah, 14th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. And and what struck me actually was is that there was actually a little discussion on social media. You always a little skeptical about social media, but this came from Paul Krugman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He made note: this, so did the ACA bend the cost curve, right? Because that was a big debate. Did the ACA bend the cost curve? Because people actually claimed at the time the ACA was going to drive up healthcare costs. And he said, call it coincidence, but excess cost growth quote call it coincidence, but excess cost growth, health spending, growing faster than GDP, basically ended when it passed. Now. You know, that's sort of a blanket term. There's lots of things that might have happened that might be coincidence, as he said. But I think, you know, when we looked at data, we should think, you know, post ACA and pre ACA should be considered differently, right? You know, ACA changed some fundamental aspects of the healthcare market. Um, maybe not entirely as some people chose, but it certainly did. And I think we need to, so when we look at data and we go back and we try to pull in data from way before, um, I'm not saying it's totally it's that's entirely invalid, but I think we're not giving enough credit to what the ACA actually did. And in fact, this whole little uh, social media debate, I think, acknowledges that the ACA uh, actually did do something uh, when it comes to healthcare uh, spending growth. Thank you. I know a number of other comments. I'll just lift up. I think one of the important things that. Um, Dr. Pan said was just understanding the IHA data at maybe the next level down would be useful to make sure it's not even, you know, apples to oranges. I will be the first to say, you know, the stark difference between HMOs and PPOs may actually, you know, it, it's important to look at 
who are the patients selecting each product? Good point. But then what are the attributes of how each product is actually functioning? Where is the administrative burden? Where is the various tools that help us make sure that high value care is prioritized, et cetera. So I think making sure we dig into all parts of that will be important and it is starkly different. Um, and on the 14th uh, birthday of the ACA, uh, not only did it maybe do something on cost growth, but it certainly impacted the real lives of lots of Californians in major, major ways. And we continue to try to build on that through the work of the legislature and the administration and a number of others. So happy birthday, yes, but more to come, we hope. Uh, the uninsured rate when I came into the legislature, which was when the ACA passed, was around, I think, uh, for people under 64, so take out the Medicare folks, I think was uh, somewhere around like 20% or so. And I understand we were at a record low nationally, uh, around 6%, or at least California. So uh, definitely got more people covered. Right. Yes, and more work to do. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm going to go to you next and then Ian. Thank you. And on the ACA piece, I think that what really was primarily focused on coverage, leaving the hard work of affordability <laughs> to the rest of us. So here we are. But um, I actually wanted to go back to the IHA. Um, data as well. First of all, I think it's just a remarkable resource that California has. And so health plans and providers have had years of visibility into cost trends. So none of this is a surprise. And we have this sort of shared resource where we can all have a sense of sort of what needs to change. So I, just first of all, I'm very appreciative of IHA and their work. But on one of, I think it was your conclusions, I couldn't follow the logic where you said, yes, some, if it was like number one on a slide back there. Yes, you know, 3% is achievable, get that, but it might be hard for others because I, it, I'm not sure the data supported that because the ones who were lower have demonstrated the ability to control costs. So there's nothing saying they couldn't control it even more effectively which I think tracks with what we heard from Memorial Care, which said cost containment was largely uh, driven by leadership decisions and governance because there are ways to do it. We all know that. It was just sort of, did they commit to doing it? And then the outliers, the higher cost ones, they have even more opportunity because they, <laughs> they might not have um, done some of that heavy lifting to reduce costs. So, and you know, for decades, we've known that 30% of healthcare spending really doesn't drive outcomes it's and it, there are savings opportunities. So I just, I'm trying to track the logic leap that just because not everyone has hit 3% that it, that it might be harder because it might even be easier. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I would say that um, there's opportunities for savings in the PPO market. Um, it's just kind of looking um, for, for them to, to achieve the same trend in HMO, it, the, the point we were trying to make is, you know, they, they have some work to do right. to, to, to reach that. So, so um, it, it would be challenging in that regard. Or because they haven't done it, there might be more opportunity, I guess. Would yeah, be yeah, my, I could see, see that logic. point as well. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I hadn't planned to mention this, but Richard inspired me um, on the attribution question. I'm actually more interested in tracking the impact on primary care than on the individual hospitals and below the system level so that all the savings aren't coming out of primary care. How are we tracking the impact on those entities below the system level? So, um, yeah, next month we're going to have an extended discussion about primary care. Margareta will be back. Um, so, um, we are going to be collecting as part of our total health care expenditure data collection. We'll be measuring um, primary care spend. Um, so that's going to be at the payer level, but then um, uh, we'll also be doing uh, attribution to, to physician groups. Um, and uh, for, for hospitals, I'll have to, we'll have to take that back. Um, and for, for health systems, um, the, the most of our work has focused on how, you know, physician organizations, since they're the ones that are t tending to do the, the team space care. Um, but if you're part of a system, um, 
that that has a physician organization, we would we would be able to to measure it at that level. Um, it's just standalone hospitals. Um, that's that's a question mark for now. Thanks, Elizabeth. Ian. Thank you. Um, you know, when I learned about the IHA report, it, it prompted me to go back to a data warehouse that um, my own fund I participate in and some others have put together about 350,000 covered lives, north and south, um, three quarters of which experience is in Kaiser. And for the period of 2019 to 2022, um, per claim costs at Kaiser, this is the cost that, that Kaiser assigns to each claim or, or encounter, essentially. Actually, it was 2.4% per year during that time, including part of that was driven by a reduction in per script spending. Um, and I think a lot of that was due to uh, shifts in site of service, much like the memori memorial care presentation. Um, Total cost of care was above 3%, but that was largely driven, almost entirely driven by COVID uh, experience, especially laboratory costs. Um, so that reinforced for me some of the findings in the IHA report. Um, that was the good news. The bad news is that there's a disconnect between the cost of care and the premiums that purchasers are paying, and it really drove home to me the challenge that we're going to have even resting spending down to 3% or below, uh, making sure that that accrues to the benefit of consumers. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Ian. Uh, David and then Rick. Yes, thank you. Um, my question has to do with the uh, estimate of entities. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me that I know we have an RFI that's going to be more specific in terms of identifying uh, physician groups, but um, Kind of on the margin, uh, do we anticipate a um, a dispute resolution? There may be groups that are in or out, and there might be an interest on who's actually eligible or or where does the line lie? How, how do we respond to that? So the the statute is clear that physician organizations with 25 or fewer um, physicians is not included is is not subject to the cost growth targets. I think um, the subject the the purpose of the RFI is. As Vishal noted, literally no one in California knows who all of the provider organizations is. So we're, we'll start with the, the list of risk-bearing organizations that the Department of Managed Healthcare has. We'll mm -hmm. collaborate with the MHC Covered California um, and CHCS. So there's two issues: are you a physician? Or are you a provider organization that we should at least know exists? But I think the statute's pretty clear as to who is or isn't subject to the cost growth target. The reality is that the provider attribution approach that we're using requires the the plans to attribute cost to the physician organization. So it'll be the larger physician organizations to whom the health plans can attribute costs that we'll be focusing on in terms of um, uh, analyzing the, the spending growth targets. So first objective, get the list in the universe. <laughs> Second objective, figure out how big each is. That I think has yeah. got to be done and we, we get it. All right, uh, Rick, next. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation and not not really a question, but an exhortation, which um, you may already have responded to. But as a sort of self-identified data geek, um, uh, you know, the IHA. The work that the IHA has done bears a lot of similarities uh, to the work that the office will be doing in terms of collecting data from payers and analyzing it. And um, I, I imagine that there are many lessons learned uh, from the IHA about things that they wish they had done differently, which you may already have incorporated in the regulations that have just been published. But as we move forward in further in refining exactly what we're getting and what we're doing with it, um, you know, taking advantage of those lessons learned and maybe at some point coming back to the board um, with, you know, here, here's what we've learned uh, uh, and what we're can be doing differently and better than what the IHA did um, might might be helpful. I'm not not so sure about the coming back to the board, but at least the internal part. Are you uh, suggesting 
a IHA presentation here on how they've done it over the years. I think it might be helpful. Learning. I mean, I think the main thing I'm suggesting, and you likely have already done this, is you know serious consultations yeah. with the folks at the IHA and at OnPoint that um, you know, I think is their contractor, or at least used to be their contractor, uh, doing a lot of the analytic work. Just make sure that 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 you that staff is aware of uh, both the um, you know, triumphs and pitfalls of what's been done. You know, we've talked a little bit here about attribution, the difficulty of attribution. IHA has certainly had to deal with this on the PPO side. Um, and, and just, you know, making sure that uh, you take advantage of, of the learnings of the many years of, of the IHA effort. And, and, you know, I can imagine that a presentation would be helpful, but um, I, I would leave that to your judgment. Yeah, we, we've been in touch with IHA, um, and uh, we, we also use the same vendor on point for the HPD, uh, and then they also support our total healthcare expenditure um, data submission. And um, we're, we're building on a lot of their work as well, um, especially on the non-claims data collection. Um, so, so having kind of a, a more, more granular look at some of the data. Okay, other Questions from the board. Okay, we're going to move to public comment. I just don't want to lose Ian's really important. Which, oh, I thought we were. Got it. Sorry, public. I jumped the gun. I think we're coming back. We're going to have plenty of public comment opportunities. But before we move on, I just want to lift up Ian's point that setting a cost growth target, making sure everyone hits it. For example, does not necessarily translate into the affordability opportunity that I know this board takes very, very seriously. And I think as we grapple through this stage in our decision making and the work of the office, keeping that, frankly, you know, vital, almost the reason why question at the front of mind is really important. So thanks, Ian, for raising it. Okay, we can keep moving. All right, so before we get to public comment, um, you have to endure me, I'm CJ Howard, uh, for a few minutes anyways. Uh, happy Monday. Um, so we're gonna talk, some of this is a revisit from the last board meeting, but uh, a couple members weren't here and wanted to just circle back on it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some um, sort of timing and other considerations around the progressive enforcement process. Um, so this slide should look familiar to most of you. Again, just kind of putting this into the context of how we get to setting and enforcing targets. So the first step that we spent a lot of time in uh, has been around the setting of the statewide spending target. Um, the statewide spending target, as you know, we need to set um, on or before June 1st of 2024 for a uh, spending target for 2025, which compares the growth from 2024 to 2025. Uh, the target setting methodology discussions, as we know, have been rooted deeply in uh, consumer affordability. And we've also acknowledged that a statewide spending target cannot uniformly account for the circumstances that impact each entity's performance against the target. In other words, we know that there are certain things that are going to happen in some segments that aren't going to apply somewhere else or that might happen in one physician organization that don't equally apply to another. Uh, and so that's where we get to the discussion around assessing entity performance against the statewide target. And so the office is committed uh, to considering each entity's performance against the target and would review circumstances that have impacted performance. And so we would, that all happens before we would then take progressive enforcement action. Um, so from last board meeting and from uh, advisory committee meetings and previously, the, there's a list of considerations um, that we've heard that should be uh, considered when evaluating entity performance against uh, the target, so these would be reasonable factors that we might want to think as mitigating circumstances for why an entity may have exceeded this target, including statutory changes that impact healthcare costs, changes in Medicare and Medi-Cal, reimbursement, investments to improve care and reduce future costs, acts of God or catastrophic events, emerging and unforeseen advances in medical technology, emerging high costs and high value pharmaceuticals and cost increases related to specialty pharmaceuticals, costs associated with increased organized labor costs, annual changes in age and sex of the entity's population, and changes in an entity's patient base or acuity. Um, before I break for some more input and discussion of this, I want to just kind of put this into context of how this could 
um, play out. And so this is an example related to, to primary care investment. And so we, we note that the intention of the primary care and behavioral health care benchmarks is to ultimately increase investments and build infrastructure and capacity around primary care and um, behavioral health. Uh, and ultimately the goal is to, to shift resources away from uh, high cost, low value care and towards uh, low cost, higher value care and, and ultimately do this in a way that the spending does not raise the cost for consumers. Um, and, but we also acknowledge that shifting of these resources may take time and, and may not yield immediate savings. And so if an entity were to exceed the target due to significant investments in primary care and behavioral health, OCO would consider this as a factor when assessing performance against the target and could mitigate steps in the progressive enforcement process. Um, and a part of the discussions last month were around timing. Uh, and so OCO's plan is to develop an approach and to implement assessing performance against the target for these types of investments. And we're intending to have further discussion around how, you know, the, the practical details of this uh, later this starting later this year or starting this year and continuing. And so wanted to I think, take a stop here to see if there were other, you know, as, as we're just exploring these concepts, are there other concepts that the board would like to raise that we should uh, take into consideration or at least explore how we would uh, evaluate an entity's performance against the target. So I'll turn it over to the chair to facilitate discussion around this point before moving into a couple other uh, progressive enforcement uh, considerations. Elizabeth first. Thank you. Um, I, I feel particularly strongly about bullet three, um, which is making sure that investments in primary care and behavioral health um, are not in any way um, uh, <laughs> disincentivized because that's where we want investment to go. So I'm, and I know you said we were going to have this conversation next uh, month, but I'm, I'm really interested in understanding the levers to make sure we protect primary care behavioral health. And I would add maternal, maternal health um, and maybe a couple others, but just really being clear at the outset that those are, those are, are positive deviations. <laughs> Um, so, so that's, I, I think, what I think is probably most important and that that conversation happen now um, so that as people begin to implement that it's in, kept in mind. Certainly these factors, I guess another one might be uh, workforce stability. Um, so, uh, or access. Right. Um, so even as we're talking here about, you know, congratulating ourselves for increased investments in in in, in various aspects of the workforce, um, if uh, they don't have jobs to go to, right, and entities and people can't get care because no one's available to provide it, um, right. So actually, interesting enough, we've struggled with that in Medi-Cal plans before, right, where um, where state did sort of essentially set, you know. Uh, rates uh, and uh, people couldn't get specialty care. In fact, actually, there was a study that showed that um, actually came out UC Davis, I believe, several years uh, several years ago, showed that uh, quality of care for um, patients who had cancer uh, who are on Medi-Cal was actually equivalent to being uninsured. The access was so bad, right? That's not what we want. Okay, um, so. We want so somewhere here we need to be sure of that. And we, and by the way, you know, we do have in DMHC, you know, access, access, you know, regulations regarding that, but certainly, um, and you know, that's not a statutory change, but being able to meet some of those other requirements is going to be, you know, existing uh, regulatory requirements is also going to be important, right? So you can actually meet the uh, requirements necessarily that we already have in place for patient protections, right? And sometimes that costs money. Okay, uh, so I just point that out. So it's not only changes, it's also meeting existing, um, uh, if that's what the cost is to meet existing protection protection rules that we have already have in place, laws, we need regulations we have in place, um, and that's the cost of doing it. Then the, I guess the other question though I also have is, um, you know, appreciate the list exactly how is this going to be, how are these essentially um, 
factor is going to be adjusted, right? So are we going to make it very bureaucratic and costly, right? Are they going to have to spend a lot of time filing stuff or what? So, so I think that's going to be important to talk about too. So it's great we have this list here, but what does it take to get an adjustment here, right? Um, uh, so um, hopefully, cha well, changes in Medicare and Medi-Cal reimbursement, hopefully all they have to do is say, this is what percentage of patients we have in those entities, right? That they don't need to file lots, a lot of other paperwork, right? Because that's pretty public. Obviously, I'll, we run the Medi-Cal program, and of course, we get information from CMS about Medicare, right? But some of these things, um, and, you know, so again, it's really the burden of doing this, especially, I mean, what we just found out, we have approximately, we'll find out exactly, 750 entities that we're regulating, according to our last presentation, somewhere plus or minus, et cetera, when we find some more uh, people. Um, but what is their capacity? How, what percentage of those are going to have to have action plans? What percentage of them are going to have to basically provide evidence or proof of one of, or multiple of these, right, because they're over the cost target? Um, what, what's the burden uh, on the agency of doing the cost plan? How are we going to be sure that those those are done consistently, that we're not picking favorites? Like, we like you, so we'll make it easier on you. We don't like you, we'll make it harder on you. So we need to have consistent policies. And and for some of these, you know, essentially, so it's great we have this listed. So what does it take for someone to get an adjustment based on this item, right? That's going to be important to know. So, yeah, I'll amplify that. I think certainly... We have more to develop and more to learn about that process. You know, if you exceed the cost target for X, Y, and Z reasons, what's the burden to explain that? What does it look like? What does it mean? How does it get built in consistently to the corrective action plans and the uh, performance improvement plans, et cetera? I think all of those details are critical. I know the team's been thinking about that somewhat, but there's there's more to do. I guess I have a question for you. Could you be, um, I appreciate the workforce element that you're raising. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we saw that in a huge way during COVID, the workforce shortage, the cost, the mm -hmm. sort of movement across the country, uh, depending on where we were with transmission to, uh, or, or hospitalizations to where, where people actually worked for a period of time. Could you be a little bit more concrete what what you expect, what you could imagine, um, what it looks like to take that fully into account in this sort of process. Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, again, well, at the most fundamental, right, uh, in order to meet existing patient protection rules, we have uh, rules in TMHC and so forth for, I mean, it is for plans, but uh, you should at least be able to meet those, right? And if you have to have contracts and stuff that in order to be sure you actually can deliver that care that that's like the most fundamental basic right uh, hopefully we can go be you know, there's a little more beyond that actually workforce stability is part of the statute so there is a bit about you know being able to maintain uh, you know workforce stability um now of course could be that you know things can depending on the environment so so i do think sort of i guess workforce stability would ha obviously need some more work to figure out how to define that but so far, um, I haven't heard too many discussions, both when this legislation was coming up and even since then, people saying, oh, we don't, we need fewer healthcare providers. So, um, so, so basically, um, and this again, workforce stability is explicitly in the statute. So I do think being able to maintain workforce stability should be, uh, on that on this list of factors, right? Um, or, or, you know, relate to access, I guess I would say. Uh, it's really about the access. It's, I mean, stability is the lead access, but fundamentally it's about maintaining access to care, right? So if you're a medical group, you have a contract, you're a plan, et cetera, um, then um, that is something we, we currently expect, right? We actually have statute and regulations on that. Okay. Any clarifications for Richard? Because I think that's a, another concrete one that that we should build in and, and think about. I think it's a good one. And I appreciate the workforce implications on access, but access is, as you very well know, a, a complicated set of yes. factors that are in addition to the workforce piece. Oh, of so, course, yes. So thinking about access, I think, yeah. is a key 
a key piece. Okay. I was actually trying to narrow it in some ways, yeah. but uh -huh. yeah, but if I agree, yes, I mean, obviously access is access yeah. over at large, uh, if it goes down is probably not an outcome the public wants to see happen. All right, uh, David first, and then we can go to Ian. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think this uh, list of uh, performance target factors is uh, is really good, really complete. Um, I was looking at it, and the only thing that maybe stood out in my mind was, um, are we looking at uh, maybe geography um, appropriately? And I was thinking of the IHA report and the, the uh, Northern California factor. Um, there's probably a reason why healthcare costs for PPOs are higher in the extreme north. Um, not listed on this list, but it's probably just um, uh, to, to uh, Dr. Pant's point, access to care, lack of competition, um, uh, something else that's that's not really being captured on this list. I think good flag. I don't know if team wants to respond. Agree, it's a good flag. I actually hadn't thought about adjusting based on geography, but we'll we'll take it back and look at it as as we develop this more thoroughly. Thank you. But also, kind of, also this this sector discussion will also have some geographic implication, and we'll get not to get too far ahead. But that is a place where I expect we'll capture some of this conversation. But I think it's it's an important uh, feature. Okay. Come to you, Ian, and then Sandra. Yeah, I think actually you just went to it. I'm I'm of two minds whether this is a question for the sectoral discussion or these, but you know the question of equity um, pertains to access and and workforce. Of course, um, I I think we need to look very differently at entities, even though the target applies year over year within the same entity or system. I think we should look at entities a little bit differently if they're. Um, operating on a higher uh, cost basis, perhaps because of their um, the source of their funds, you know, disproportionately commercial funds, for instance, and have had the luxury of increased spending and focusing on on wealthier communities, as against uh, entities that are maybe more reliant on public funds and focused on working class communities of color and the like. Thanks, Ian. Um, Sandra, and then Rick, and we'll come back to you, Richard. Uh, thank you. I wanted to um, sort of add my appreciation for the list of potential areas for consideration. The way it's framed, it would suggest that when people exceed the target, these would be considerations we would look at. I presume the reverse is also true. I actually don't know about that. Uh, just from a workload perspective, I think we'll, we will be uh, focusing on the entities that have exceeded the targets. And yes, this, these are the factors we would. So I would just suggest that there will be entities that will meet the target for a number of these reasons. Yes. And it would be really important, I think, learning for the system as a whole to understand those. We, def I, we definitely will at a high level want to pull out those success stories and best practices. Yeah. And then point. I just want, I'm looking forward to the meeting, our next meeting to look at our primary care spend because I suspect the baseline for that is ridiculously low. And just to note for the record, that if you look at the medical literature on health outcomes, the correlation to accessing primary care and health outcomes is probably the strongest in the literature, bar none. So I, I wanted to specifically name primary care as an affirmative mitigation that we would look at on a spending uh, mitigation performance metric. Thank you. Well said um, as one of four <laughs> primary care providers on the board, um, uh, but I would uh, uh, also just elevate, and I, I think it's uh, not just hopefully we have the bandwidth to do the lift up what drove people to be at or below the cost target. I think that uh, discussion is going to be really critical moving forward to, I think many of your points, part of why a couple months ago we had some of the illustrations of strategies to reduce costs or stay below the cost target. I think those lessons, when I think about uh, major themes of our work, one of them is to drive system change and highlighting what is successful in the industry will um, certainly support that. So I think it's an important 
piece to lift up. So thanks for raising it, uh, Rick. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I also think this is a good list, uh, maybe to make explicit, I think, what both um, uh, Richard and David were saying. The investments to improve care and reduce future costs could, could perhaps be a little more specific about, does this mean investments to improve access, um, as, as I think Richard was, was suggesting? I am uh, extremely anxious about the length of this list and the implications of it. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, as is well known, I've argued and will argue later in, in this meeting that the um, uh, target that's been recommended by uh, OCA is, is too low. And um, I'll talk about that more later. Uh, I think it's important for OCA to make clear that the ability to uh, be excused from the target for these reasons should be extremely limited. Um, if we have, if you think about a, a say billion dollar um, uh, hospital that is three or 4% over whatever target it is we set. So 30 or $40 million a year over the target. I would think any consultant worth his or her salt could come up with a list of why these things justify 30 or $40 million extra. Um, and that if, that I don't know how to do this in whatever, regulatory framework uh, we, we come up with, but but I think that I, I would argue for, as I have, for a higher target, but then a lot of stringency on um, excuses from that target. Because I, I think the, the uh, scenario in which we have a relatively low target, but then everybody comes in and pays their consultants to explain why they're 30 or $40 million over if they're a billion dollar organization or less or more depending on the size is just an invitation for a lot of wasted effort and not going to get us to the affordability uh, goal that we you know, all share in common. So that we need to somehow change the decision calculus of, and I've said this before, so sorry for the repetition of people running health systems and hospitals that more revenue isn't necessarily a good thing. And I think if we have a pretty long list and a pretty open process for how you can get excused for not meeting the target, that we're not gonna be successful in changing that decision calculus because people are gonna say, yeah, we're gonna be over the target, but we'll be able to explain why. And, and, you know, not, none of us want that. I know other comments coming in, but I'm curious if there's any feedback or comment to Rick's thoughtful point. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. I, I think I'm next also. In the, oh, uh, right well, if, if I, it, uh, I, I'm gonna see if others wanna Okay, jump on well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something about that, and then, and then I'll, to you. okay. No or, well, I, I was gonna respond to Rick and then, but if it's okay, I was, I was gonna then finish up with, the other comment I was going to make, so um, which actually follow. So, so first of all, um, I, I, um, uh, I, I do share the same concern as Dr. Kronick that um, uh, that if, if it's simply a list of oh, this is why that you know that actually, and again, it becomes very it basically starts becoming very burdensome both on our agency and on the entities, right? So people are spending more and more money trying to justify stuff. So I think I think that that um, instead of on healthcare, frankly, we're just increasing our overhead. Um, so I, I think we want to be very careful about how we do this. Um, the other, I guess, the other comment I also want to make is is that, and just to follow up on what um, uh, some of those scenes said, is is that you know there was uh, especially as you know we're doing the statewide target, but now now we're trying to compare individual entities, right? The 750, whatever the final number is, entities, and that is why we put into the statute. Um, actually a risk adjuster, right? And we do comment about your risk and also an equity adjuster for that very reason that you brought up, uh, Ian, is that what happened is I don't want to penalize people who 
are focused on areas you know where our community is under resourced. Therefore, usually the healthcare entity has to put more resources in to make care more effective, right? Uh, so whether it's transportation or, in fact, in, frankly, in our Medi-Cal program, we're doing Cal-Aim because of that, because we realize that sometimes investments in some non-healthcare stuff actually helps bring down healthcare costs because those things that are absent are insufficient in those communities, right? And I point out that someone with diabetes who's in an under-resourced community, sometimes it costs more to take care of because there's fewer supports than someone with diabetes in a well-off community, right? And so we need to factor that factor that in. So hopefully we can come back to that and think about that as we are thinking about how we're going to apply our statewide cost target. And then by the way, we geography does because we we actually explicitly said we can have geographic targets and we have sector targets, right? So we do have a mechanism to eventually uh, impact the geography. Uh, uh, so as we move along, uh, we should and uh, we should be thinking of we should be thinking about those other mechanisms that are explicitly in the statute that help us address some of the issues that have come up and we should use those. So I hopefully as we're looking at, as we are now applying whatever the target we are to individual entities, that's where we should be having a risk adjuster uh, to take care of acuity. We should be having a, uh, a, a um, uh, equity adjuster, right? So if, for entity, and, and actually what we wanna do is we don't want people to spend money trying to come up with oh, all the reasons I'm over the target. We want to create incentives for people to improve access and quality of care as well as bringing down the costs. And I, I would again go back to um, the ACA again, not only increased coverage, it reduced the cost curve. That was the point Paul Krugman was making and many other people and it did. So you can have both. Uh, but you have to do it right. And we simply put a lid, we may just drive up spending on things that are less useful instead of the things that actually help people. Okay, other count Elizabeth. Thank you. I've already made my uh, plea for preserving, protecting primary care, behavioral health, and maternal health. But I also wanted to sort of both agree and disagree with Dr. Kronick. Um, I, I totally agree that we need a very short list of reasons if, if we miss a target for them to be taken seriously. And I want to particularly call out the, the one on Medicare and Medicaid. I worked for a health system. Whenever they wanted to raise commercial prices, they blamed Medicare and Medicaid every year. And I think we have to be very careful about <laughs> if and how we weigh that. Because, you know, yes, I understand all the cost shifting conversations, but there also has to be work put into changing the cost trajectory. Um, and then I, I actually think we can have a lower target because I think there are enormous resources in the health system, enormous talent and leadership to actually be successful. Health plans have had banner years, record profits. They can be investing in new programs like we heard from Anthem on maternal health. So I think I have a lot of confidence in their ability to do that. I'll just raise one point that I think I want to make sure at least and get the team's either agreement or correction on this point that where you are, wherever we set the cost target, wherever an entity hits is one thing. How they explain it based on this list is a different thing and that is going to modulate potentially the performance improvement plans and what happens over time but doesn't quote, excuse you from the cost target. And I think just to make sure that we understand, even if an entity spent, we had a list, an entity spent a good deal of money to explain based on that list, why they were over, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're excused from the cost target or the progressive enforcement process is going to be materially different. So I just wanna you know, make that statement, understand it, don't, I mean, don't disagree with your point, and I thought very thoughtful one, but want to make sure that they are, uh, if it is accurate to say they are uh, connected but separate activities, if you will. Please, but just to make sure I understand, I, I didn't suggest that the consultant puts together the, the report and says this justifies the 40 million and the, the entities off scot free, but if the office accepts the report, and, and or, or says, yes, we think you've explained well enough why you spent $40 million extra, there will be no enforcement. Then the entity is basically excused. 
Do I understand that correctly or am I missing something? I would ask the, the team. I want to. I, I would say my understanding is they they would have they obviously there'll be a process around that right and understanding that piece so it doesn't just because you can explain it doesn't mean you're excused by it. But go ahead, you Elizabeth. Want, wanna, you want to? I'm, I, I am. I, they they explain it and some of those explanations I, I imagine the office would say, come on, this doesn't really make sense. Correct. We're not accepting this, and then they're certainly subject to an, uh, progressive enforcement. But if the office says, yeah, I kind of get it, you know, you sort of explain why you spent 30 or 40 million dollars more than the, the target, then they basically would, would not be subject to progressive enforcement. They well, I, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a terminology issue. We actually consider the, con right, we have four steps in our progressive enforcement. And actually the first is to sit down and look at the data together. So that is, so any entity that exceeds the target, we will want to get into their books with them and understand the target. But yes, if an entity comes and says, we exceeded the target because we invested, you know, significantly in primary and preventive care, we, ha you know, we've hired these doulas, we really invested a lot in delivery system reform and team-based care, and that's the reason. Um, and we believe that these investments will lead to lower, you know, lower increases down the line. We certainly would not be in a position of of subjecting them to to financial penalties. To, to follow up, I'm in, in complete agreement with, with Sandra and, and and Elizabeth and others that you know we want to incentivize investments in primary care and behavioral health. And, uh, some of these other items on the list, which I know some of them come straight from statute. I'm much more nervous about. So the emerging and unforeseen advances in medical technology, emerging high cost, high value of pharmaceuticals. Um, I, I can imagine easily the consultants coming up with why this is okay. And uh, my uh, hope is that uh, we would send signals that the ability to, the willingness to accept those explanations will be very limited. And I don't know exactly how to send that signal um, because um, you know, this isn't statute, but um, if there is agreement, then yes. it's important to try to work on developing. I think it's an incredibly important point. As, as the team noted, we're going to go back and, and dig more deeply into what this process looks like. Yes, some of these are listed in the statute, which means that we, we, we have to look at them. And I very much hear the concern about not wanting to create yet another administratively burdensome act that folks are spending money on. That is not um, so very much here the, the need to have this be as simplified a process as possible. I think the spirit of my comment is in some ways to separate the cost target setting from this activity and to, to not to put words in your mouth in any way, Rick, but to say we could go with a higher target and make this a more stringent list. I'm not sure that that, at least in my calculus, is the way to think about our decision, um, because as you said, some of this is in statute. Some of it is going to have to be considered how it's going to be incorporated into simply the explanation or the excuse box, if you will, on, on what happened for the year before or two years before. and. Uh, I just want to make sure we don't see those as absolutely sort of connected decisions. In a way. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you for the robust discussion on this. Think helpful. I think one more part, CJ or Michelle. Okay. Two yeah, more parts. parts. Jeez. And then see, I'm trying to get to public comment quickly. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll run them together. Um, so just. We discussed this at the advisory committee meeting and just kind of wanted to put some of the, some of this into context again for the, the board and the public. So you know, OCA is proposing to establish a five year um, target uh, or target for the next five years from 2025 to 2029 and that the 2025 is a reporting year and not subject to progressive enforcement while 2026 and beyond are. Reminded that progressive enforcement is, involves OCA engaging in technical assistance discussions, requiring entities to provide public testimony, establishing performance improvement plans, and ultimately levying financial penalties after non-compliance with the PIP. Uh, so the first, the first annual report, or the annual report for performance year 2026, uh, won't be published until 2028. So that's just the delay in, in terms of us getting the data and then reporting it. 
Um, so a PIP established in 2028 based off of non-compliance with 2026 would relate per to prospective performance years, so i.e. 2029 and beyond. And statute provides that an entity may be subject to a PIP for up to three years. Um, while OCA does have authority to assess financial penalties on a standalone basis, OCA is more likely to assess penalties when an entity is non-compliant with the terms of a PIP. So just putting this into perspective that while we're setting multiple years, proposing to set multiple years worth of targets, um, the, the real teeth in terms of financial penalties don't come into play likely until the fifth year that we're recommending establishing a um, target for. That's not to say that performance years 27 and 28 aren't subject to pro progressive enforcement actions. You know, Non-compliance with the target would still result in technical assistance, public testimony, and potentially financial penalties. So as we said, we're, we're likely to only levy financial penalties after uh, implementation of a PIP. So another piece on reporting of performance that we wanted to share with this group is, so based on the experience of other states, we note that there can be variation in overall spending uh, growth by market. So in Oregon, total healthcare expenditures increased 3.5% from 2020 to 2021, just above their cost growth target of 3.4. But cost growth target for the commercial market was 12.1 compared with 6.5 for Medicare and a reduction in spending of 2.1% for Medicaid. So OCA will report spending growth by market for each entity and reporting by market allows OCA to evaluate the impact of the following on spending performance, um, population characteristics of each market, cost drivers unique to the market, different policy levers and tools in each market for implementing cost reducing strategies. Uh, and lastly, OCA is likely to enforce statewide spending to target values based on the entity's performance by market. Again, I think we've seen this timeline in this room before, but just to reiterate, you know, when we're setting the, the 2025 target, we won't see that report until 2027. We won't see, uh, and then, so the first report that's subject to enforcement won't come out until 2028. And then we would you know, be in you know, kind of ratcheting up the progressive enforcement uh, from there uh, or on a go forward basis and prospectively. And so we also note that there will be opportunities for, for this body to, to review cost spending target data in 2025, 2026, and 2027 prior to implementation or, or reporting against the, the 2028 target, which would be, or sorry, the 2026 target reported in 2028, which would be the first enforceable target. And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna provide a little more context for the board around sector targets. Um, so on or before October 1st, 2027, the board shall define the initial healthcare sectors, which may include geographic regions and individual healthcare entities as appropriate, except fully integrated delivery systems, considering factors such as delivery system characteristics, sectors may be further defined over time. After the board defines healthcare sectors, the office would promulgate regulations accordingly. The office would publish on its internet website recommendations for proposed healthcare uh, sector targets or for, proposed healthcare sectors and the board's review and consideration. The board shall discuss recommendations at a public meeting for proposed targets on or before March 1 of the prior of the year prior to the applicable target year. The board shall receive and consider public comments for 45 days. The board shall adopt the final targets on or before June 1 at a board meeting and to no later than June 1, 2028, the board shall establish specific targets by healthcare sector, including fully integrated delivery systems, geographic regions, and individual healthcare entities. So to put that in perspective, or said another way, um, out of um, statute, um, per statute, the we would set the target in 2020, set sector targets in 2028 that would commence in 2029. There's nothing to say that we can't move that timeline forward, but there's a two year sort of runway for us to first define targets and then, or define sectors and then set the target. So we could move this forward, um, but that's, for statute, uh, the the timeline. So that this can again kind of be moved forward. So we just thought it was important to give the board that context, both about the timing of the progressive enforcement approach and what it would take to do the sector targets. That the board would basically decide on the sector targets, but then we do have to put them into regulation. So it is so the board does have to adopt a statewide target by June first of this year, and we cannot adopt sector targets this year because of those steps and that runway that's required. 
quick question and then I, I, I think I asked this question at the first board meeting and I'm still confused. Um, uh, and I know there are people in this room who wrote the, the statute uh, who may be able to help. Uh, we, we talked about in the previous slides about progressive enforcement um, uh, and we talked, uh, Vishal showed slide earlier about the number of entities potentially subject to enforcement. Is sector the same as entities? That is, can we enforce against entities before we have defined sectors, or is it the same thing? So here's how I think about it. If we, if the board has to adopt a statewide target. Pardon me, I didn't have the light pushed. So the board has to adopt a statewide target by June 1st. All of the entities subject to cost growth targets are subject to that statewide entity, that statewide target. As soon as the board adopts a sector target, then the sector target is the target that applies. So, for example, if the if the board were to adopt a sector target just for health plans or just for hospitals, they would be subject to that sector target, and other entities would still be, still be subject to the statewide target. Uh, that's helpful. So, but, the, but the entities themselves are defined in statute and not subject to this. We don't need the sector targets to know what the entities are. Correct. That are and the board has a fair amount of discretion um, to decide what the sectors are. You could decide to do geographic sectors. You could decide to do a sector of the market. And you could even subject a particular entity to uh, its own sector target. Yeah, another way of looking at this is like sectors, if you want to set a different number. Um, versus kind of the, the statewide target is um, a, a single number for everyone. Elizabeth, and then. Thank you. Just very briefly, I, I strongly <laughs> recommend or hope that we do the before in the honor before October 1, uh, 2027, because I think these will, these sector targets mm. will really have an influence on how things play out in the real world. <laughs> And we would be, I want to be sure the guidance is there um, so that we are preserving where we want, <laughs> making it clear where we do hope the money goes um, as, as people try to implement and reach the statewide target. So just the sooner the better. Yeah, I think uh, I will add my agreement to that. I think it makes sense and it uh, feels like the statute gave a long uh, runway in between the two and it it uh, makes sense that we try to move it up if we can. Okay, uh, others on this side? No, yes, Richard. I just I, I just wanted to add to that point. Um, I, I agree the sooner the better. I guess the question I would have for the team would be, where does it fit in the work plan and timeline? You don't have to answer that today, but I'd be interested to know when we think we might be able to get to the sector targets. Yeah, I don't have enough. I don't have a clear answer on that. Um, we uh, uh, first need a statewide target first, and then um, then we could devote some attention to planning for sector targets. Go ahead, Richard. Um, sure. um, so first of all, uh, in terms of by June first, um, what is going to be put before the board? Is it simply the target number? Is it I think the proposal was a six page thing. So exactly what do we anticipate the board's going to at least going to be put in front of the board? We can always decide what we want to actually approve in the end uh, before the board, before the June 1st deadline. So the office has made our proposal um, and we do think it's important for the board to adopt the, the of course, the percentage number and the number of years that it applies. So we've proposed um, our target with the methodology sure. and now the board can. So that includes the methodology. We our our proposal includes the methodology. Okay. Okay, because I think there's. But, but we, I, I mean, the obligation. The obligation as far as is I just the target. Is the For target. The what's that? And the duration. The, yeah, the, the target and the duration. Well, well, the obligations we pick a target for at least a year, I think that's that's the legal but, obligation. Right, we right. have. I mean, the proposal is different, but I yeah, think the two things that we absolutely have to do are a target get, 
and a duration that could be a year or at our discretion. Oh, yeah, no like. discretion, but I said minimum, right? So, okay. oh, yeah, the board approved the methodology too. So the, and they could, you know, uh, they could adopt the office's recommendation or they could make tweaks to it and say, we want it to be this or, or change value. it altogether. Yeah, right? altogether. But yeah, that's our decision. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, um, you know, so I guess, I guess a couple of comments. Um, First of all, I'd make note that, um, you know, for example, we again looking at other states, we point to Oregon, um, their commercial market was 12.1%. So, I mean, sort of averaged it out to 3.4, but so, right, so just keeping in mind, we're going to have a lot of, you know, internal variation. We heard that with our IHA presentation. So, I think we got to think carefully about what, how, how many entities, how many PIPs, et cetera. Uh, I guess in terms of the performance improvement plans, uh, do we know, for example, how detailed or general they'll be? So, for example, is there going to be any issue of private takings? I mean, we can't dictate to an entity to, you know, we can say, well, here's your performance improvement plan, but if it's, you know, are we at the point where we're actually trying to run the entity for them? Or exactly, can, can we speak a little bit to what the PIP is going to involve? Yeah, we will have a public process for that and the, the board meetings will be that space. So um, after we adopt a target, then we'll um, that that'll be an ongoing discussion since we want um, to give the industry um, guidance um, on what enforcement looks like before the, the first enforceable year, which is 2026. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And then, okay. So I think that's going to be important um, and exactly how detailed and you did make mention that, you know, well, let's put this way, there's a lot of smart people out there. We're not the only ones out there. What happens if our PIP actually drives up costs? Does, uh, is that still a shield? Of, after all, we're saying that if you follow the PIP, what does that, what is that supposed to mean in terms of future cost targets? Well, uh, what, I mean, we'll set a cost target, but in terms of your relation to that cost target. I mean, my my suspicion, not a perfect answer, but my suspicion yeah. is that as we have the process around developing the approach to PIPs, we'll need to consider, you know, what what is the cost of implementing a PIP and how right. is it integrated? Because maybe the PIP does say over invest in primary care or, or mm -hmm. you know, invest appropriately in primary care as a two to three year plan and that would so okay. I think we have to uh, okay. have that conversation. Hopefully, staff agrees we would do that when the time comes on the PM. Okay, so, so it sounds like that's, again, something we need to work out, right? Yeah. Um, I, I know I appreciate that because, you know, we have, there's a lot, there's a lot of work to be done um, to, to make this all work right. So, so I guess, I guess because of all that, and, you know, I, I think in the long run, I'm not opposed to having a more prolonged five-year thing. I, I the, the, the reason the first year is unenforceable as someone who was actually involved in writing the statute was so we can learn. And I really do want, and we still have all these other things to work out, which we're not going to do before June 1st, right? We're probably going to do over the next several years. And, and by the way, I do agree with people, you know, with the sounds like for other members of the board that actually it's not sectors, actually it's geography I'd start with first because California's a very big state and there's a lot of difference in geography and we see a lot of geographic variation that we should be thinking about instead of a sector wide, we should really take account to what's going on in each of these marketplaces and the cost of living and other economic drivers that are affecting people in each of these geographies because it's not the same everywhere across the state. So instead of us trying to do adjust each entity that hopefully that creates a, you know, less adjustment and more accuracy. Uh, but I, I, I really do think that um, it behooves us to, cons to, to, to really consider saying the first time around, maybe we just do a couple years and learn from that. And we'll have some data back, right, from that first year. I realized that there's a little delay, lag, et cetera. And, and, that, and, and, and at the same time, we try to accelerate the geography sector stuff, right? So that, because otherwise what will happen is, is that we're going to put a five-year target. We're going to be, you know, we're going to have PIPs. We're, we're not going to take it. We're trying to figure out how to factor in these sector geography things, right? And, 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 and then, you know, we're, we may have a mess on our hands. So 
uh, so let's take the opportunity to learn. Let's take that. We have still stuff to develop. Well, so what's the consequence of exceeding the target? Right? What is that consequence going to be? We're still trying to explain to people what it's going to be. What is that supposed to mean for people? Right? Um, and and so that we can move more so and so we can move more quickly, but also in a more informed way into um, into where we want to get to, because otherwise we're going to be fighting a lot of rear guard actions, I think, in terms of, oh, well, we have a target that's already set that we already decided a couple years ago and doesn't seem to make sense now. It doesn't mean we can't change it. We always have the authority to change it, but it's a lot harder if we really, you know, poured the cement and then now we're trying to dig it back out again. So, uh, again, I'm not saying that a few years later, like, hey, we did learn, et cetera, and now let's set a very clear path. But I think the problem is there's so much uncertainty still that that is something that we should really think about not doing right off the outset. This is our first year trying to do this. So I appreciate the comment. I think we are going to later in this meeting have a very robust conversation about kind of what you're jumping into now. So if it's okay with the board, I wanna get through these uh, topics that have been presented, move to public comment, and then invite everyone that's a good opening statement i think others will want to both support pile on or maybe uh provide an alternative approach uh if that's okay i don't know if there's other comments from board members all right safe to move to public comment I'm not going too early okay go ahead we will now recognize members of the public for comment on this agenda item. Please reserve comments for other items for the general public comment period. To ensure equitable access to verbal public comment, we will alternate between members of the public present in this room and those attending virtually. Those in this room may line up at the podium. Those attending virtually should raise their hand. Please keep your comments to two minutes or less. We will track with a timer up front so that we can hear from as many people as possible. And please note, while the board is committed to communication and transparency, we will not be responding to public comment. Looking to individuals in the room, an individual at the podium, please go ahead. Beth Bell on behalf of Health Access California. Today, half of consumers lack access to care because of the cost of care. They avoid and skip care because of the cost of care. I just want to ground us in that. And I also want to ground us in the research of IHA, which found that for the 10 million Californians in HMOs, the cost growth was about 3%. And we know from the other work that OCA and IHA have done that that care is grounded in primary care and that that is part of why they're at 3% instead of the 10% of PPOs. We know from anecdotal experience that access to primary care and PPOs is very problematic, even here in Sacramento. It is to change that, that OCA has all of these elements tied together. We are think it's really important to focus on how this all hangs together. We are pleased to hear about the request for information about physician organizations and about affiliations and relationships. And as the work goes on, we will look forward to discussions about how we define entity. I believe Rick Kronick asked in the first meeting, is it, is it health system or what is it? And so that continues to be part of our conversation. Uh, and we will also look forward to moving more quickly on sector targets. Um, I think our friends from Monterey have made a compelling case for accelerating that work. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Jeff, we see your hand raised. Please go ahead. Jeff, you're unmuted on our end. You're going to have to unmute on your end also. All right, Jeff, we'll come back around to you. Moving to the next person um, virtually with their hand raised. William Kramer, please go ahead. Um, William Kramer, please try again. You have to unmute on your end. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Bill Kramer. I'm the Senior Advisor for Health Policy at the Purchaser Business Group on Health. Um, I'd like to make a comment on the uh, potential factors that will be considered in assessing an entity's performance. Uh, first, we agree it's appropriate to identify these factors in advance and, as Dr. Koenig notes, to define them narrowly and carefully. Uh, we do not want to create a whole new line of business for consultants to provide justification for entities that exceed the targets. Or, as a member of the advisory committee described it last week, we do not want a, a platoon of actuaries to descend on the OCA staff. One additional point, the list on slide 29 consists only of factors that would drive up costs. In other words, factors that might be considered acceptable to explain why an entity exceeded the target. But in assessing an entity's performance against the targets, the state should also take into account factors that would reduce costs. For example, a lower inflation than expected or brand name drugs that come off of a patent, uh, thereby enabling the use of generic drugs. In other words, the assessment of an entity's cost trends should be two-sided, not just one-sided. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the individual at the podium, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Vina Krejcinovic, United Here Health, and the previous speaker set me up perfectly. I have an example of a high-cost drug um, coming down in price, um, as that's one of the things that um, was uh, was mentioned in assessing performance against the target was emerging high cost and high value pharmaceuticals. So between 2010 and 2023, Medicare dropped the prices on 251 specialty drugs. That's about 23% of specialty drugs, so a pretty significant number. And I wanted to provide one example, and I have a handout to make it easier. So I want to give the example of aloxetin. This is a chemo drug for colorectal cancer that's given intravenously. Its patent um, expired in 2012, over a decade ago, so you'd think that providers would have had enough time to adjust their billing practices. However, in 2023, we paid for 12 infusions for one patient for aloxetin at Salinas Valley Health. Medicare would have paid $185 for these 12 infusions, we paid $89,317. So on average, we paid about 180 times the Medicare rate for a drug that's been off patent for more than a decade. Um, we're a national Taft-Hartley, so we have the size to pay our own claims and to employ analysts to review the data. Um, and that's how we found this. And many other purchasers don't have this ability. And frankly, we shouldn't have to go looking for this in the data. Um, we think a clear achievable target like 3% will force the industry to stop hiding the ball. And just to you know, um, provide another example, this is why we need um, the sooner the better, as a number of board members have um, mentioned today. Thank you. Thank you. Looking back virtually, Monica, we see your hand raised. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Monica, we can see that you're still muted on your end. You're unmuted on ours. Can you unmute on yours? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. I am Monica Montano, and I'm here representing Scripps Health from the Office of the President to respect respectfully urge you to reconsider the proposed five-year 3% growth target and instead implement a one-year target. Like others you've heard from today, Scripps supports the office's mission to build a healthcare system to curb healthcare growth cost growth without sacrificing access to or the quality of health care. The proposal, unfortunately, will impact access to care. Scripps Health was founded more than 100 years ago. Today, we are one of San Diego's largest safety net providers. We are a leader in disease and injury prevention, diagnosis and treatment, and clinical research, and we cannot keep the pace with escalating costs and lack of reimbursements. But this proposal does not accomplish that. We are grateful for the opportunities we've had to share our perspectives with this board. Each day at Scripps, we put the vision of our founders into action, dedicating ourselves to quality, safe, cost-efficient, socially responsible health care for everyone we serve. Government reimbursement has not kept the pace with rising costs of labor, supplies, and drugs for healthcare system like us. Scripps Health, like many other providers in California, operated at a loss in 2023, and this year we are targeting a one-half of 1% operating margin. 
We work hard to control costs, but we incur many costs that simply cannot be contained at a 3% target, like pharmacy costs, rising labor costs, cybersecurity costs, increasing supply chain costs, and state-initiated legislative mandates, including health care, minimum wage, and seismic compliance. Yet we must invest in the services our community deserves. We need to have the ability to invest in programs that promote an equitable future, one that invests in partnerships and innovations that will reduce health care costs in the long run and ensure we can provide excellent care to our community for the next 100 years. The target this board ultimately sets must be rooted in the data. Thank you. Thank you. Going to the individual at the podium. Janice Rocco on behalf of the California Medical Association. Um, we've been having a discussion this morning about factors to be considered when assessing an entity's performance against the target. Many organizations, including CMA, have asked you to consider those factors in setting the initial cost target so that the initial cost target is reflective of the actual costs that are increasing in terms of providing care. If you only adjust after the fact, no one will know what target they are aiming for or whether OCA will decide they met the target based upon those factors. Um, I also wanted to share with folks an update in terms of information that was provided at the last board meeting about what's going on in other states. Um, while it is the case that no state started as low as 3% for setting their initial cost targets, that obviously remains the case, no, no state started there. Um, we also have states that have been changing their cost targets. Massachusetts adjusted to 3.6% for 23 and 24. Last month, Connecticut moved to 4% for 2024. Rhode Island has moved to 6% for 2023 and 5% for 2024. So again, nobody started at 3% and you can't use the experience that's happening in other states to argue that we should be doing that because it's not reflective of what's happening in other states. Thank you. Moving back virtually, Matt, we see your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. I want to support the previous two speakers and the things that they said. Uh, also, uh, I'm one of the smallest rural hospitals in the state. Uh, our growth has been exponential. We've uh, doubled our revenue in the last five years. Our expenses have gone up the same. Uh, a lot of this has to do because of access of care in the northern part of our county. So a lot of my patients, a third of my patients are coming from over 50 miles away because care is not available in those areas. And that's why my revenue and expenses have grown so much. Uh, I'm also, I also need to meet uh, seismic compliance. Uh, it's gonna cost me $10 million a bed to meet seismic compliance uh, in this area. So we're working on that. We plan to be seismically compliant by 2030. And so that's going to hit my expenses without any additional revenue or uh, increase in quality of care. And so those are several of the factors that I'm looking at. I'm also looking at adding new services, which people are not able to get in this area or uh, up north. So uh, I appreciate you guys considering those things, especially for us small rural providers in areas where there's limited care and where we're I, we actually have people coming in from outside of our area to receive care. Thank you. Going to the individual at the podium. Members of the board, Steve McDougall representing the California Federation of Teachers, the CFT, a union of educators and classified professionals. 3% is enough. 3% over five years is enough. We're hearing all the concern about we might lose access down the road if we do that. We have access problems right now, but you have to look at the data behind the data. As plans move costs of accessing health care from the rates that everybody pays to those seeking health care, consumers are making choices and avoiding accessing their health care benefits because of the cost share that's been placed on them. If you look at the data in our underserved communities, and the mortality rates, it tells you unbridled health care rate increases in this state are creating access problems because folks can't afford their plans for the rates they're at 
plus their cost share. We already have an access problem because the unchecked, unchecked systems that are in place, period. Where we can all agree, and we didn't get to those slides so much today because of time, is that we need to do due diligence. All stakeholders that are present here in the space today and out there in cyberspace and making sure that the state does its share with Medi-Cal. I don't know what to say about Congress, but maybe after November we can figure that one out too when it comes to Medicare. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Jeff, we see your hand raised. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Jeff, you're unmuted on our end. You'll have to unmute on your end. Um, does that work? Hello? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, Thank you. Ahead. Third time's a charm. Uh, first of all, this is Jeff Rideout, uh, CEO of the Integrated Healthcare Association. Um, I mainly wanted to thank OCA uh, and the board and the management team for sharing our data, and um, IHA would be happy to share more of that data. Uh, we do follow a lot of trends. Um, one mention of especially pharma, we've trended that for the last five years as well. Um, so we very much appreciate your using the data. Uh, second, I um, want to make sure it's clear, and I, I think Vishal mentioned this, um, the implications of a 3% target based on our data are strictly those of OCA. Um, IHA as an organization is not taking a position on the target itself. We're considering that at our board meeting this week. Um, and then just a few other things to mention along the way. Uh, we do use risk adjustment. It's the ACG uh, risk adjuster from Johns Hopkins, and we do apply that in the same way across all of the data that you saw. Um, there is some consideration for uh, total cost of care for individual organizations that should be included, uh, including race and ethnicity, stratification and quality. Um, and we would uh, also argue that it's uh, risky to lock in the rates that are currently in place so that if you have higher value or lower cost providers in a certain geography, uh, they're not penalized uh, for being uh, that to begin with. So I will stop there and thank you very much. We will submit written comments as well. Thank you. Going to the individual at the podium. Good morning. My name is Giovanni Adelini. I've been a union carpenter for 25 years. And as a result of that employment, I've had the fortunate, uh, been fortunate enough to have access to health care. Uh, in 2008, uh, I was out of work like so many others. And at, at that time, I lost my health care because our health care is dependent on work hours. And uh, I found out also I was going to be a father. And I remember the extreme anxiety and fear that I felt uh, knowing that I was going to be bringing a new life in and not having coverage. Fortunately, with the help of my representatives, uh, I was able to secure work. And by the time my daughter was born, uh, I was able to deliver her through Kaiser. And that was a wonderful experience. And I'm very grateful to have that, uh, that experience and that access. Fast forward uh, 15 years later today, this is my daughter Hartley. Yeah. She's amazing and uh, she's, she's an academic. And she's an athlete, and as a result of her athleticism, she's required to maintain a physical. Uh, she went last March to get a physical at Kaiser. Can you speak into the mic? Thank went last March to speak uh, to get a physical, and Kaiser said everything's fine, nothing to see here. Moved on. Uh, fast forward to a month ago, uh, my wife had to reschedule her again for another appointment to get her routine physical. Uh, she opted to go for convenience instead of cost, and decided to go to a local drop-in clinic and pay out of pocket instead of driving down the hill to go to Kaiser. And I'm glad she did because this is what they determined after doing a simple exam of simply having her to bend over and touch her toes and look at her and give her the time that she deserved to find out that she has scoliosis at 15 years old. And this, uh, what I'm learning now is that this requires intervention during the pubescent years and time is important to vindicate this condition. So for a year, we've been unaware that this has been going on in my daughter's body. And it doesn't take a medical professional to realize that her back is whack and she needs uh, help. And we're still waiting to get, um, get into a, a scoliosis center. And I believe that this is a direct result of rapacious policies and edicts that come down from the top, like Greg Adams, who makes $50,000 a day and, and putting pressure on uh, doctors and, and nurses to do more with less resources, cutting their, their patient times short, neglecting patients, because they're worried about uh, getting flagged by a, a bean counter up at the up, upstairs because they want to request a, a test or, or a, a procedure that uh, they, they might feel is relevant. But, but the, the people that run the numbers, uh, Speaking to the, mic. the people that run the numbers 
uh, might disagree with them. So I, I'm asking you to put a 3% cap on this, to send a message to Greg Adams and other rapacious CEOs that are putting profits above patient care and send them a message that get their house in order. Maybe he takes a pay cut and quit putting pressure on, on doctors and nurses that are, that are trying to uh, connect with their patients and, and cutting their time short in the, the, the exam room. There is no excuse why something as simple as bending over and touching your toes was overlooked when we're paying premiums to get medical care. So I ask uh, for you guys to please uh, support this 3% cap. Thank you. Thank you. Going to the individual online, Elena, you're unmuted. Hello, board members. My name is Elena Santa Maria, and I'm with Next Gen California, a nonprofit organization focused on uplifting the youth voice. Um, Next Gen California believes that healthcare costs are too much today. The costs keep on growing, and unfortunately, it delays um, consumers delay their care, skip tests, and fail to fill prescriptions because of the cost. Slowing the growth in healthcare costs means more money for basic needs like food and rent and other um, necessities. Next Gen California did a survey of our um, youth a couple years ago and outside of student debt, medical costs and delay of care were some of the top issues that are important to them. And so we hope by the time that OCA's regulations are all put into place that they'll be a product of a better healthcare system though, than the one that currently exists. Next Gen California supports a maximum of a 3% growth target with no adjustments or delay in slowing the care of health costs. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. To the individual at the podium. Thank you, board members. My name is Kurt Ferreira. I'm a member out of Carpenters Union Local 46. NorCal Carpenters Union supports a statewide spending target of 3%. We could easily argue that the 3% spending target does not go far enough and in fact should be less. In fact, it will do little to reduce our current premiums, which Kaiser has quadrupled for our members in the past 20 plus years. I pay $500 a week in medical. That's over $25,000 a year. We urge the board to adopt the spending target without any delay. All working people are in urgent need of relief from rising health care cost now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking virtually, Caesar, go ahead. Caesar, yep. you're unmuted on our end. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now. Uh, Caesar Lara with the California Labor Federation, uh, and we are supporting staff's recommendation of the 3% over five years. Uh, so many working families across California are uh, already don't access health care because of the cost of health care and really want the board to uh, support staff's recommendation along with looking at counties across California that the cost is already starting too high, like Monterey County. You know, so many of the of our members in, in Monterey County are having access issues now due to the cost of, of health care. And so we ask that uh, you as a board take staff's recommendation at 3% uh, along with uh, looking at a bigger scale about how affordable is health care in different parts of California that have uh, already a high percentage of cost. Thank you. Thank you. Going to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Richie Cruz, member of 68L. Thank you for letting me speak today. NorCal Carpenters Union supports a statewide spending target at 3%. A little history lesson. Back in 1952, we initially went on strike to fight to receive medical care. Now, 72 years later, we're continuing to remain ready to fight to make sure that it stays affordable for all working people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Simply because our membership already pays hundreds of millions of dollars for the care that we have. My brother previous before me spoke on what he spends annually. I'd like to take that a step further. We have 36,000, over 36,000 members. I'm only going to account for 33,000 of these members. But that's an annual price tag of $857,313,600. No spare change. I ran the number twice. No, more than twice. So Kaiser receives this massive income from carpenters, yet they want to can continue to increase our rates. Keep in mind, we're only one of their clients. My simple question is, why? Is it in order to finance that, what, $5 billion 
investment to a company in Pennsylvania, which in doing so is only taking more away from the great state of California. Is it because they need to stay financing the hundreds of millions of dollars on naming rights to a sports center? It, it just it seems that 3% is fair for all working people. There needs to be rules. There needs to be a limit on what can be taken from the working class individual. And I just want to finish by saying that we greatly appreciate what OCA is doing and staff is doing to actually implement some rules and bring justice and relief to working class. Thank you for listening because it's clear Kaiser isn't. And that was apparent seeing as how their workforce recently went on strike. Again, I'd like to say I'm Richard Cruz, proud member of 680. Thank you again for listening. Thank you. Looking online, Bianca, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Bianca, you're unmuted on our end. You'll have to unmute on your end. We can't hear you yet. All right, we'll come back to Bianca, going to the individual in the room at the podium. Hi there, uh, my name is Harvey McEwen. I'm a member of Carpenters Local 713 and the great CEO of Hayward. Uh, you know, needless to say, the Carpenters support the 3% uh, target. And as anyone has maybe seen from the banners outside, we won't hesitate to continue to draw attention to wastage in the system, particularly in the face of claims that we've heard that this target can't be met. And also while our provider continues to provide us with opaque uh, you know, data uh, to justify the premiums that it imposes on us. But ultimately, you know, bringing it to reality, our goal is to be a union for all workers, those we represent in construction and those whose conditions we can lift up, even if we can't represent them yet. But our ability to represent and advocate for workers is directly impacted by rising healthcare premiums. The market reality is, and I'd say the sad market reality is, is that the higher that healthcare contribution is on the check, the more uh, employers will resist and, and uh, the more it will make it less sustainable in their eyes to give working people in our industry what they deserve. And what happens when workers go unrepresented in construction? Well, you can only walk down the block and you'll find a construction site that's an ec economic crime scene of wage theft and other um, labor exploitation practices and data shows that almost half of families of construction workers in California currently are enrolled in a safety net program um, that costs the public an annual uh, uh, cost of over three billion. So that's a stat that can't be good for any stakeholder in this room. Um, and that public cost and you know fiscal responsibility should lead us towards a solution. And I'd see the spending target as a first step in that direction. I, I hope we get behind it. I hope we don't listen to the voices trying to kick the can down the road because ultimately we're going to have to introduce something here. And I think 3% sounds reasonable and we've had the discussions is now, now it's time to pass it. So thanks to the work of the board and uh, look forward to continue participating in this process. Cheers. Look into the individual online. Mitch, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you, Mitch Steiger with the uh, with CFT, a union of educators and classified professionals. A lot of witnesses have offered very compelling evidence in support of the 3% cost growth target. We also very much share support for that target. And just wanted to focus a little bit on the argument of what it would mean to not pass this today, as many have mentioned. This is a compromise. That what we're looking at here is not something that claws funds back, that claws some of the sky high increases in recent years back. This simply slows the rate of growth. And in doing so, what we think it'll do is still allow the protection that our members and that all other healthcare consumers out there need to get the care that they need. We should really think about what it is that we're asking folks to do if we allow these sky high increases to keep going year after year. We're putting people in the impossible choice, as the brother from the Carpenters mentioned, of what to do with their health care. And it really speaks to the gravity of this, that when we put people in the position of having to decide to forego health care in order to save money, we're asking them to suffer through sometimes excruciating, sometimes life-threatening physical pain in order to save money while we're still allowing some of these companies to do things like pay people $50,000 a day. That is absolutely unconscionable and it's absolutely indefensible. And this proposal sends, we think, an incredibly important message that you can still take all the funds that you need to operate. You can still um, extend all of the health care to consumers that they deserve 
but the amount that you can increase the cost each year needs to be set at a reasonable amount. It is totally reasonable for us to demand the ability to get adequate health care, to get affordable health care. We think this proposal brings all those concepts together in a very fair way, and we urge the board to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you. To the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, my name is Oscar Masariegos. I am a field representative for the NorCal Carpenters Union and a proud member of 68L. Um, the NorCal Carpenters Union, as you've heard from all my previous members, we definitely support this um, negotiation position at the 3%. A price cap uh, can stop organizations like Kaiser from abusing the ne negotiation position. We know there are many ways that Kaiser can cut costs to meet a 3% target. A few examples is Kaiser spending hundreds of millions on naming rights for sporting stadiums. Um, Kaiser Foundation and Executives makes millions even though it is a nonprofit organization. How does this uh, excessive corporate spending benefit California patients? Um, just um, personal experience, just you've heard from my um, other members how much we pay of our premiums and monthly, daily. I just made a eye doctor appointment, just a regular routine last week. My nearest appointment was two months later, March 16th, for just a basic eye appointment. Just how is that helping any kind of members whatsoever? So we're paying thousands of dollars for this, and all I need is a routine eye check, and we got to wait months to be able to get seen. Um, I urge the board to adopt the spending target within, without any delay. All working people are in urge in need of a relief of rising health care costs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Going virtually, Ellie, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Sharp Healthcare, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we appreciate and support the goals of OCA, and, and Sharp Healthcare's long-standing mission has been to offer quality care and services that set community standards, exceed patient expectations, are provided in a caring, convenient, cost-effective, and accessible manner. As Sharp Health, uh, Sharp Health, excuse me, as San Diego's largest healthcare provider and the region's largest medical provider, Sharp has pursued this goal relentlessly by adopting and investing in population health and alternative payment methodologies. As you heard from Sharp. Bree Steely um, a meeting or so ago, and those provide patients with comprehensive co comprehensive coordination across the continuum of care. But the 3% spending target for five years will put our mission and patient outcomes in jeopardy. One of the major challenges here is that there is no visibility into the cost of care by providers and the level of care and cost efficiency provided by um, by providers today. Setting a five-year benchmark will disadvantage providers who are already efficiently providing care at a low cost today while giving an advantage to providers who are inefficient. A provider's current efficiency and baseline costs matter in the application and impact of a static growth target. A 3% increase for inefficient providers permits a larger adjustment window compared to an an efficient provider with lower baseline costs and areas for financial adjustments. In addition, we are concerned that establishing a spending growth target based on historical household income rather than historical healthcare spending trends is comparing apples to oranges. It's important to note that Massachusetts used historical healthcare spending trends for its initial growth targets not the median household income. And the spending target does not consider annual costs facing health systems such as labor, supplies, pharmaceuticals, mandated seismic construction, and other costs that are beyond health systems control. We, we believe that this 3% spending target will undermine our ability to invest in our staff in the workplace. For the last five years, Sharp's expenses have outpaced our system revenue, 26.2% um, compared to 23.3% over the last four years largely driven by an increase in our labor expenses. For these reasons, Two Sharp minutes. urges OCA to adopt an initial single-year spending target that accounts for the underlying drivers of cost. Thank you. Thank you. The individual at the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Reese, field representative and member of the NorCal Carpenters Union at Local 1599. The NorCal Carpenters Union supports a statewide spending target of 3%. By creating a cap, we can stop massive organizations like Kaiser from abusing its negotiation position without a union. When hardworking class families are struggling to find ways to affordable health care, Kaiser is burning through cash just as often as they're raising rates. There needs to be a limit to this. That way the burden isn't on the patient. And we know there are ways that Kaiser can cut these costs to meet the 3% target. For example, Kaiser wanted to spend $5 billion on a Pennsylvania company. Kaiser Foundation executives making millions of dollars every year, even though Kaiser is a nonprofit organization. Kaiser also spending hundreds of millions on naming rights to a sports stadium. How does this excessive corporate spending benefit California patients? 
They'll spend billions on a gleaming new headquarters and naming deal with the Warriors, but when it comes to patient care, it's just one half measure after another. After approving the $295 million Thrive City deal with the Warriors in 2016, Kaiser has repeatedly raised insurance premiums. And the Thrive City deal came on the heels of Kaiser announcing its plans to construct a new $900 million, corpor $900 million corporate headquarters in Oakland. The excessive spending is hurting the end goal of the entire organization, patient care. We urge the board to adopt this spending target without any delay. All working people are in urgent need of relief from rising health care costs now. Thank you. Thank you. Looking to Travis virtually, you are unmuted. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Travis West, Regulatory Policy Specialist with the California Nurses Association. Uh, we want to echo the comments of working people and other labor organizations here today in support of the five-year 3% spending target recommended by OCA staff. Uh, we also encourage OCA to adopt this standard as soon as possible. As we've just heard, this is crucial to address access problems that consumers are already facing right now under our current system. We also encourage OCA to adopt the spending target as is, with no adjustments or exemptions before or after assessing the individual performance of entities. Uh, I'd like to close by saying thank you to the OCA board and staff for your work on this issue, as well as your overall efforts to uh, make healthcare more affordable for consumers in California. Thanks. Thank you to the individual at the podium. Thank you, OCA board and staff, for allowing me this platform to speak to you about the 3% uh, uh, rising cost of health insurance, uh, the target, excuse me. My name is Armando Murillo, and I'm with uh, the Northern California Carpenters Union out of Local 405 in San Jose, California. I've always had uh, Kaiser as my health care provider since I was a child. My children and my grandchildren were all born in Kaiser hospitals. That's three generations of loyalty and trust. The Carpenters Union represents 11 crafts, and it is the single largest construction union in the state, and most Northern California Carpenter members are enrolled with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan to include their dependents. Our membership already pays hundreds of millions of dollars out of their total pay to healthcare providers, mostly Kaiser. And they continue to raise the cost of healthcare on us, which threatens the wage increases unions like ours have bargained for and earned. Where is Kaiser's loyalty to its members? We need more rules and a fairer health care system, and this is why the NCCU, Northern California Carpenters Union, supports a statewide spending target of 3%. Furthermore, we know that Kaiser can cut costs without cutting services in order to meet this 3% target. You know, just as a personal story of mine, when I was in the uh, Marine Corps Reserves, I was having problems with my knees. They were swelling, locking up. So I went to my Kaiser doctor. He sends me in for x-rays. He comes back. He says, I'm happy to report that your results are negative. Well, he's happy to report the negative results. My knees are still swelling. They're still locking. So on a fee-for-service basis, I went to the VA. I had my knees um, MRI'd. And lo and behold, I required surgery on both knees. So I know Kaiser could do better. I'm not sure if there was pardon me, was a cost-saving uh, plan, but, uh, you know, we urge you to support this 3% target. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, virtually, looking to Bianca, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Bianca, you're unmuted on our end. You'll have to unmute on your end. We can't hear you yet. All right. We'll come back to Bianca in a moment. To the individual at the podium, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Martinez. I'm a proud carpenter of Local 1599. Uh, it is with great urgency and purpose that we gather today to address a crucial, uh, crucial matter affecting each and every one of us. The issue of escalating health care costs. Our union stands united in support of the statewide spending target of 3%. Consider for a moment the staggering reality that our hardworking members are already putting are parting with hundreds of millions of dollars of their earnings to health providers. With Kaiser at the forefront. The financial strain on our workers has reached a breaking point. Enough is enough. It's time to set limits on what could be taken from the hardworking class. We commend the diligent efforts of the uh, of the board and its dedicated staff to pursue 
relief for the working class. Their work is vital, and we express our deep appreciation to their commitment to the cause. Therefore, we call upon the board to, uh, with unwavering resolve to swiftly adopt the proposed 3% spending target. The time for action is now. Every working individual in the uh, is in desperate need of relief from a relentless surge in healthcare costs. Let us stand together, let our voices be heard, and let the well-being of our members and their families be the cornerstone cornerstone of a shared mission. Thank you. Thank you. Virtually looking to Jean. Jean, you're unmuted, RN. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jean Hurst, uh, commenting today on behalf of the California Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems. Uh, public health care systems strongly support improving affordability for patients and consumers. However, we are concerned with OCA's initial spending target proposal of 3% for 2025 to 29 and the potentially detrimental impacts it could have on patients and access to care. We understand and can empathize with OCA's interest in connecting the target to a measure related to consumer affordability. However, we would strongly encourage the board to consider additional factors in the target's development that drive healthcare spending, such as inflation, demographic trends, labor and technology costs, and state policy decisions. If the target does not account for the experience of providers and the spending and cost pressures that are beyond their control, there could be blunt and harmful impacts to the healthcare, to healthcare access in our state. We would also urge for further considerations related to Medi-Cal. Public health care systems provide 35% of all Medi-Cal and uninsured hospital care statewide. Imposing this target in Medi-Cal implies that baseline spending is adequate to begin with, but Medi-Cal reimbursement is nowhere close to covering the cost to provide care, and this must be taken into account. Furthermore, Medi-Cal financing is complex, and additional considerations will be needed for how the spending target program will apply in Medi-Cal. We appreciate OCA's willingness to engage and have initial conversations with stakeholders on this, and look forward to having further discussions on Medi-Cal financing, data collection, and measurement and attribution. For these reasons, we urge the board to adopt a more realistic and attainable spending target and to limit it to an initial one-year cycle. Setting a one-year target will allow for more deliberation on these important issues and time to develop a workable methodology. We've also outlined our concerns in more detail in written comments submitted on the healthcare spending target proposal. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. To the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Herlindo Alfaro. I come out of Local 180 in Vallejo. I'm a nine-year member in the Carpenters Union. The Carpenters Union represents 11 crafts and is the single largest construction union in the state. The NorCal Carpenters Union supports a statewide spending target of 3%. Most NorCal Carpenter members are enrolled with Kaiser Health Plan. It is something we rely on, not just only for ourselves, but for our families to provide. Uh, Kaiser has quadrupled premiums for our members in the last 20 plus years. Why does Kaiser do this? Because it can. There are no rules and we need rules. Uh, we urge the board to adopt this spend and target without any delay. All working people are in an urgent need to relieve from rising health care costs now. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually to Bianca, you're unmuted on our end. Go ahead. Hopefully, third time is a charm. Bianca Blomquist, California Director for Small Business Majority. We're a nonprofit organization that advocates for small business owners and their ability to provide quality jobs to themselves and their employees. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to the board uh, this morning in support of the 3% growth target over five years, which will improve health care affordability for more than 4 million small business owners that make up 99% of total businesses in California. Family coverage costs currently $24,000 when the median income for a small business owner with employees is just about $50,000 and the need for affordability for California's entrepreneurs is growing. Uh, small business majority conducted research that demonstrated that more than one in three small businesses report that it's been a challenge to obtain health insurance coverage for themselves and their employees in recent years. 16% have reported that they've considered reducing health care coverage um, in order to keep costs down and keep their businesses open. Unfortunately, entrepreneurs of color uh, were even more likely to indicate making this change. So we urge the board to make no adjustments or implement any delays in slowing health care costs in California. And we look forward to the board taking um, swift action to reduce health care costs that are, could be hindering entrepreneurship in our state. 
Thank you. Thank you to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Antonio Acevedo. I am a member out of Carpenters Local 46 here in Sacramento. The NorCal Carpenters Uni Union proudly supports a statewide spending target of 3%, prioritizing accessible health care for our members and all working people. Reflecting on our history, like my brother Richie before me said, in 1952, the Carpenters Union members took a courageous stand, striking to secure health and welfare benefits from, from employers, a groundbreaking achievement. Today, as we advocate for fair wages and comprehensive health care, we urge policymakers to halt increasing rates, recognizing the burden it places on workers. Instead, we call for sustainable solutions that ensure affordable health care for our members and all working people. The NorCal Carpenters Union remains committed to advancing the rights and well-being of our members and working people, embodying the spirit of solidarity and progress. Thank you. Thank you. Looking back virtually, seeing no hands raised at this time, noting we have uh, roughly 100 attendees virtually, going back to the individual at the podium. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members. Name is Neil and John Charles, and I'm a member of the NorCal Carpenters Union right here in Sacramento, Local 46. Um, as we all know, wages has not caught up with inflation, and um, healthcare spending has also outpaced wages. Workers like myself, we are constantly fighting to get a livable wage, but when you have constant increases like this, it feels like we're actually just fighting to put these wages into the pockets of corporations and nonprofit like Kaiser. Um, I believe this applies to everyone in this room, but in the last few years, we've gotten increases on every sector of our lives, whether it is utility bills, groceries, healthcare, et cetera. It's like you get a raise, but it gets sucked right onto you and basically put into, um, like I said, corporations. It feels, it feels like we never got a raise, right? Um, the working class purchasing power is constantly and always on the attack, which greatly affects the wage gap. The wage gaps keep on getting wider and wider and wider every few years, hence why it's important to put a spending uh, target on um, in place. Kaiser over the last few years has um, increased the premiums to our members to quite a lot, and our members are currently feeling the squeeze right now, and hence why I'm, we at the Knockout Companies Union are in support of the um, spending target to hold these medical um, organizations accountable. We don't want to get to a point where 15 to 20 percent of the average annual household income is going to healthcare. So this should be this should be based on um, what folks can actually afford. We need to act now to make sure that we don't we don't get to the the point of 20 to to uh, 25 percent of our annual average income going towards healthcare. We also don't want to have a system that is constantly pushing its people into poverty and continues to widen that gap between the rich and the working class. So with that being said, I just want to say the Knockout Capitalist Union does support the 3% spending target. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the individual at the podium. Go ahead. Hello, board members. My name is Fong May Lampkins. I'm a member of the NorCal Carpenters Union, 22-year member. I'm also a 50-plus member you're a member of Kaiser. Um, I support the 3% spending cap. Um, it's been my experience that uh, Kaiser used to be the gold standard. Now I think they'd be lucky to be called bronze. Um, three weeks from today, I'll be on the operating table having a portion of my colon removed because my severe diverticulitis when undiagnosed for more than a year after having gone to, to the hospital several times complaining of the, the pain and they didn't do the proper test. So you doctors in the room and on the panel can probably imagine the kind of daily pain I've been in that I'm in right now from having that, uh, that happen in my body. So I've done the math on what my employer spends for me, just me, on an annual basis and currently that's over $21,000 a year just for me and I can't, hardly even get an appointment. I had to actually file a complaint with member services just to get a couple of emails uh, returned with questions that I had about a procedure. So I definitely support this and I know that there's uh, more that Kaiser can be doing or all of the uh, healthcare organizations can be doing to put patients first. 
I, I understand there's cost, there's uh, overhead and everything, but the patients should come first, right? Especially those of us who are actually suffering and can't get in. So thank you. Thank you. Going back to the individual at the podium, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Monique Wood Brown. I'm with um, the Carpenters Union Local 22. Um, 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 the North Cal Carpenters Union, um, we widely support the 3%. So I've raised, um, I gave birth to two daughters 35 years ago. And I remember the health care back then and what it looks like now. And it has definitely gone downhill. Um, to make an appointment, you have to call an operator. The operator sends you over to the medical assistant. The medical assistant asks you, what's your symptoms? Then you go to a um, advice nurse. The advice nurse sends it over to the doctor's office. And they have 24 hours to respond. If they don't respond, in that, I mean, if they respond within that 24 hours and you miss that call, you got to go back to square one. Then to only get told they only have appointments a whole month out. So, and I was having a breathing issue. So the lady said, well, you could get a phone interview. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I get the phone interview. The doctor said, well, you need to be in here. I said, well, I tried to make an appointment. She said, I have all kinds of slots open. So, um, the, and this is just continued. This is only one story, but healthcare has really gone down. So to be asking for this much is, um, you know, uh, it's outrageous. So if we continue to feed the giants, they feed off of the working class people. The working class people will become the poor people. The poor people will become the homeless people. And then the homeless people will become the mentally ill people. And then we become a state problem. So I ask that y'all consider the 3%. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, noting we have roughly 100 attendees at this time and no hands raised. Going back to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Christopher Siever with the NorCal Carpenters Union, and I'm out of Local 34. <clears throat> um, NorCal Carpenters support the target of 3%. Um, <clears throat> there definitely needs to be a regulation on this. <clears throat> uh, we we pass that fee off. To, it ends up getting passed off to the working people. Um, not only are we paying that, but yet you go to the doctor, you have more bills that you have to pay. Um, my personal experience, I have many of family members who have health care coverage that don't even go to the doctor when something's wrong because they've been rushed along and or they can't afford the bill. Um, so we recently learned about the strengths and the weaknesses of California's institutions for regulating health plans. In September, we triggered a state review of our large group premium rate. However, California's Department of Managed Healthcare does not have enough power to truly hold medical organizations to account. We need more rules for a fair health healthcare system. Um, so with that, we urge the board to adopt this spending target without any delay. All working people are in urgent need of relief from rising health care costs now. Thank you. Thank you. No hands raised virtually. Going back to the individual at the podium. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Matt Kelly. I'm a member of Carpenters Local 46 in Sacramento. Uh, NorCal Carpenters Union, as many of them have said, strongly support this 3% uh, spending target. Um, we could actually argue that 3% doesn't do enough over the last 20 years, as I'm sure some other people have said, uh, it's quadrupled. You're talking 400% in that instance, which is just a little ridiculous. Uh, we negotiate contracts. Our contracts come in five-year cycles. We got a really good contract with yearly wages to keep up with things like inflation and things like that. With how they want to raise our health care this year, we won't get our raise this year. So they get to raise costs because it's costing them more, and then it just gets put on our back. Um, and just a couple stories. So about six months ago, I'm having shoulder pain. I call Kaiser. They tell me to see my general practitioner. It's going to be three months before I can get in and see him. They say you can go see another doctor. That takes five weeks. That's all good. This just happened yesterday. I'm over at my mom's house visiting her. She had gone out to dinner with her husband a week previous. 
She ate something that didn't agree with her, but it's not a one day stomach ache. She's on her seventh day of having a stomach ache. She's on the phone. They're telling her she can't see her general practitioner until April 30th. She's begging the guy on the phone just to order her blood test so she can go get these. So how can the health care decline so much and they just raise the prices? Less care, higher price. Less care, higher price. Please adopt this 3% spending target. Thank you. Thank you. No hands raised virtually. Going back to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, my name is Mirna Garcia. I'm a housekeeper at the Silicon Valley Holiday Inn in San Jose, and I'm a local 19 member. My contract expires this year, means we will be negotiated with our manager for a new contract. I already know that the issues will be, we want a wage increase that we, will allow us to support our family and live one of the most expensive city in the US, Silicon Valley. I am lucky enough to have health care through the Union Trust Fund, but I know in the upcoming negotiation, the health care costs will be a topic for the discussion in so often we. The workers have to decide where the money go to our wages or to pay the health care insurance increases. I am here to show my support for the cap of 3% increase so we can have money left for our wages increases. Thank you. Thank you. No hands raised virtually. Back to the podium. Good afternoon, Katie Bassler, president of Salinas Valley Federation of Teachers, Monterey County resident. I, I want to dovetail on what Ms. Mitchell mentioned about hospitals doing some heavy lifting. And currently what we're finding in Monterey County is that two of our three most egregious hospitals have started to demonstrate some movement uh, to try and meet the needs of our community. One worked very closely with our JPA and negotiated a narrow market where our lowest cost um, plan can actually access their, their, their system. And it was authentic and it was through collaboration and communication. In contrast, another one of the hospitals in our community uh, riding on the dove, the, the uh, coattails of this first agreement, just gave $5 million to put in a trust or in a fund that can be distributed to teachers and only teachers uh, in our community that then would go through the school district, which would then be income and taxed. So a nonprofit hospital donates $5 million as a goodwill that in turn only increases the income of teachers marginally to help offset the, the, the premium costs. It is embarrassing and we'll see how it rolls out. We support the 3% and we do not want it delayed because we see that these hospitals know that they're going to have to change their business practices and they're trying whatever they can and it is not pretty to see them act in such an egregious way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking virtually, one hand raised. Kevin, you're unmuted on our end. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Kevin Cosby from Montage Shelf. Uh, perfect timing. Um, yes, we did create a $5 million fund for teachers. Uh, we gave that money to the Community Foundation, Monterey Peninsula, which will be in charge of distributing these funds and the way that it's going to be set up, it will not be taxable income, first of all. And this is one of a series of things that we've been in the planning stages with for months. Uh, so this is not something that we just cooked up in the last couple of weeks. We transferred that money months ago. Uh, secondly, we also forgave debt, medical debt for everybody that was carrying medical debt with us during the pandemic, there was over 29,000 patient uh, accounts uh, that were wholeheartedly, completely forgiven. We have been, continue to be in conversations with employers, with unions and whatnot, uh, to try to directly reduce the costs uh, of care for them, have been for months. And there's an inordinate number of programs that the hospital and subsequently Montage Health Foundation fully underwrite uh, the costs of Montage Medical Group and primary care, uh, uh, population health programs like a countywide diabetes initiative, 
opioid mitigation, behavioral health that is has no other revenue stream. And so the hospital is carrying that burden happily as a, a whole variety of public health projects on behalf of the citizens of Monterey County. Thanks so much for the time to be able to address it. Thank you. Back to the individual at the podium. Hi, I'm Jen Villa, a teacher from Salinas, a high school teacher. I'm also the same teacher that got interviewed for the um, Bloomberg article. I also did a news segment for the local news uh, in Monterey. I want to go. I feel like my experience is so much like the construction workers behind me. I work hard. For my tenure, I don't get those raises every single year because of, of the cost of health care. When I started 10, 10, maybe 11, 12 years ago in Monterey, I paid $67 a month for me and my child. Fast forward till now, I pay $508. It increased almost eight times. I don't know what else has increased that much. Not gas, not eggs, not rent, not milk, but that does. And it takes away from my, I feel, earned raises. Okay, it takes so much that I also feel for my other friend here, the construction worker with diverticulitis. I too have diverticulitis. I don't go to the hospital because I can't afford the copay. I don't go to the doctors because I can't afford the medicine. I go to the panderia and ask the guy for uh, uh, not even a pack, just a slip of penicillin for 20 bucks to hold me over till my pain goes away. And then I'll do it again in three months because the cost of healthcare doesn't allow me the access. So when they think about talk about budgets, my budgets, I too have a personal budget that I do what I can to make it. And that's not going to the hospitals, not going to the doctor, but I'm still paying my health care just in case I get cancer or something very um, life threatening. But for the day to day, I don't access health care because of the costs. So. With all due respect for your budgets, I too have a budget and you disrespect mine by charging me this much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no hands raised virtually to the individual at the podium. Hi, thank you. Ben Johnson from the California Hospital Association. Um, I think today's conversation among the board member members really makes clear that there are really critical and important decisions that remain outstanding related to how a spending target is going to be enforced, uh, such as around what type of event, what level of an entity is it going to be a hospital, a health system, uh, affiliated provider groups as one as one member or not, as well as around um what factors will be considered in the review process and so forth and for these reasons we do ask the board to adopt a target for only the non-enforceable year to allow these critical decisions to be made uh, before setting an enforceable target for 2026. Uh, second just want to uh touch quickly on the factors that were listed on page 29. Um, we believe that the factors that are predictable and known uh, should be built in upfront into the actual spending target uh, rather than be left to uh, highly uncertain and really Mr. difficult to understand. Mr. And challenging to understand uh, enforcement process uh, that would not allow for proper planning uh, among healthcare entities. And then, just to close, uh, just note that we we do stand with OCA's efforts to improve the value uh, of healthcare in California, and do look forward to working with OCA uh, towards achieving the multiple objectives of the office. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing no hands raised at this time. Looking to individuals at the podium, seeing no individuals in the room wishing to make additional public comment. That concludes public comment on this item. We will now adjourn for lunch and return at. One will. 30 minutes and we'll return at 1.15. So, so hold on. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, we had one more section that we were hoping to get through. I think the board, I'm looking around. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of robust conversation this afternoon. 
This section will take probably 30 minutes to get through. Bit of presentation, public comment, a look. I'm not listening, I'm looking. Okay. All right, we're gonna go to lunch and then come back and do the Medi-Cal piece. So people who wanna leave, but stay if you can. Okay, we're gonna get started again. Thank you for returning from a short lunch. If we could reestablish quorum. Yes, Dr. Mark Galley. Present. Dr. David Carlisle. Present. Dr. Sandra Hernandez. Present. Richard Kronick. Present. Ian Lewis. Present. Elizabeth Mitchell. Present. Dr. Richard Pan. Present. Don Moulds. Seven present, one absent. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thanks for everyone returning just to, for the rest of the afternoon, the, the sort of schedule. We're going to go into the last part of um, Last part of description considerations of Medi-Cal spending. Uh, these slides the team will present, open it up for comment by the board, then have public comment, and then we'll be going to a review of the public comment and the advisory committee feedback on the proposed statewide spending target. Then I'm sure look forward to robust conversation by the board on where we are after those comments are considered and then uh, public comment to follow. And then we will be near or at the end of the meeting by then. So without further delay, go ahead, Vishal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, today, we wanna spend some time going over unique facets of Medi-Cal. Um, just one more slide. So first, I'd um, point out that um, consumer reportability is, is fundam fundamentally different in Medi-Cal compared to commercial coverage in Medicare. Only a small percentage of Medi-Cal members have a share of cost similar to a monthly deductible. Most Medi-Cal members have no cost sharing, which means um, consumer reportability is not a uh, barrier to ac accessing care. Having said this, I do want to acknowledge that Medi-Cal members may have medical debt from uh, periods when they were not on Medi-Cal or when they have to pay out of pocket for services um, that they have trouble accessing, such as mental health and, and denti dental benefits. Um, and then uh, do want to also um, uh, flag that some aspects of um, program administration for, for Medi-Cal requires us, um, OCA, to take a coordinated and tailored approach regarding data collection, uh, measurement, and enforcement. As a reminder, OCA will report spending data that includes managed care organizations and their contracted providers since they are healthcare entities under the statute. Next slide. So here we provide some background information on base and supplemental payments and non-federal share of financing. As many of you know, there's a base payment and separate supplemental payments for services rendered to beneficiaries. Supplemental payments leverage um, federally approved financing mechanisms to increase re reimbursements to providers. For the most part, the non-federal share of base payments is financed using the general fund. On the other hand, uh, the non-federal share for supplemental payments is largely financed um, using locally generated funds. These supplemental payments enable the state to maximize FFP or federal financial participation and increase reimbursement in Medi-Cal without increasing the use of general fund. Next slide. So th this slide lays out what's in statute for OCA to consider re relating to supplemental payments, uh, non-federal share and taxes or fees. We've included the citation as a, as a footnote. And then one more slide. Um, so uh, this next slide lays out um, when assessing financial penalties against a healthcare entity, OCA may consider um, any, non -prov any, any provision of non-federal share um, that's put up by providers. Um, and um, I'll, I'll now move on to the, to the next slide. 
that provides a status update on data reporting. Um, so um, under our approved data collection regulations, submitters um, have a one-year exemption for their Medi-Cal line of business. This applies to the first set of data that's due September 1st of, of this year for a calendar year 2022 and 2023 data. In the meantime, OCO will leverage existing data from the Department of Healthcare Services or DHCS to report managed care organization spending. Uh, I do want to note that on an aggregated basis, OCO will report supplemental payments and the provision uh, of non-federal share. Um, I'd note that leveraging existing data for DHCS does not enable us to report um, at the provider level um, or attributed total medical expenses to physician organizations. Um, OCO will need to collect additional data directly from MCOs in order to do this. The thinking behind that is that we first wanna work out uh, the data submission process with commercial payers on attributed total medical expenses for, for physician organizations um, before we um, expand uh, data collection to Medi-Cal MCOs. Lastly, um, as, you, as you may recall from, from earlier meetings, we noted the need for OCA to develop additional strategies to measure hospital spending across all patients, not just, not just those that are part of a health system with attributed lives, as we develop this approach, it will likely require inclusion of spending by lines of business, that is the commercial, Medicare, and Medicaid markets, um, as well as any consideration of, of requirements for the Medi-Cal program. Next slide. So this slide lays out what's in statute pertaining to coordination and spending target enforcement. OCA is required to coordinate enforcement actions with DHCS, uh, Department of Managed Healthcare, and California Department of Insurance as, as relevant. Under this provision, we would take into consideration Medi-Cal program changes that impacted spending. So um, on the next slide, um, it covers one of the more recent changes in Medi-Cal that impacts spending, which is the MCO or Managed Care Organization tax. Um, additional revenues from the MCO tax will be used to support the Medi-Cal program, including new targeted rate increases for providers and other investments that advance access quality and equity. We've laid out here the phases in which DHCS is implementing program changes with the, the first phase of targeted rate increases already effective. Uh, now um, on the next slide, we'll, we'll move on to the way OCA will assess performance and enforcement for entities participating in Medi-Cal. First, we'd like to provide some background information on Medi-Cal MCO rates. These are rates set by DHCS um, actuaries for each plan, rating region, and population uh, based on several factors, such as historical cost and utilization or uh, program changes, as well as consideration of reasonable, appropriate, and attainable spending for a typical Medi-Cal plan in the same geography. Um, rates are also subject to, to rigorous review by federal actuaries and are subject to extensive state and federal oversight and examination. Um, for these reasons, um, OCA would note that um, Medi-Cal MCO spending is, is significantly different compared to commercial spending. Um, with regard to providers, um, DHCS and its, and its actuaries also annually evaluate how the rates MCOs pay providers compared to Medicare and commercial coverage. Uh, this includes review by federal reviewers. Um, federal requirements prevent DHCS from funding MCOs for, for payment levels that exceed average commercial rates. Um, except for inpatient care, Current Medi-Cal um, payment levels for many services um, are below Medicare on average. And uh, going on to the, the next slide on the Medi-Cal section, um, because spending growth in Medi-Cal um, can change from year to year, OCA will coordinate 
with DHCS on factors um, such as rate increases, investments, and other program changes so that we provide the appropriate context. Um, given the extensive state and over federal oversight for Medi-Cal spending and rates uh, set for MCOs, um, OCA would not levy financial penalties on MCOs and or their contracted providers solely due to operational or policy decisions made by DHCS. And um, I'll just cover um, one more section on Medicare spending. Um, since there's a similar set of issues here, um, we, we could take uh, the board's comments in a few minutes. And next slide. Um, so um, just wanna provide some background on the next slide of, about Medicare Advantage. Um, as most of you know, um, Medicare fee-for-service rates are set administratively. Um, with respect to Medicare Advantage or MA plans, the, the federal government pays a set rate per person per year. This rate often has various adjustments, such as for quality. We've included some information with regard to how these federal payments to MA plans are tied to local per capita Medicare fee-for-service spending. Uh, this means the rates MA plans pay to providers are similar to or slightly above Medicare fee-for-service. Um, further, federal law requires providers to accept Medicare fee-for-service rates as payment in full for out-of-network services uh, received by MA enrollees. This effectively limits um, the rates that, that can be charged. And then on the next slide, um, just want to speak about how OCA is going to be assessing performance and enforcement for Medicare Advantage. Um, given the federal oversight for Medicare spending and, and rates set for MA plans, um, OCA would not levy financial penalties on MA plans and or slash or their contracted providers solely due to operational or policy decisions made by CMS. Additionally, o OCA will contextualize spending growth driven by program changes and requirements implemented by Medicare for, for providers that, that exceed the target for their MA line of business. Um, I'll now turn it over to the chair to facilitate discussion. David, we'll start with you. Uh, yes, very interesting. And I'm not really very familiar with this uh, part of the market at all, but could you um, share some information on the historic trajectories of uh, these sectors in terms of uh, spending increases? Um, yeah, I'm sure uh, Rick, board member Kronick could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, did, did you want to share something, Rick? <laughs> The Medicare story is, is uh, which I know a fair amount about it, I, I leave to others to speak about Medi-Cal, um, is complicated. Uh, um, Medicare spending growth per beneficiary has been at very low levels from 2010 through at least 2020. I've not followed it so closely in the last couple of years, but um, uh, Medicare spending growth per beneficiary was, I think averaging around 2% per person per year for most of the last decade. And um, some of that was uh, sort of intended as a result of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, some of that is not, not all that well understood. Um, at the same time, there is a fair amount of work, some of which I've done, a lot of which uh, MedPAC and Advisory Commission to Congress has done, on Medicare Advantage payments, all of which uh, argues that Medicare Advantage uh, is paid much more than uh, Medicare would be paying for similar beneficiaries and fee-for-service. In a report that, that um, MedPAC issued, I think, last week, um, their March report to Congress, they're estimating that Medicare Advantage is getting paid I think it was 22% more than similar beneficiaries in fee for service. Uh, I, I think that's probably an overestimate, but you know, MedPAC is MedPAC. It's a little bit hard to put these two. And then the third thing is that, that Medicare Advantage uh, 
enrollment has grown tremendously over the last decade. So we're now up over 50% nationwide. I have not seen the California uh, figures recently, but probably close to 60% in California. Um, it's a little hard to put these three things together, that Medicare Advantage is being overpaid so much, Medicare Advantage penetration has increased so much, and uh, Medicare payment per beneficiary has grown, have grown at very low levels. And so I, 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 why I say complicated. The one other thing to add though, is that the Medicare trustees um, uh, have, are projecting that Medicare spending per beneficiary will grow at about five and a half percent for the second part of this decade. Um, and uh, some of that is I think their estimates that Medicare Advantage payment per beneficiary is growing, uh, that, that Medicare Advantage is being paid too much and MA penetration is continuing to grow. And some of that is, is some combination of assumptions about utilization uh, and price increases that, that I, I don't know exactly what that, that sort of mix is of utilization and price. So historically, I mean, historically in, in the decade from 2010 to 2020, very low spending growth per beneficiary, but the projections uh, for the next five years are about five and a half percent per beneficiary per year. So pretty high. And, and Medi-Cal as well? Or MCOs. I'll take I'll take a stab. Um, I think the slide did did talk a little bit about inpatient hospital rates, outpatient. I mean, uh, you know, most of the Medi-Cal rates uh, are set in an actuarial sound range. We start with base payments, and then, as you heard, the supplemental payments that layer on top of that often um, significantly improve the total reimbursement for a specific service or, or whatnot. The MCO uh, tax contributions that are planned for this year and next year get many of those non-hospital rates in primary care, behavioral health, and maternal health care up uh, pretty close to almost 100% of Medicare. And with our equity adjuster is actually gonna be in some regions above 100 percent so you look at the historical trends they've kind of gone up and down certainly a lot of people say there's been you know over a decade without some significant increase in the base rates the mco plan over the last the this year and next year bring us uh to some increases on the base rates but it is sort of an unfair fight if you will without looking at the supplemental payments that vary depending on the entity, sort of the public entities that self-fund a lot of those, quote, IGTs, intergovernmental transfers that allow us to draw down additional Medicaid dollars, and then other taxes like the hospital tax, the MCO tax that come in and allow us to draw down other dollars. So it, it a, a little bit of a different story for sure, dependent on state-generated funds to draw down federal funds, which I think is in stark contrast to the way Medicare is is developed, but certainly uh, over the arc of the last few years, significant investment. The other piece that is tricky on Medicaid, unlike in Medicare, although Medicare is exploring it a little bit more now, are what um, Richard mentioned is investments in things that are not traditionally considered healthcare. You know, you you and I have talked about it, David. The four walls issue: is it happening in a clinic or a hospital? Not necessarily. How do we think about food and transportation and and housing and other quote social drivers and the investment that California is making in those and working with our Fed federal partners to increase the ability to do more of that, I think is also material to how you look at overall investments in Medicaid. I would like to think that those things that we're doing that are really driving people's health to improvement, uh, not just around the cost piece, will be carried over into Medicare as well, because God knows that's a population that could also really benefit from some of the attention around social drivers. Could I follow up? Uh, please do you, do you have an estimate mark of, of the per beneficiary increase in medical spending that you would expect over either 
2025, 2026, or even better, the five-year period that we're considering for spending targets here? We can certainly ask DHCS. I don't know if the office did. They had conversations with DHCS on this. I think what we do know is with the current investments, both in CalAIM and other transformations like it, plus the layering over of um, uh, what we would expect to happen this year and next year with our MCO augmentations, MCO tax augmentations to base rates, that there's some way to project that, but I'm not sure what the team has commented on for the sort of five-year five year period. Um, yeah, we, we do have some figures from the, the budget documents, um, but I, I believe it only goes out two years, but we, um, is this better? Okay. Yeah, we, we do have some figures from the budget estimates, so, and we, we could bring that to the next board meeting. I'm just going to go around. Richard, go ahead. So in the presentation, both for Medi-Cal and Medicare, you mentioned that you'd contextualize um, um, the um, you know, spending growth. So can you define contextualize for me? What operationally will you do to contextualize um, the, the increase? So I, I know that you said that you're not going to levy any financial pe penalties on plans or providers solely due to operational policy decisions made by whether it's DHCS or CMS respectively. But what do you mean by contextualized spending growth driven by program changes? This would just be um, in in any public reporting we do. We would um, we would know any any changes that have been implemented by DHCS for, for policy changes. Um, could there there could be swings in, in Medicaid, you know, related to the public health um, emergency unwinding, and then you know the CalAIM investments as well. It could kind of go either way. So we would um, put put those in, changes into context. Okay, so we explicitly exclude the Medicare and Medi-Cal piece that were driven by, so, you know, this, let's say you have a plan, they have a Medi-Cal piece, they have a Medicare piece or a dual piece, and then they have commercial piece. That those would get essentially, oh, carved out is not the right word, uh, but it was essentially separated out. Is that, is, is that what is that what will happen? I, I think this is a good question. I, in in looking at these, originally asked a similar question. Yeah. I think staff have an uh, answer. Yes, yeah, so it will definitely be reporting on um, the spending by the three different lines sure, of business: right. commercial, Medi-Cal, and Medicare. And to the extent, and we'll be working with DHCS to understand their program changes, mm -hmm. things like the implementation of MCO tax. How much of that increase? So yes, to the extent. Uh, health plans, for example, spending increased because of a Medi-Cal policy change. Um, it's important for us to both report that in the baseline report, and we certainly wouldn't um, have any uh, enforcement activity on that basis. Okay, so in other words, if the commercial side or the non-Medicare, Medi-Cal side was, let's say, whatever the percent we end up picking, they were they were at or below that, and the rest of it is because depending on policies, if it's really a 5% increase per year for, for Medicare and whatever we're doing Medi-Cal, and so their total will be higher, but it's mainly driven by the Medicare, Medi-Cal things, then the plan would be like, they're fine, right? There's no more, they, because they're, the, the, the part that isn't related to those two is actually at or below the target. Yeah, so, so we are analyzing the spending growth target by line of business. Right. So, so separately, but, so so we'll look at commercial. Did it meet whatever the board's percentage? Okay. But, but what I'm saying is like the, the, that plan would be in the clear then, right? No, if they exceeded it as to the commercial spending growth. Time. It, no, what I mean is, is yeah. So what happens is the commercial or the non-Medicare? I'm going to say non-Medicare Medi-Cal side was at or below the target, but because of the increases yes. in Medi-Cal, their overall total is above because those two, let's say, added to, you know together ended up lifting them above because, you know, they're, they're, let's say they're, they're just at the target, right? They're still okay because, frankly, because we sort of take out the Medicare, Medi-Cal part of it, right? Because those are driven by policy decisions by those respective agencies. Correct. Okay, thank you. So now I'm confused, uh, just on this point. 
So what I understood Dr. <clears throat> Pan to say that is if commercial came in below the target, but the Medi-Cal or the Medicare was above because of policy decisions made, made by it. CMS or DHCS, that e then then we're okay in each of the three lines of business. Right. As to that end. But we're not averaging across three Correct. lines. So if their commercial line of business is above the 3%, then we'd be in a situation where we'd be talking about testimony and the like. Correct. Okay. And just to punctuate it, and then Rick, there is no sort of, as you said, averaging or shifting, oh, Medicaid did this, so we had to do this. I mean, that is not, you know, we were trying to really, and, and I think part of the points on the presentations on the Medicaid side is there's a pretty robust process by which we consider use our sort of eyes and ears on the ground, use uh, feedback both from our federal partners and our state partners, the, the checks and balances within government to think about how that program moves forward, I think is really important to take into account as a sort of system that uh, moves it forward effectively and productively and uh, making sure that we keep that in mind as part of what is taken into account on the Medicaid side as a group. Rick, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I should uh, wait on this comment until the next section, but I ask for your advice. Um, the, 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 the comment is thinking about how this discussion about Medicare and Medi-Cal might affect our thinking about setting a statewide target. And I know the next section is about the statewide target, so tell me I should wait or not. Guessing where you're going, yeah. I think we should save it, and I would okay. probably ask you to share that early in that conversation so it can help set some some additional conversation and discussion. So, great. Thank you. Elizabeth stepped out. Ian, any questions, concerns? Okay. Uh, go to public comment on these two, on the Medi-Cal, Medicare. Pieces. At this time, we'll now accept public comment on this agenda item. Those in the room, please step to the podium. Those attending virtually, please raise your hand. Please try and keep your comments to two minutes. Thank you. Ben Johnson, California Hospital Association. Uh, thank you for the information on sort of the proposal for how you'll treat with treat Medicare and Medi-Cal spending. Um, we do look forward to continuing that discussion. There is a lot of complexity, for example, related to Medi-Cal financing and spending going forward. Um, our understanding is generally, at least in the Medi-Cal context, growth has been around 3 to 4% annually over the last few years, but not at all of that captures the major investments that the state has made, such as CalAIM, expanding coverage, and so forth. Um, but um, we do uh, have some significant questions about the distinct standards that are being applied on the payer versus provider side. Uh, so uh, sort of a blanket exemption on the payer side from any enforcement against the spending target while um, proposing to con contextualize policy changes uh, for on the provider side. So we look in, look forward to diving into that more. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Jeff, we see your hand raised. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Again, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, just a point of information, IHA does track Medicare Advantage as well in the same way as commercial. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the individual at the podium, please go ahead. Beth Capel on behalf of Health Access. We sometimes act like somehow Medi-Cal and Medicare spending are free and don't impact consumers because of the very low, appropriately, low or zero cost sharing in Medi-Cal. However, as taxpayers, every penny, virtually every penny in the Medi-Cal program and the Medicare program starts in our pockets. And so we do care about that spending and making sure that it is done wisely. We also recognize that both Medi-Cal and Medicare have their own rate setting processes while the commercial segment does not. And that that is part of what informs this discussion. 
we very much appreciate what was at one point slide 32, um, where you talked about the discussion the board just had about looking at the impact of the target by line of business or market segment. And we think that's an important part of the considerations before us. Um, you know, we've had a lot of disagreements over the decades about uh, Medi-Cal managed care rates. Every time we have attempted to do an expansion of coverage, we found ourselves in an argument over what is the per member per month cost of that expansion, whether it was the ACA expansion or the many health for all expansions. And so we have the experience of um, having a different view than the DHCS ossuaries on many of those expansions. I would also note that we have had the experience of observing Medi-Cal managed care plans that hoarded reserves rather than spending money on contracting with necessary providers. And that's also not a good place for consumers to be. So we think it's important to have scrutiny of the Medi-Cal managed care plans. It's in the law, it's there for a reason. Um, we would also note that when you think about Medi-Cal spending or indeed any of these spending targets, Two minutes. it's important to think about it on a per member per month basis, on a per capita basis, because that's how we're measuring it, not in the aggregate. I see Dr. Pan remembers this from the legislative discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing no hands raised, noting we have roughly 85 virtual attendees and seeing no one at the podium in the room, that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving to the team's presentation on feedback, public comment, and advisory committee feedback. And then we'll move into our board discussion. Thank you. So going to the next slide. Um, so there, there was robust public comment. OCA received 224 public comments related to the recommendation. Uh, the, the full comment letters are posted on our website. Comment letters came from uh, various stakeholders, including individuals, unions, consumer advocacy groups, equity focus organizations, purchasers, individual hospitals, physician and medical groups, um, and various um, professional associations listed here. Um, we've organized the comments into summary slides that are representative and organized by broad categories of, of spending target, methodology, and duration of the target. Within each category, we've also broken out comments further into the, the themes listed here. Um, and then we also have a, a slide that follows each of these um, theme-based slides um, that has our advisory committee response to the, the public comments. Um, because there's a lot of content on each slide, um, the approach um, uh, we'll take is to alternate um, between CJ and myself um, and uh, CJ will cover the next slide. All right. So again, this is our attempt to summarize some several hundred pages worth of written comments, several hours worth of discussion in the advisory committee. We're going to try to get through this, you know, uh, swiftly, but also leave plenty of time for for discussion from the board at the end. Um, so, with regard to the target value and access and quality of care, uh, again, we've organized this by concerns and support. So, sort of concerns related to this was that to meet the, and maintain the target, hospitals may have to reduce services or close certain service lines and could exacerbate an already difficult healthcare workforce shortage. The ability to deliver high quality healthcare to those in need is detrimentally impacted by any decrease in reimbursement. Concern that an unrealistic target could result in longer patient wait times, reducing patient access to care and penalize physicians who care for complex patients with disabilities and chronic disease. The most vulnerable patients might not be able to find physician practices and be able to, uh, to or medical groups and make it more difficult to meet the target, forces providers to cut back on care or face penalties. OCA has not performed sufficient analysis of the trends in healthcare labor costs and potential impacts of a 40% drop in healthcare spending growth in, in, on the workforce stability or the effects of negative real spending growth on access and quality. 
In support of the target value, we heard that any increase in cost of care will exacerbate problems with access, equity, and public health, furthering lack of access, affordability, and equity. These effects are particularly hard on minorities and those with disabilities. Lack of affordability impairs quality because consumers skip or delay going to the doctor, filling prescriptions, and getting other necessary care. Californians, especially those with employer-based coverage, are paying more and getting less, less care, less access to care, lower quality in terms of managing chronic conditions, and less health equity. OCA's proposed 3% cost growth target is desperately needed today to help California families who are insured be able to use their health insurance. The target will help Californians strengthen health care quality and achieve more equitable care. So upon presenting that to the advisory committee, the advisory committee's feedback on the next slide. Uh, comments that we heard, so there, we did not hear specific concerns related, that, that at least that we categorized back to those comments um, from the advisory committee in support. What we heard was that other states that overshot their targets likely did so because there was no need to achieve them or to adhere to them because there was no enforcement. Anything above 3% is problematic for access. Even if many entities don't meet the target, it's helpful information. Outcome could be they meet the target by lowering costs, thus increasing access, and overall spending will go down. Hope that providers don't automatically go to reducing services and access if they exceed the target, but rather look for efficiencies in the system or the prices being charged. So I'll, I'll cover the next um, theme category, which is target value. And the theme is uh, pertaining to, to the 3% the target value. So concerns raised by stakeholders included the following. Um, one stakeholder recommended a target. Um, if we could go back one slide. So one stakeholder recommended a target framework of one year at 6.3% in 2025, which accounts for inflation, aging, technology slash labor, and major policy impacts. Uh, for example, minimum wage, Medi-Cal investment, seismic compliance. The framework also includes a 5.3% average for uh, 2025 to 2029. Another commenter noted the average annual growth in per capita healthcare spending should be considered when setting a target. The commenter noted the 10-year average annual change in per capita spending uh, from 2010 to 2020 was 4.7%. Um, and 5.4% um, um, for the period 2000 to 2020. Another stakeholder recommended a target of at least 4.6% to not lose ground. They cited a data point from CMS that projected that the increase in the Medicare Economic Index, which measures the, the cost to practice medicine, will be 4.6% in 2024. The stakeholder noted that it is critical to consider rather than ignore the cost of providing health care when setting California's target. I'll now move on to the comments that support the 3% spending target value. The first, one's, the first one notes that 3% each year is not a reduction or freeze, but a goal that the industry must live within the same constraints as a median California family does. Next, 3% uh, is the upper bounds of what is sustainable and may not even go far enough because it won't do much to reduce high outlier prices. Another commenter noted that OCA's 3% target puts California squarely in the same range as other states. Other states with cost commissions have targets for 24 to 27 in the range of 2.8% to 3.3%. A target of 3.5 or 4% would be far higher when compared to other states. Um, a stakeholder support for the proposal for a cost target to be 3% or lower because it provides relief, real relief for California consumers and communities. And lastly, another commenter noted that a target should be less than 3%, but 3% allows costs to increase at the same rate as median household income. For the feedback we received from the advisory committee um, on, on the next slide, I'd, I'd note the following comments. Um, that raise concerns. 3% um, doesn't account for actual costs. If the target's applied universally, it doesn't account for the different starting points. Um, they give an example of two medical groups, um, you know, one being higher cost, substantially higher cost than the other. 
um, and that OCA should apply a different target to higher performing providers versus low quality providers. Um, another commenter noted, we all want healthcare to be affordable and high quality, but a 3% metric is not connected to costs. Entities are all not, are not all starting from the same place. And then they mentioned examples, examples of capitation and fee for service. Every market is different, but we're applying one number to all areas. Also, there are significant cost increases from regulatory requirements, minimum wage, seismic. OCA should reduce the length from 20 years of median household income to something less. Consider adjustment factors and include quality. For example, if a provider is paid on an APM with high quality scores, consider a different number. Not everyone is starting at the same place. Some systems serving vulnerable pop populations will look bad for failing to meet the target when they are just starting behind the others. Allow time to compensate for deficiencies that have been allowed for the last 50 years. Moving on to comments and support from the advisory committee. This included su supporting 3% since what we're doing now isn't working, um, which, which is the entire premise of the, of the statute. Board can reassess later if needed. Don't bake in what's already not working. 3% is not radical, it's incremental. Um, also need better data to unpack percentages in the concerns area to know how much is stakeholder dividends and profit or uh, shareholder dividends and profits. Um, for example, and where, where we need to invest and where to cut without impacting care or, or quality. Um, based on new data analysis, um, uh, one, one commenter on the advisory committee noted that between 2019 and 2022, per claim cost growth, um, according to their analysis, was kept to 2.4% a year. A 3% target can be done. 3% is a good target goal. OCA is prepared to shift due to changes. If needed, 3% is a place to create space for innovation, not continue in the same direction of high cost growth. Regarding suggested targets, uh, regarding suggested higher targets, don't bank, don't bank in the status quo or maybe even worse performance. What would we tell the public about what we are doing about affordability? Um, another comment in support um, noted there's room for doing business differently um, through efficiencies, um, gained through investment and prevention. Experience, um, another commenter noted that, that they experienced a 9.5% increase in premium costs last year. 3% would be extraordinary, extraordinary at this point. Starting at 3% is a good goal to be able to see where spend is happening and adjust when needed based on that knowledge. And I'll, I'll shift it back over to CJ. So we also received comments related to the adjustments with the target methodology. On the concerns, we heard that aging is projected to increase healthcare spending by 0.7% annually. The increasingly aging population of California results in higher costs of care for healthcare entities. Government reimbursement for Medi-Cal and Medicare has not kept pace with rising costs of labor, supplies, and drugs, leading to fiscal losses for safety net providers. With regard to the MCO tax, failing to account for this critical new spending that will improve access to care for Californians when setting the spending growth target undermines all of the work we are collectively doing to improve patient care in the Medi-Cal system. The methodology does not account for costs of new health care technology. The methodology doesn't take into account the rising costs due to key industries driving rising costs, such as insurance companies, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and PBMs. 2030 seismic operational mandates for hospitals, SB 1953, are unfunded and require hospitals to take on loans with interest rates of greater than 3%. Uh, in support of the adjustments, OCA should not apply any prospective adjustments to the target that increase provider plan costs. These adjustments are speculative and hard to quantify in advance. There will be a mechanism to account for major unexpected cost drivers in retrospectively assessing entities' performance against the targets in future years. OCA should quickly set sector targets, geographic, industry and entity specific a statewide only target allows high cost providers to increase costs at the same rate as low cost providers focus on high cost outliers and set the target below the statewide average 
Right in support of OCA's suggested statewide spending target at most 3% without any further delays and without population or new technology adjustments. This target makes sure that health care costs don't outpace what everyday Californians can afford. Continuing in the theme of, adjust, of adjustments, uh, couldn't get this all onto one slide. With uh, concerns, and projections in the spending target, the state's health care system will be unable to afford medical supplies and upgrades to its physical and technological infrastructure. 3% target is well below inflation projections for California and would remove $4 billion annually from health care system, ultimately impacting quality and access to care, as well as investments in care quality improvements. Historically, other spending target states have struggled to meet the target and had to readjust the target. COVID-19 significantly impacted hospitals and could face similar pandemic events in the future. Proposal does not take into consideration market growth for health care worker wages. Proposing an unadjusted target based on median family income growth is setting a target lower than recent years GDP growth, making California an outlier when compared to the eight other states with similar cost growth targets. In support, uh, comments included that 3% exceeds recent inflation projections by the Department of Finance and the Congressional Budget Office for 2025 and beyond. OCA's 3% spending target puts California squarely in the same range as other states. Other states with cost commissions have targets for 2024 through 2027 in the range of 2.8 to 3.3%. A target of 3.5% or 4% would be far higher than the targets in other states. The recent spate of inflation will already be built into the baseline and not need to further influence the growth target. The 2025 target will be reported in 2027. By then, the inflation of 2022 and 2023 will be years in the rearview mirror. If there is a reversal of trend, the board has the flexibility to review the target. After years of conversations and now implementation of the new Office of Healthcare Affordability, Californians should, have, should not have to settle for a target that is less ambitious than what Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, and other states around the country are using for a goal in the next several years. And the AC feedback uh, and the concerns was that the target should start with healthcare costs as we see it and adjust for affordability. Concerned about setting a target that has nothing to do with medical cost inflation. Also concerned about unintended consequences. In other words, if we're using Medi-Cal, Medicare, and self-insured ERISA plans as outside of this process, so just focusing on commercial providers will have to somehow make their revenue add up to cover costs, especially with low Medi-Cal, Medicare reimbursement. And then we impose a 3% target. We haven't thought through the implications of that complexity. Employers might shift from fully insured to self-insured to avoid this process, and it would harm consumers without state consumer protection mandates, plan design standards, and so forth. In support, uh, regarding the unintended consequences, if the premium contribution had stayed the same as inflation between 1996 and 2019, workers in San Francisco's self-funded plan would have taken home an extra $200,000. For years, those picking up the tab have been working people, commercial insurers, and purchasers. The tables have turned, and industry has to figure out how to bring rates down. It's not sustainable. Some adjustments are opportunities to reduce costs and provide better care. For example, aging, lowering costs by giving better care in their community versus expensive institutions. So I'll cover the category of targets setting methodology, economic indicator. Um, so comments we received um, that raised concerns. The office has yet to collect data to inform the establishment of a credible attainable target using a 20 year period for the historical household uh, historical median household income is flawed um, because it includes the, the Great Recession using a 10 year period instead is more representative of the current climate. It is more realistic to base the proposed target on projections for median household income growth over the next five years. And then the, the last comment raising concerns, it is more appropriate to look at the median income over the last 10 years, which is 4.1%, and the current projection for median household income growth for, for the year 2026, which is 3.6%. 
um, moving on to the, the comments and support, um, one uh, commenter noted a longer look back period creates more stable spending growth over time and provides a steadier foundation for which the industry can sustainably and structurally adjust. Another uh, comment noted that the only metric that is tied to affordability relates to income. Other suggested metrics may be useful for management and analysis, but do not relate to affordability. Another noted that anchoring the methodology and affordability metrics, um, not the spending target. Using growth and median household income aims to keep household spending from growing no faster than income and helps prevent further erosion of affordability. The, uh, another comment noted that the first step in changing healthcare costs is setting a target that for the first time reflects the experience of consumers and purchasers rather than letting the industry charge whatever it can. And then lastly, um, another comment in support um, noted that the board has discussed at length the critical importance of basing the spending growth target on median household income, which reflects the ability of consumers to afford care and coverage rather than the wealth of the economy. And then going on to the advisory committee feedback on, on this category, um, comments uh, raising concerns noted that a 3% target includes um, the, the, the Great Recession. Um, and then they also noted the forecasted income is 3.6%. Um, in 10 years, when the recession is not in the historical period and the situation is reversed, historic, you know, in other words, historical is higher than projected. Would those arguing for a historical 20 year period stick to, stick to that or look at the lower projected number? We set targets for the future. Our starting point is very different than 3%. Another commenter noted that Massachusetts and Oregon are meeting soon to probably raise their targets. Look back period should be 10 years. With, within the next few years of data gathering, hopefully there's flexibility to raise the target closer to 4%. Um, advisory committee comments and support um, noted that a 20 year look back period is appropriate because a shorter look back period has higher variability and a longer look back period helps smooth projections. Some states are talking about the period we we're just coming out of with high inflation spikes that's hopefully now moderating. We have data suggesting that the inflationary period should be taken into account, but it should be spread out over time. This provides more consistency to industry. And going back to CJ. And so I'll be covering comments that were related to the target duration. So in the concern, some of the concerns we heard was that setting a single year target is that we should set a, set a single year target to allow time to resolve challenges. For example, staffing and labor costs, rising pharmaceutical costs, medical device and supply costs and potential for reduced federal Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements, as well as provider attribution, Medi-Cal data collection, treatment of supplemental payments, and provider self-financing clarity. Statute allows for OCA to adopt a single year target rather than a five year target immediately. Set a one year baseline target for 2025 and use 2025 to collect data to inform the first enforceable target for 2026. This allows hospitals to develop ways to reduce costs, slow spending without major detrimental impacts on care, medical, education, and research. Uh, in the support, we heard that a glide path or a phase in of as yet unspecified parameters that allows industry to grow that much further only prolongs the pain of consumers and other purchasers beyond the intent of the long debated law by allowing industry more time to undercut the need for change. Setting a five year target allows the board the flexibility to adjust the target if necessary, such as for extraordinarily expensive new drug or cost savings due to widespread adoption of technology or other efficiency improvements. And from the advisory committee, uh, the concerns that we heard were that the starting point for entities is far from OCA's 3% recommendation, that there's a need for a glide path or a realistic target where everyone will miss it, need something providers can realistically strive for, trying to get to something drastically different will take time. In support of the duration, uh, there is support, but consider getting to sector and entity specific targets faster than five years. Uh, there's a comment that we are now that we are on a glide path now. 
I expect that the 2025 union rates would be going in that direction because 2024 rates did not. Industry has been on notice at this table and seen this coming. It's not a surprise. There's a need to recognize that any target is on a glide path already and need an industry needs to figure out how to get there. The recommendation will not reduce or freeze healthcare costs, but it also won't make it more unaffordable for Californians, especially since progressive enforcement is going to take years. There's support for multi-year target. One-year target doesn't make sense since OCA won't have won't get data for a couple of years to have a conversation. If it's one year, what do we do the second year? Still won't have new information to inform the process. Need a multi-year to give industry something to work with and board can change and adjust if needed. Okay, so we're on our last section. Um, so uh, we have a group of comments that didn't fit neatly within the, the, uh, the, the other categories. So we've li listed them here. Um, so for public comments we've received, um, OCA has not, uh, one commenter noted that OCA has not communicated r rules around how data would be analyzed. OCA has not laid out rules for how entities would be held accountable for the target. Another uh, reference to 2019 CHCF report um, where prices for both inpatient and outpatient services um, increase when there is more market concentration or consolidation if the board sets the, the target too low. High cost outliers will continue to be just that, high cost outliers, and smaller entities will give up and be swallowed up by larger, often more expensive systems. Setting the targets too low will drive the very consolidation that leads to increased healthcare costs um, that you hope to prevent. Um, moving on to the comments and support, the, the target should not simply codify the existing cost trends that led to today's affordability crisis where low and middle income families choose between getting care and paying for other household necessities. The target and other important elements of the law are designed to foster structural and system, systemic change that improves outcomes, quality, and equity while slowing healthcare cost growth. Um, spending that does not go into healthcare is, is available to other parts of the economy, starting with the wages of workers who do not work in healthcare, but also for other purposes of employers. The OCA staff proposal is not a reduction nor a freeze, but a goal for the industry to compete within the same constraints as a median family, median California family. Um, another commenter noted that the industry should not simply be able to charge whatever its inflated costs are and expect Californians to sign the check no matter the cost. And um, the last uh, written comment in support um, noted that OCA should set a goal aligned with the actual experience of California families and give the industry the tools, flexibility, and incentives to innovate to meet the goal of lower costs and improve quality and equity. And then going on to um, advisory committee response to these comments, um, uh, there there were none on for, for the left column, um, but we do have some for support. Um, one commenter noted that it appears many integrated systems are in the 3% range. The target would focus attention on areas with more uncoordinated and more expensive care. The target is appropriate and should not be viewed as punishment but as a way to identify underlying issues and shift resources to more integrated systems and right care, right time, and away from the patient affordability crisis. And we'll continue to go on for, um, David, you were our board representative at the advisory committee. I wonder um, if you have anything to add on CJ and Vishal's presentation. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'll say that uh, Vishal and CJ, I think, covered the, um, you know, the the heart of the meeting uh, very, very comprehensively. So not a whole lot to add there in terms of that uh, very important discussion. Uh, one of the interesting components of the meeting that stood out to me was uh, occurred right at the top. I think before we got into the real agenda, which was um, just a discussion about what's what's happening to to um, consumers, and I think there was a sentiment that was uh, expressed uh, fairly widely. Uh, that consumers are getting um, getting hammered twice right now, uh, both by um, increasing healthcare costs in general um, as a sort of tidal uh, shift, but also due to the impact of increased co-payments 
uh, that reflect uh, uh, for many people the the efforts of employers to uh, to uh, lower health care costs or control health care costs. And consumers may be bearing uh, the double double brunt of those trends um, and in a ways that we're, we're hearing um, from uh, much public comment. The only other things um, that I think came up in the meeting were some discussions about health care workforce and primary care and uh, health care uh, workforce stability standards that I know we'll, we'll get to at, at some point. But those are other topics that the uh, advisory co uh, committee spoke to as well. I was uh, impressed by the robustness of the discussion um, and the, um, the enthusiasm people had. Thank you. Thanks, um, Elizabeth. If it's on the advisory committee, it is. Go ahead, please. Thank you, and thank you, David, for going. And um, I did read all the notes, and I read all the comments, and I was just curious. It, it was a remarkable consistency. We support the goals, but we like the goals, however. But did anything come up in the advisory committee from the industry on ideas, ways they might actually make care more affordable? Was there any sort of proposal, or was it just we can't do it? I guess all I can say is um, not that I recall. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I know that we were gonna pause, have the conversation now among the board and then public comment. There are some slides about process that I think are really important to hear first, and then we'll come back and have the conversation we're gonna have. So Vishal, Elizabeth, if you can, present those and then we'll have our conversation. We could advance one more slide. Um, so just putting here the statutory requirements um, for, for setting a target. Um, on the next so slide, it, it visually conveys many of these requirements. Um, we posted it on, on the 17th. There was, um, a board meeting on the 24th of January that kicked off that 45-day process. Um, comment letters were due on March 11th. Um, and then since then, you know, in, in the intervening period, we had um, uh, an advisory committee meeting in January, and then we also moved up um, an advisory committee um, to, to last week um, to, to review that those comment letters. Um, so um, the board is required to adopt a final target before June. Um, as we've said before, the target could be the office's proposal or an alternative value. Um, and then the next slide, just for reference, um, is listed here. And I'll, I'll now turn it over to Director Landsberg. Thanks very much, Rashal. Um, a board member asked us at the last meeting that the office respond to the stakeholder feedback we received um, on the proposed target, and so I will cover that briefly. So with all of the work that OCA does, oh, I think Michelle was going to cover this, but I, so this this restates, as, um, as you all know, we can go back to the, to the slide before, um, which, which, as you know, represents the, the office's proposed spending growth target. So now moving um, to the office's response to the very robust discussion, I just want to say, you know, we, we, we've You've heard heard board members say that we've read your comments. Um, certainly, the staff spent a lot of time with the comments and listening, and so I think we've had a very robust, meaningful um, discussion. So, when we think about the spending growth targets um, and the work, we really return to the underlying purpose of the office. So, I did go back to the statute and pulled some of the sections about what is our charge with the Office of Healthcare Affordability. So, this slide includes language from OCA's authorizing statute. It's note, it notes the reality consumers are facing that the spending growth target um, is attempting to address. Unaffordable spending growth, which results in consumers not getting needed care and consequently um, worse health outcomes. We know that those results are worse for communities of color and low-income consumers. And the legislature, I think importantly, noted a belief that spending growth is being driven primarily by higher prices. The consumers um, that we have heard from today and at every meeting of this board have told us the huge access problems that costs cause you, and, and we hear you. Um, addressing this problem of higher costs and its impact on consumers is our guiding light. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so again, really want to appreciate the robust and thoughtful stakeholder feedback we received on the proposed target. 
um, we did spend significant time reviewing that feedback and listening to our stakeholders. Having done so, OCA does maintain our recommendation to this board to use median family income growth to establish a 3% target from 2025 to 2029 and to use the 20 year look back period to smooth fluctuations. And we've heard from stakeholders about, um, we, we think it is important to use that 20 um, year look back period um, for, for the longer time and eventually um, we'll get into out years where the Great Recession won't be part of it, but that is part of the reality um, that consumers faced. Um, we've heard this from stakeholders and agree um, that in some ways the spending growth target is a modest approach. We're not talking about lowering the cost of care for consumers, which many understandably call for, but, but rather having those costs grow at a more moderate rate. That's what we're talking about. And I think um, most importantly for us, the office seeks to fundamentally change the way healthcare is delivered in California, to change the incentives in the healthcare industry and to find approaches that are both more cost effective and that improve consumer health outcomes. We've heard of, about you know, a small subset of those approaches um, at some of our advisory committee meetings and, and these board meetings and invite and look forward to other presentations um, about those innovative approaches. Research identifies many areas of savings that can be achieved, including through reducing unnecessary and in some cases harmful care, focusing on preventive and early intervention, lowering administrative costs and profits. I think on the workforce side, there's a lot that, that can be done to retain existing staff um, and that that can result um, again in improved health outcomes and lower costs. Other states that have adopted cost growth targets report that the target number is a factor in negotiations and helps drive toward changes to improve quality care and that is what we're seeking here in California. So that is why the office has our performance work streams to measure and incent investment in primary and preventive care. We look forward to talking to you a lot more about the primary care spend goal at the next meeting. You've heard some about our APM work and we'll continue as well as um, our work to tie payment to quality measures and to measure equity and quality. Uh, and then one more slide. Um, if I get where I need to be. Okay. Um, so in addition to feedback regarding what economic indicators should be used, we've also heard about stakeholders requesting adjustment to the target based on cost of care. So we want to address that as well. And again, we believe the industry has significant strategies that they can bring to bear to address costs. This effort is about every sector of the healthcare arena taking the steps available to them. And that's why it's so important that the targets apply to health plans as well as to provider groups and to hospitals. We've heard many heart-wrenching stories from consumers who have had to adjust their budgets to pay medical bills. And we do believe industry leaders can make changes in how care is delivered to achieve this spending growth target. Some stakeholders have asked that we make population-based adjustments to the target to, for example, address an aging population. We do not recommend that the board make population-based adjustments, both because we believe that care for seniors has many opportunities for improved, more cost-effective care, and because not all entities are similarly impacted by population changes. So as we seek to adopt a statewide growth target, it's hard to make those, some of those adjustments. Similarly, as to adjustments for high cost specialty drugs or technology, those don't impact all healthcare entities in the same way. Our approach instead will account for actual costs documented on the back end. And you know, very much heard you this morning, we need, we certainly have more work to do to develop the specific approach for that and appreciate the discussion this morning on consideration um, for that process. In terms of duration, we do continue to recommend to the board that you adopt a five-year target and revisit annually to address unforeseen changes. So we know that contracts are often adopted on multi-year bases um, and think the predictability of a five-year target is an important message to the industry um, about expectations. And we just have one last slide um, about next steps and then look forward to the discussion. So I've, I've covered the first bullet um, and just want to, the first two bullets. Um, so we are working to adopt a, a final target by June 1st. Um, and it, it could be uh, the, the office's recommendation or an alternative by the board. 
Um, should the board choose to do the latter, we provide the following options for the board to consider. Um, they could modify the methodology for arriving at a target value. Um, they could change the, the economic indicator. They could change the, the target value, um, change the duration of the target. And lastly, um, they could the board could create a, a target phase in. To, to keep us on track, um, the office will list the, the statewide spending target value and methodology as an action item for the board to consider at the, the next meeting on April 24th. Um, I want to note that placing an item on the agenda does not require the board to take action. Uh, we, we do this because state law does not allow the board to discuss or act on, a, on an item unless it is listed on the agenda. If action is not taken in April, it will be placed on the May agenda. I'll now turn it back over to Chair Galley. Thank you and um, appreciate the patience of the board to go through those process uh, steps just to remind us what this conversation could lead to in terms of uh, a potential consideration of setting that target at our next meeting. Uh, so I wanted just full clarity that that is an opportunity, an option, uh, and we'll now I'll just sort of jump in and Rick, I sort of asked you to table your comment from the last uh, section to now, and maybe I'll turn to you first to uh, sort of start start there if that's okay. And then we'll give everybody ample chance to jump in. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you for the uh, you know excellent summary of 500 pages of comments in the advisory committee. I, uh, read through the 500 pages, but could not claim to be able to quote you chapter and verse, and you did a great job there. Um, there were three uh, pieces of the comments that, that resonated with me, one, one of which is I've raised before, so it's relitigating, and I'll just say very briefly, and I think I was not persuasive to other board members the last time we discussed it, and I doubt this will change. And that, that is the question of what is the the best forecast for median wage growth, uh, median household income growth in the next five years? And, you know, you had on your summary, I think, a very eloquent comment that, you know, healthcare industry should live within the same constraints that the rest of us do. And, and you know, question is what will those constraint, constraints be and no one knows, I do not have a crystal ball. I think none of us here are economists and economists don't have crystal balls either. Um, uh, but in the information that you presented in the January meeting, it, it showed uh, that you know the five year averages over the last 10 years have been quite consistent at around 4%. And it's clearly possible that that will drop back back down to 3% in the next five years. Uh, we could certainly have a recession. Um, you know, most economists aren't predicting recessions. And again, I don't claim to know what median wage growth will be in the next five years. I think it's much more likely that it will be closer to 4% than 3%. But, you know, I've said that before and um, have not been persuasive. Uh, I, I think it would be useful to, to look at that data again um, uh, and maybe at the next meeting we can bring that slide back and you know even without being economists I think anyone looking at it not anyone many people looking at it would would think that four percent is more likely than three but I'll, I'll leave, that, leave that aside the other two points uh, that, that resonated are, are new or at least we haven't discussed before and and, and the first is the uh, suggestion or, or exhortation that uh, the target should be adjusted for the aging of the California population. And early on, we heard an estimate um, that aging would not have much of any effect, maybe 0.1 to 0.2 percent a year. We, we've had some uh, uh, back and forth, or I've had some back and forth with, with staff. Um, and. Uh, that was answering that 0.1 to 0.2 percent was answering a different question than I think the one that is appropriate, which is suppose that uh, commercial per beneficiary or per person 
uh, spending growth was 3% a year, and that Medi-Cal per beneficiary uh, spending growth was 3% a year, and that Medicare per beneficiary spending growth was 3% a year. What would the average statewide spending growth be? And the answer is pretty close to 3.5% a year. That um, more of my colleagues um, uh, are in Medicare now, we have more over 65 year old folks, and that that shift to more of us being Medicare eligible would cause even if the th each of the three sectors had 3% per year growth, would cause average wage growth, average spending growth to be three and a half percent. So if we are sticking with a, if we do stick with a 3% target per person, we are implicitly saying that we want the average of commercial Medicare and uh, Medi-Cal spending growth per person to be two and a half percent. And maybe that's what we as a board want to do, but we, we should be aware that it's not because of aging, a 3% overall target is implying a, a, around a two and a half percent or maybe even slightly less target on a sort of age constant basis. That's my second of the three points. And then the third uh, of my three points, the one that, that kind of resonated um, is that the affordability problems that we have been talking about are, are primarily almost exclusively, not ex almost exclusively, but pri primarily around affordability for working people, for people covered by employer-sponsored insurance. And we heard public comment to say, you know, don't forget about Medicare, it's really important. There was a lot of out-of-pocket exposure for Medicare beneficiaries, but that out-of-pocket exposure for Medicare beneficiaries the amount of it isn't related directly at least to what happens to Medicare spending. I mean, it's set by Congress and I suppose if Medicare spending were to grow much more slowly, maybe that would make it easier for Congress to reduce co-payments and deductibles. But these are for Medicare largely separate, for Medi-Cal largely separate, certainly as taxpayers, we're all paying for it. Although for Medicare, it's mostly being paid for by the other 90% of the country. I mean, if we reduce Medicare spending in California, we'll get some benefits, but not so much. So the, the affordability problems that we've been focusing on, and, and certainly in, in public comment, we've been hearing um, you know, almost exclusively from uh, people covered by employer-sponsored insurance. Um, affordability problems are for commercial. And if what we want is that commercial spending per beneficiary should grow at 3%, if that's kind of the main goal. And Medicare, you know, the Office of the Actuary, again, no crystal balls, but they are saying they expect Medicare is gonna grow at 5.5% per beneficiary. We can certainly say, well, that's too much. It should be less than that. But if we think it should be 4.5%, um, still, that would imply, and leaving Medi-Cal out for, uh, outside for a moment, um, because I don't have a good number for Medi-Cal, but just combining commercial and Medi-Cal, that the statewide target wouldn't be 3%, but it would be some weighted average of three and either five and a half in the actuary's uh, view of the world or something less that we might say, you know, we don't wanna just accept Medicare as is health systems, delivery systems ought to be um, reforming there and, uh, you know, improving performance. But, you know, improving performance from five and a half to three would be, be quite a long way. So, to, my sort of concern and, and thought is that if we want, uh, that we should build up a statewide target from starting from the commercial goal that we agree to, which I think most people on the board probably think is should be 3% per beneficiary. Again, I, I would argue for, for something different. Um, and then recognize 
that Medicare and Medi-Cal are likely to be different. And um, I think, you know, the, as I understand the staff recommendation, that recognition could come at the entity level when deciding, you know, whether or not um, to re require a performance improvement plan. But it would seem odd, I think, and not very credible to have a statewide target that no entity met, but then every entity was okay because once we considered Medicare and Medi-Cal, we would say that they were all right. You know, um, uh, and then just finally, you know, Mark, I, I think you, you said earlier, and, and, and I partially agree with you that the question of where the target is and how tight the exception process should be are, are different questions. Um, and, and I think that, that that is right. But if we do have a very tight target and you know, 600 of the 750 entities uh, are above that target, and they all come in with their explanations of why it is. I think it will be much more difficult to implement a tight exception process than if we had a somewhat higher target and a smaller number of entities coming in with their excuses. It would be easier to say, no, this is not okay. Um, you know, the other 550 entities were fine. You come in, you know, this 100 entities are coming in with their the, the, the reasons that they couldn't make it, and it'd be much more feasible to um, look at those um, with a uh, more skeptical um, eye than if we've got 600, tar 600 entities all of which have reasons and kind of sorting through while well, these hundred have good reasons, good, not good reasons and the other 550 have good reasons. You know, maybe you can do that, but it'd be hard and a tremendous amount of effort. Um, so three points here, one, still not comfortable with the 3% expectation for medium wage growth, although I, I readily admit no crystal balls. Uh, I'm sorry, median household income growth. Second, kind of a recognition that aging is having an effect on health spending. And it would make sense to me to recognize that in setting the target. And third, that I would suggest that we focus on the target for commercial, which is the kind of affordability question that's the highest of, of highest interest and then build up the statewide target um, from that base, rather than just saying we're going to deal with it on the back end. Okay, thank you. In the spirit of the kind of conversation I hope I, we have, feel free to respond or feel free to take us in a different direction. Richard, I'll have you go first and then come back to you, Ian. Thank you. Um, I think, as I said in the outset uh, during our first meetings, um, when one studied the other states and their efforts, um, and I think Massachusetts was first, one of the most important points that was made about the success or failure of those other states was actually the credibility, the credibility of the targets they set, and not just the number, but how they came about it. And I really appreciate what um, Dr. Kronick has said, because I think he does speak to credibility issues. I think there's some debate whether median family income is the correct answer. Certainly, I understand the rationale that was presented that it was, you know, based on um, you know, what people can quote unquote afford related to their income. But then we arbitrarily picked a 20 year. Whereas we know and we've looked at it that the last 10 years, it's closer to four. Now, again, I agree, no crystal ball, but for the last decade. If that's really the rationale we're using, then we should be talking four. Frankly, otherwise we don't sound credible again. Frankly, in my mind, right? 
that's that that there's a there's a there's a credibility problem. Now, if there's another aspect, so for example, you said, well, you know what, we think there's let's say 30% waste or whatever in healthcare. Now, I think you know there, again, go back to the question of where where exactly is it? Um, I challenge you to go to. Um, I'm not saying you can't find any waste. And I think there's certainly opportunities to reduce costs. By the way, I should mention, I, I find it disappointing that it was said that, um, that there was no proposals for um, suggestions on cost savings um, because they're, that they can recall, but yet there were, um, there's the um, APF letter cites the Berkeley Forum report. Uh, there's, well, obviously we had presentations. Actually, interesting enough, the health systems that presented to us, and I appreciate those presentations for attempt savings. We did ask them, like, what did they think about 3%? And these are, are high performing. They're the ones we asked to present, and they all said, well, that's going to be a problem. Okay. Okay. So we, we, we brought the best we could find, and they said that was a problem. Right. So again, there's a credibility problem. Um, if you know, so if, if you're saying there's a certain percentage of waste in the system, okay, well then, if you looked at the actual increase in healthcare spend, and subtracted that percentage out, I think you still get a number higher than if you want to pick 30, 40 percent. I think you're still talking five or six percent. Okay, because I think the uh, medical uh, Expenditure uh, cost index. Or interesting enough, on the comments, we actually have contradictory comments uh, there. Uh, uh, I, I noted that uh, some people said uh, certain, you know. Um, so, uh, well, let's go this way. Inflation. Let's just talk about inflation. Just general inflation. After all, by the way, your healthcare entity, you still have to, you know, you, you still have to buy supplies. You still pay rent. You do utilities. Those aren't healthcare specific. Uh, those are. And so inflation certainly uh, affects healthcare entities, right? In terms of just their practical operation, it affects every business, right? Not just healthcare businesses. So we have to, we do have to think about, you know, not even just medical expenditure inflation, just regular inflation, right? And what what the impact that has, and um, you know, inflation itself is probably well the the Feds are trying to target. Two, I think, but we'll see. I mean, it's it's not it's 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 certainly not that far off from three. Um, and then I, I think that the population adjustment. This was explicitly discussed for the statute. And if it's small, fine, it's small. But the reality is, is that we know when people get older, they have more healthcare demands. And we have an aging population. Yet I don't understand the resistance to acknowledging that very fact. I don't understand the resistance to acknowledging that very fact. Right. Um, so, again, uh, I agree with Dr. Kronick there. There's a there becomes a credibility issue, and so that that that's certainly a major concern of mine. I, I do think that. Um, again, I, as expressed before, I don't oppose eventually doing a five year because I think it's good to give people a direction, but this is our first target. And we should see how it starts playing out. We get a sense of like how many of the 750 odd entities are we going to have to have PIPs for? What kind of workload is that? What kind of PIPs are we coming up with? We still have work to even develop what they are and so forth. So, you know. To me, it makes sense to say, let's establish a target for a year, maybe two. After all, the legislative intent was the first one was to was because the idea was that we were supposed to learn from that. It wasn't that, oh, well, we just gave you the first year for free and then you just roll it out. Right. I think that that, that was not the purpose so that we can learn from and then we can develop. More appropriate policies with more information. Obviously, we're going to continue to develop gain information, but also we're also going to be debating more policies in terms of how we're going to enforce, what kind of things, how we're going to implement things. Questions that we're not going to answer the next two months, frankly, because we don't have the time. But I think that's going to inform future target setting as well, right? Uh, because some of it's going to be because in the end, you know, we we all know, and I appreciate the folks who said, you know, at three percent, it's too expensive, et cetera. But we all know that just because we set whatever percent, whatever number it is, that's not what it's what operationally it actually will be. Right? I mean, we can punish people for being over it. 
but the reality is is that people has to be credible we have to force effectively we have to force in a way that because what we, what we don't do i mean if our enforcement is to simply deny people care right driving people under driving businesses under driving practices under forcing them to close etc that's another form of denial of care simply eliminating the service altogether or limiting it to 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 to, to such a small percentage of people compared to the number of people who need it that's not where we're trying to go. I'm sure that's not where the staff or the rest of the board wants to go. But if we don't do it right, that's what we will do. And that's what I'm concerned about. We're going to send signals to people that that's where we want to go. And so we got to do this right. And so how are we going to do it right? Well, we need more information. We need more time to work on things. So that's why I would suggest that we actually do a shorter one year or two year target and then learn from that. And then we can set a five year target perhaps after that, after we have more information, we have more clarity for people exactly, not only what the target is, but how we're gonna go about enforcing it. What's the follow through gonna be? What kind of PIPs are we gonna come up with for people, for all the different entities? Even how many entities we have, we still don't know exactly, right? I think, that, I think that's gonna be important for us to do this effectively and also with credibility, because if I don't think we have broad credibility, then this is not going to be successful. And that's my, frankly, that's my greatest fear. And I appreciate, um, so I do agree with what Dr. Kronick said. And I think that I have, I have significant concerns that this, that th there's some thought that, you know, we're not, this is not like a magical body that's going to say, well, we're going to pick a number and that's where people are going to be. And there's just going to be a few outliers and we're going to smack them down. We know that's not going to happen. Right? We have, we have to try to move a system. And if we're going to move a system, people have to be on board. And, you know, frankly, a lot of people came on board on this legislation, so they want to make it work. So let's make it work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ian, to you and then Elizabeth. Thanks. You know, um, Rick, your, your comments on Medicare and Medi-Cal remind me just what an experiment this, uh, the spending targets are. Um, you know, in the last meeting, we, we heard what a profound effect price setting had in Rhode Island on hospital costs. And uh, through the power of price setting Medicare and fee-for-service at least and Medi-Cal, um, have able, been able to win much more moderate increases over time. Um, for whatever reason, the legislature was not prepared two years ago to to uh, allow us to do price setting. It, certainly our jobs, I think, would be a lot simpler. I think they would be a lot simpler too if we were taking away the insurance functions and the resource allocation decisions from health plans and doing that through a unified finance state system. I hope that that will be on the table in the coming years in the legislature. Um, but right now we would be having a very, very different conversation if, if certainly if Medicare and Medi-Cal were representative of the whole market. Um, but if we continue to allow health costs to go up at 25 or 30 percent, the rate of people's take home pay, which is what 4 percent would be, um, we will accelerate this collapse of the employer sponsored health insurance market for millions of people. I mean, that has been happening over the last 20 years. I think the Monterey stories, those are the, the canaries in the coal mine, but to hear those from some of the workers who've won the best union contracts in the working class, like the carpenters, uh, really drives home that that is not an isolated example, that there is there are millions of people in this state who over the next five or 10 years may be looking at the loss of altogether loss of employer sponsored coverage and there is no backup system to catch them. They are not gonna fall back on ACA subsidies. They are not Medi-Cal eligible. Um, and, you know, I'd remind us that for all the great things the ACA did do, the number, the percentage of the population, at least nationwide, that is not un, underinsured, according to Commonwealth Fund statistics, has gone up. It's gone up from 56% to 57% since 2010. 
under the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, we heard today, we're reminded today that performance improvement plans, the, the actual enforcement process of these targets aren't going to happen until 2029 or become real until 2029. There are a lot of people in the state who don't have that time. So I do, I mean, when it comes to credibility, we owe it to the legislature and to, to voters to deliver on the promise of real affordability. And um, I don't know what the fallback is. I mean, price setting has to be the beginning. Uh, if if this does not achieve lower cost growth, particularly in the commercial market, obviously that's where we need to be. You know, I've bemoaned maybe that we can't go negative growth numbers. For, that's where I think the commercial market should be. I do think 3% statewide is achievable through the kinds of changes of care, incenting providers to take seriously, recognizing testing to see if a 15-year-old has scoliosis and interceding in a timely way. Um, those are the kind of shifts in behavior we need to see, but we don't have a lot of time to incent that. And so I think 3% is the right number. I appreciate stuff. You're, you're going round and round on these questions, but um, as a statewide number, that is right. I do think on the commercial side, we need to come in under that to, to achieve it. Um, and that'll mean some tough decisions, but we have to make some tough decisions as a state if we're gonna save the health system we have. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly. I don't envy you um, uh, as chair, but um, I actually think that 3% is too high. I think we are locking in a 15% increase over five years, and that doesn't achieve affordability. Um, I, when we talk about credibility, I, I completely agree. Credibility is very important, but it, credibility also with the people who took the days off from work to be here to explain how this is impacting them and their families and the legislature and the businesses who are paying these premiums. My brother runs a small business. He had a 40 plus percent premium increase. Where where does that come from? <laughs> so I, I truly believe that um, <laughs> that to achieve our task, which is to make healthcare more affordable, we have to be even more ambitious. And I, I've been just really disappointed. One of the reasons I asked David that question is I, I had truly hoped that the industry would bring us some good faith ideas, ways to achieve this goal. And because I believe they exist. I've personally been part of initiatives where we are demonstrating 10 to 30 percent, sorry, 10 to 50 percent reduction in total cost of care with better health outcomes, with better access through direct contracting for primary care or centers of excellence or maternity bundles. There are delivery system initiatives that do achieve affordable, high value health care. They exist. They haven't been scaled. I don't understand why. And then we are left in this, remember Harry and Louise, going back to the ACA, that um, the choices between affordability and rationing, I just don't believe that. I believe we can expect more from an incredibly well-resourced industry to innovate and to scale scale better care at lower cost. So I, um, I understand there's going to be complaints about you know, well, this is arbitrary or that is arbitrary. It's all arbitrary. We are here to make decisions, whether it's 10 years or 20 years or, but our task is to help make healthcare affordable. And I believe that is achievable, um, but I don't think 3% is going to reflect that. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Well, I'll, I will um, pick up on the theme of credibility. Um, I, I think we have a credibility crisis in our healthcare system in the state today. Um, we see that in surveys, we see that in personal stories. Um, and so uh, I think credibility is certainly something we should, we should take into account as we endeavor this. I also don't think we will get a perfect number 
under any methodology under any of these variables. And I don't think we should let perfection be the enemy of good. Um, on the economic indicators, uh, if, if the median is a little higher and people have a little bit more wages, it's really an opportunity to catch up in an economic environment where there's just huge and enormous economic disparities in our state. Um, so I'm okay with uh, getting that indicator wrong if we go back an additional 10 years. Um, I don't know what the perfect target is, um, but I know that what we are trying to do is to disrupt the system enough to have it fundamentally rethink what it's providing us on behalf of consumers and on behalf of patients. And that disruption comes in the form of innovation. It comes in the form of leadership. And I personally have a lot of confidence in our delivery system that it will find the waste that we know exists. And by the way, the waste isn't just money. It's also friction that people actually feel and experience by trying to navigate a deeply fragmented delivery system. And so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with setting a target at what OCA staff uh, has recommended. Might it be off by 1.1 or 0.2 for aging? I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I also know that people who are aging would prefer not be in hospitals and not be on ICU beds hooked up to things that they don't want and that are very costly. And I also know that of the list of you know, moderators or things that will mediate, some of those will be really important and some of them will fall by the wayside. We've talked about medical technology saving money for forever and very few of them actually have, as an example. Um, duration, we need time. Um, I, I agree with Dr. Pan that we're gonna learn a lot. We should learn a lot. And I think it takes time to both collect the data, understand what it means, see where we have enormous bright lights in the state of California, and then give the system time to get there. Um, so, um, I, you know, those of us who've tried to improve the delivery system for quite some time have said prevention actually makes people live better, live longer, live better quality of lives, be more economically capable, and yet we wildly underinvest in prevention. And we wildly underinvest in primary care despite what we know. And so if this is a, you know, the, the, the one thing we can do because the legislature put this in place and the governor signed this, then I think we should lean into it and lean into it hard. And I know that the leadership exists in this state to take these on. If we get it wrong and we learn a lot and we decide we need to reset it for whatever reason, we have the capability to do that. We have the data to be able to do that. And I would be interested in that conversation should we need it down the road. Thank you, David. Well, um, uh, first of all, thank you to my my colleagues on the board. I, I just want to recognize the uh, hard work of the office, the staff, and our consultants and everybody else who's contributed to where we are now. I, I, I look back on our, our process of um, you know, many months now and uh, think that we've actually made um, good progress. I think that we're, we're closer to a resolution maybe than we, we may think. Um, that said, um, I, I look back on my, my career in, in looking at uh, health policy issues, which is, I guess, you know, I hate to say this, maybe, maybe at, at least 30 some years, if not, <laughs> if not, if not longer, um, going back to being a county uh, intern in Los Angeles. But, um, but what I, I think one thing that's been a constant during, during that period of time has been um, our wringing of our hands over the cost of health care. I mean, we've been talking about health care reform, health care cost containment, um, as long as we've been talking about health care reform. And uh, I think that that graph from uh, Paul Krugman demonstrates uh, pretty clearly we've not been able to control health care costs um, despite big efforts. And I think we need a, um, a major recalibration of the system to, to achieve that. Um, I recognize all the, 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 the points that have been made, uh, credibility, um, uh, you know, accuracy of our indicators, things like this. And I, I, I do, do recognize that um, 
the reality for me is that many consumers are are falling further and further behind in terms of health care costs and it's their credibility that i'm especially concerned about because i haven't seen a real responsiveness kind of uh, from the other direction as i pointed out from the uh, advisory committee meeting um, and when I hear stories about um, somebody going, spending three hours in an emergency room and getting a bill for $25,000 and not knowing what to do about it, uh, all the other stories that we've heard, um, this is a system that is approaching, I think, the end of its, um, its lifespan, basically. Um, it could start to really fall apart here. And if we don't respond to the, the cries of the voting public in the state of California, um, uh, there may be another response that will have to come down around the corner. So I'd say that we're, we're actually very close. I'm I'm fine. You know, I, I I've agreed, uh, spoken before in support of a population-based measure that might include a, a demographic measure such as aging. I think I, that works for me. Um, I do also. Um, I'm fine with our economic indicator. That that that's fine. Um, target duration. I'm I'm fine as well. I, I recognize. I'm thinking about the similarity between this process and hospital seismic safety. You know, we we probably didn't get it right around the first time around, but We've made a lot of progress in the state of California. Uh, our hospitals are much safer today. We've required some changes and perturbations to statute and you know, our, our amendments and things like this, but, but we're getting to, to where we need to be. I, I think that what we do um, in the next, uh, next month or so is not going to be the, the be all and end all, and we'll have flexibility going forward. And it's that flexibility that I think is a hallmark of our, our California political process recognizing that um, if, if, um, if, if we don't act aggressively by setting a good goal, uh, we may um, receive a further direction uh, coming from our, our, our governmental leadership in the state of California. So I've ignored the, the, uh, the topic of the target value, um, but I'm comfortable with the office's recommendation. Great, thank you. Um, so I've been obviously thinking listening to the comments, taking in what the advisory committee feedback has been, the various letters that came in, and I just wanna offer deep appreciation to the public for sharing so many viewpoints and so much volume. I think it just uh, demonstrates the importance of what this uh, board has come together to do. I would also remind you that we're not the Office of Healthcare Cost Containment. We are the Office of Healthcare Affordability, which to me really uh, amplifies the voice of the people and the stories that we are hearing. I know they're related, uh, the cost containment goals and the affordability goals, but uh, it leads me to believe that the metric around household income is the right one to peg ourselves to. So just that comment around the approach, uh, the. 10 versus 20 year look back. I think that over time, what was a few years, uh, those those furthest years back in the 20 years are going to start to go away and we're going to reset and have this conversation again. And I hope that as we take this moment into the future that we consider the points that we're bringing up today and don't use that as an excuse to, to sort of change things even further. I think the methodology is important to highlight today why we are where we are. I've uh, appreciated in my job that California is a leader, not only home to one in eight Americans, but frankly, we're not first to do this, but we are doing it a little bit differently. The fact that we have enforcement capabilities is something other states hadn't built in. and. Um, you know, Dr. Pan, our conversations in making sure that that was an important piece of this and, and Dr. Wood and other leaders in the legislature who made this happen, the group that came together to think about this many years ago, I think built that in for good reason. So we had something to really dig into and, and make sure this wasn't just about uh, uh, a public conversation and testimony and this reason and that reason, but that it could, as you said, Sandra, really disrupt the system. And as I've been thinking about it, uh, you know, we do uh, early on, we spent a lot of time, not in this, in the board meetings, but in crafting this, we wanted to catch outliers. We wanted to make sure that some outlier wasn't sort of going unchecked and really 
in some ways harming a group of people in a specific geography or with a specific type of plan, but also what has become more and more important in my mind is just this view that we have a responsibility to push the entire system to be different. And if out of 700 entities, 600 missed the target, but 100 didn't, what did those 100 do that the 600 might want to do the next time and, and get built in? And how do we think about that to really move the system? It takes time. I appreciate the conversation about the first year being a learning year, but I hope every year is a learning year, that every year we're pushing our system to be a little bit better, not because of the threat that if we don't, some other action's gonna come upon high, but because of the urgency that we hear every day in this meeting of the stories of Californians who are struggling to pay for healthcare and all the other things uh, that they have to think about. One of the comments that resonated with me and all of the feedback was we want to be ambitious with our target. We want to make sure that it pushes the system. And I too appreciate the 3% as uh, the final goal. In my thinking, there is some space for us to consider the glide path consideration and maybe in the first couple of years starting a little bit higher and coming down over the course of that. And I would advocate for a five year uh, period where the first year is a bit higher. I know that's the first sort of non enforceable year, but then over time we go down from let's say 3.4 and 3.5 down to 3%. And that would be the 2029 goal if I have the years right. So as I've been thinking and preparing for the meeting, wanted to put that out there as a suggestion uh, for the board to consider. I think it balances some of the really important feedback that uh, we we heard. Uh, and again, uh, uh, you know, we will in our April meeting have a chance as soon as April to vote and think about not just the original board or uh, office consideration, but what I've laid out and, and maybe some other things to consider uh, as well. So as I've sort of piece together in my mind where we can effectively go, uh, what pushes our system adequately, what gives a bit more of that glide path consideration to our systems, but ultimately the message of 3% is clear, known, and that we're gonna get there over a little bit of time, I think is, uh, 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 is key and where my sort of uh, conclusion of all of the different feedback that we've gotten. I will also say that I've appreciated having some time to consider the various points of feedback, um, not just uh, jumping into the decision today, but giving us a little bit of time to consider what we're hearing here, the public comment that will follow. Uh, but to sort of summarize my comments, I would love to have the board consider uh, starting a little higher than 3% and over a course of a five year period coming down to 3%. How we do that from 3.4 or 3.5 down to three is I think worth some consideration. Uh, I do think some uh, consistency in telegraphing what that would look like if the board was interested in considering it like I'm suggesting that we would um, uh, be able to uh, approve that as well uh, in a, as soon as April. So I, I know that it's important to give people, uh, Rick, you went first. Maybe there's sort of other comments that you wanna share in response to board members or anyone else. Uh, I, I wanna give you that chance before we move to public comment. Don't feel pressure to take that option, but if you do have other I'm, I'm an academic. I yeah, talk, there we right? go. Good, Good. bring um, it. I, I appreciate the, the, the you know, comments from uh, all of my fellow board members. Um, and, you know, disruption as much or more as the, I, I support the goal of, of, of disruption here. Um, uh, I, I, I think we should just be aware that, uh, you know, a 3% target, if we um, are there on a, on a, uh, at some point on a glide path, uh, implies 
probably, uh, depending on, on what happens to Medi-Cal, and I don't have a good understanding of what Medi-Cal spending per beneficiary is likely to be, but it implies probably, you know, close to zero or 1% um, uh, annual growth in, in spending per commercial, per, per age constant commercial person. And, and that may be, and that would be a lot of disruption. And if we can get there, I would be uh, doing cartwheels. Well, not at my age, but um, uh, if I could do cartwheels, I would do cartwheels. Um, I am concerned about the, you know, we won't get started on it, that, that, that it will be seen, you know, if we're, if we're in, to repeat, if we're in the situation where almost all the covered entities haven't met the target and they all come in with excuses that, um, you know, the office may feel uh, sort of pressure to just accept all the excuses and that to, to, to get to the disruption that we are, I think, all looking for, there needs to be a credible threat to uh, people who are running hospitals and health systems that if they just do business as usual and get more, re keep getting more revenue, that something bad is going to happen to them. And I think it's tough for that threat to be really credible if it's sort of everybody's over, but I could be wrong about that. I certainly agree with you, Sandra. There's no perfect number here, um, but uh, I, I think, you know, having a sort of defensible way of coming up with the number is, is important. And at least the, the way we've started is, I mean, I could defend it, but it's kind of tougher to, to defend than some other approaches. Certainly recognizing the fact that we're getting older uh, makes sense of recognizing the fact that, that, you know, the federal government seems to be willing to put more money into Medicare uh, makes some sense. And I appreciate, Mark, your suggestion, which, um, you know, make, makes some sense to me, uh, uh, although, uh, you know, I would probably start at a higher place and glide down. Yeah. Thanks. Elizabeth, you're next. Just very briefly, I do want to associate myself with Sandra's comments on primary care if I haven't made that clear already. <laughs> I want more money going to primary care, um, however we structure this. And Mark, with all due respect, I think the last five or ten years have been the glide path. I think we've had plenty of time to get ready to reduce um, costs. So um, I hope we can be more ambitious sooner. If, can I, may I respond to one thing that, that, Rick, that Rick said? And I, I can't do a cartwheel either. Um, but so I just want to be clear that we will be looking at entities' total spending, but then we will be looking at them by line of business, and we would only enforce. So I hear the concern that um, if Medicare is increasing at 5.6% and the target is at 3%, then what will that, then the, really that's a smaller target for commercial. But we would measure the spending for each entity by commercial and Medicare separately and only engage in enforcement activities if they exceeded for that line of business is our thinking. I appreciate the clarification. Still, we will be asked either next month or in May to be voting on a statewide target, not a target by line of business. And to the extent that that statewide, in my thinking, that statewide target should reflect uh, our expectations about each of the lines of business separately and then kind of some weighted average of them combined. Other comments? Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, that really does speak to, uh, I appreciate your comments, uh, Dr. Kornick, and again, appreciate your expertise and wisdom and um, that if we set expectations that we have a 3% growth, but we're saying Medicare and Medi-Cal are out, then when you start averaging it back in, they're going to say, well, you said a 3% target, but actually what happened in the state was higher than that. I, I appreciate on the enforcement side that makes sense, but I think we have to be careful what expectations we're setting 
to people uh, as to what we're doing. So I think there needs to be some clarity there uh, because we said it's a statewide target. We didn't say it was a statewide commercial target. Uh, so, you know, I think we need to be careful how we, how we frame this. Um, and we are expected to do a statewide target. I think that's what the law says. So whatever average that comes out to be, we need to whatever round it up or whatever you know average it out or whatever else so and then we can say when we enforce the the expectation is that there's a three percent on the commercial side um because otherwise there's going to be confusion um uh, uh and back to, that's back to the credibility issue exactly how are we how are we messaging this people are going to expect certain things and it's that's not what i'm going to say but that's not what happened right um you know i um no, I, I still, let's this way. Um, first of all, I'm a primary care doctor and I've spent my entire career trying to promote primary care. So I have no problems you know, with trying to get more people in primary care. And frankly, again, as I pointed out, right now we know primary care doctors in the US, uh, there's been two studies already showing that they only spend about 28% of their time doing clinical work. So if we can get rid of some of the overhead stuff for them, we could actually increase our workforce right there. Yeah, well, we should do that. Yes, we should el eliminate some of the overhead there so I can spend more clinical time uh, time actually with patients. Uh, but um, so uh, I'm not sure the cranking down cost target changes that. In fact, oftentimes when you see that the response from organizations like plans and so forth is to increase the amount of interventions and so forth and, and overhead and 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 reporting and so forth. So let's so I think hopefully that will be monitored um, uh, when we do that. Um, the other problem, I guess, is I'm a pediatrician. And why is that a problem? Well, I take care of kids. Kids don't vote. So we're usually the rounding figure. We're the ones who get ignored, right? When someone does some grand thing, it, they're usually looking at adults and stuff because that's where most of the spending is. That's where people vote. That's where the influence is. And, you know, I, I, I hear people's frustrations. But I also hope we don't engage in, I'm a, you know, I guess I call it you know, somewhat magical thinking that just, you know, yes, we want disruption. But let's keep in mind, um, and I appreciate all the tech people out in Silicon Valley. Well, they broke our democracy. They broke public health. Right? You can, you know, life expectancy is down. Now we had a pandemic, but it's still not back up to what it was before the pandemic. Uh, and disruption for disruption's sake is not always a good thing either. And especially when we talk about healthcare. So I'm all for disruption, but we have to do it. We have to have managed disruption. I don't want to see people getting hurt. I take care of Medi-Cal patients, uninsured refugees, and I take care of kids. And too often I see policies that are passed that sound great, and I see families getting hurt. I see patients getting hurt. And so, you know, and I, you know, I, believe me, I am not, I, I hear people when they say I am having trouble accessing my care because I can't afford it. I also hear people saying, I can't access care because it's not there. It's not present in my community. That, it, that happens too. So we have to think about where we strike the line so that it's both present and affordable. Because if it's not present at all, or it's too far away or something, right? So certainly the cost is one part, but it also has to exist and uh, in, in the community. And so, you know, I think we have to think very carefully about how we do this in a way that doesn't cause that happen. You know, I appreciate the people coming to testify today. Um, you know, as a pediatrician, I really, you know, the, the, the gentleman who talked about his uh, child's scoliosis that was missed. Was that because there wasn't a cost target on Kaiser? Or was it because Kaiser asked their doctors to take on too many patients and they're not doing the screening? Or I don't know what happened. I can't, I don't want to speculate. But certainly I don't think the cost target was the reason why that was missed, right? Um, and it's interesting, his solution was to go actually to leave the system, right? A system that actually is vaunted and known for having better coordination of care. And that's how he found out that that was, I guess, missed. Although, you know, uh, so um, let's be sure of the solution that we're providing, you know, people, uh, 
I, I just want to be careful that people aren't expecting that just because we stick a low target that suddenly all these other problems go away. All right, that's that's not what's going to happen. In fact, some of them may get worse. And frankly, the easiest way to lower costs is to take is to basically find a way to get rid of the most expensive patients, right? Because what we know is the healthiest 50% spend about three and a half percent of healthcare dollar, the sickest 10 percent, two thirds, the sickest five percent, half, right? If you really want to get your costs down, get you know, figure out a way to discourage that five percent from seeing your system, and I want to be sure that that's not what we're caught, that's not the problem. And, and I appreciate what was said about, you know, there are mechanisms and, 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 and innovations. And the question is, why aren't they going to scale, right? Why aren't they going to scale? Is it because we allow people just to charge more and therefore that's why they, they didn't go to scale? I don't think that's the entire reason. It's possible that's uh, some of that, that may make people, but frankly, it's because what happens is that if you, especially for systems that improve care of people with chronic conditions, no one wants to be known as the place that takes the best care of someone with a chronic condition because then you attract all the expensive patients. And then everyone starts pointing your fingers at you saying, how come you're so expensive? Your premiums go up, other things go up, right? That's, that's, the, this, that's, the, that's the disincentive we have to confront and change because if we don't do that, Healthcare costs is not only going to continue to spiral up, you're going to continue to have more stories of people saying that they can't find care, they can't get care, et cetera, because what happens is everyone's playing hot potato with these patients. So, um, so again, I, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, I think we need, to, that's why I'm so interested in figuring out how we're going to monitor this, what's the improvement plans, how's that all going to roll out. Uh, exactly whatever the target is, whether it's three or three and a half or whatever else number, you know, what percentage of entities are we going to be having to review? What kind of plans are we going to come up with? Right? Because it's not just enough to put a lid. It's what's going to happen under the lid that's going to really matter to patients too. And that's, and that's what I'm concerned about is what's going to happen. Now we do, yes, we should have a lid. That's why I voted for this. Okay, I mean, I, after all, I was one of the people who voted for this and advocate other people vote for this legislation. So, but also, if we just simply stick a lid and we can't put it too low, uh, we're going to have a lot of behaviors that may be less than constructive. And I want to be careful that that's not what we just do, right? We, we, um, so, um, and, and frankly, that's also why you know, I'm advocating for a shorter period of time so we can learn and see what is the consequence of whatever number we pick, right? Or whatever methodology that comes up with the number that we pick, right? But I do think there needs to be some internal consistency with, 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 with that methodology and that number. So, uh, so I appreciate the, the, the proposal for a glide path, but uh, what's gonna be more important is also, is that, that in that glide path, we're also monitoring what happens as we're cranking down on the number and uh and and so uh and exactly how people respond to that and how they behave and to be sure they're not doing it away and the statute does say you know it's not just you know, affordability is really important but quality and access are too so the cost of affordability is de decreasing access decreasing quality that may not be the trade-off that people of california really want I'll just um, respond a little bit. I appreciate that the concept of the putting the lid on and then having all the activity underneath it. I think wherever you set the lid without robust activity, assessment, learning, engagement from this board, the continued invitation to people who may be struggling with that lid or who may be thriving under it because it's really shifted the conversations and we're starting to see the scaling of some of the things that maybe because there is no lid today don't get scaled the investments in primary care and other things that i think many of us believe are going to move the needle i think that is what's sort of exciting about the fact that this body doesn't go away after we set a cost our work we're here, right? We're going to have these conversations, and and uh, you know, a year, five years, or something in between. The learning, I hope or expect, is going to be constant. And um, remind folks that we have the prerogative to adjust, right? And we're going to, um, I think, have that obligation to consumers and our health 
providers across the state to keep an eye on that. And uh, that's just to say, I think the, the job isn't done in April or May. It just really gets started. Okay, other comments? All right, let's go ahead then and move to public comment. We'll now take public comment on this item. Those who wish to make a comment in the room, please step to the podium. Those online, please raise your hand. We'll alternate between the two. If possible, please keep your comments to two minutes so we can hear from as many people as possible. We will look virtually. Seeing one hand raised virtually, we will start. Um, William, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Um, William, you're Thank unmuted you. on our end. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Bill Kramer. I'm Senior Advisor for Health Policy, the Purchaser Business Group on Health. Speaking on behalf of large private sector employers and public sector purchasers, uh, I would like to reiterate on behalf of our members the seriousness of the health care affordability crisis. Uh, the high health care costs and relentless increases are unsustainable. They're squeezing, squeezing out wage increases, crowding out job growth and business investment. Before summarizing our recommendations, I want to correct something that was said earlier during the summary of the advisory board comments about Oregon's cost growth target program. Uh, I'm a member of the Oregon Health Policy Board, which oversees the Oregon Health Authority and its cost growth target program. And in fact, Oregon is not in the process of revising its cost growth targets. Summarizing our recommendations, we support the OCA staff recommendation that targets should be set based on a affordability uh, using median household income. We understand that meeting the targets will be a challenge for some hospitals, health systems, provider groups, and health plans, but the board is not tasked with forecasting the likely trends in healthcare spending based on provider input costs. Adjusting the targets upwards for inflation, aging, or other economic or population factors doesn't help affordability. It actually makes it worse. Uh, the board is charged with setting targets and improving affordability, and that has to be the North Star. We continue to be concerned that the 3% growth target does nothing to improve affordability, since it allows health care costs to keep going up at the same rate as median household income. Furthermore, we know that growth less than 3% is achievable, since there is enormous variation in the costs and cost growth between geographic areas and specific entities in California. Many hospitals and provider groups are able to provide high quality, accessible and equitable care at relatively low costs. We should learn from those best practices and encourage the spreading of those to the Excuse high cost me. providers. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and we appreciate the great work that the uh, staff and the board have been, has been doing. Thank you. To the individual at the podium. Hi, Ben Johnson from the California Hospital Association. Um, we have raised a number of concerns with the proposal, uh, citing significant flaws. We believe it goes too far too fast and that it would ultimately jeopardize access to life-saving care in California. And therefore, we've proposed an alternative framework that uh, attempts to account for the various drivers in healthcare uh, and would therefore ultimately protect that quality and access, which is an integral part of the office's mission and a requirement of the related statute specifically related to the spending targets. This would, our, uh, our framework allows for adjustments to account for high inflation occurring right now that are in fact in excess of the spending target proposal and higher uh, and have actually been ticking up in the most recent months according to the most recent available data. And this would prevent a, an actual uh, imposed decline in real healthcare spending as would be as would be fulfilled uh, under the target. We also propose adjustments related to technology and labor. Don't think that those should be uh, accounted for after the fact, but that they need to be reflected uh, up front because we our nurses' uh, salaries are growing every day, our tech salaries are growing every day, and in order to attract that workforce, we need to be able to pay them wages that are keeping up with inflation and so on. And for technology, because we don't want our patients to lose access to life-saving care. 
there are various policy changes that have been and are being implemented that are going to raise costs significantly, most notably the new healthcare worker minimum wage, which is going to raise costs by billions of dollars in the next few years and is unaccounted for in this proposal. And so this framework can be used as a methodology, but also as a way to assess the reasonableness of an alternative methodology. It yields very similar values to uh, those in Rhode Island, which re recently changed its methodology to account for the most up-to-date economic data and revised its value up to 6% in the first year, uh, declining thereafter. And so we just ultimately uh, implore the board to consider the multiple objectives in state law. We, uh, we believe that phasing in, as all other states do, uh, at minimum makes sense, uh, but we do believe a broader framework for evaluating the spending target is necessary and that consideration should be given to a one-year target. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Angela, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. Um, my name is Angela Gilliard. I'm the Director of Health Policy for the University of California uh, Health System, contain, in, including uh, six academic health centers and 20 health professional schools. Uh, UC Health shares the OCA goal of furthering the public interest in ensuring that all Californians receive health care that is accessible, affordable, equitable, and high quality. We respectfully request the board to set single year target instead of the five year target to provide more time to consider and resolve a myriad of issues. Um, in our letter, we pointed out, we pointed to several, but just a few. We asked that number one, you consider the complex healthcare needs of California's aging population and the increasing trend in patient acuity when setting the spending target. Uh, we all, we, while we support OCA's goal of increasing investments in primary care, we must emphasize that Californians, particularly seniors, persons living with disabilities, and patients with complex health conditions will always require specialized care and a spending target must support quality and equitable access to that specialty care as well, particularly for those who are disproportionately impacted by health disparities. The spending target must also allow UC Health to grow its patient volume and continue making the investments needed to meet the state's health care needs. All of the UC Health hospitals are operating at or above their maximum capacity, and we are unfortunately unable to accommodate thousands of transfer requests each year because of space and staffing limitations. Like many other hospitals, we continue to face challenges with discharging patients to post-acute care settings. We are intensely interested and concerned about how Medi-Cal and Medicare will be handled in the statewide target. So we look forward to working collaboratively with the board and OPA and other stakeholders to address these and other issues. Thank you. Thank you to the individual at the podium. Thank you, uh, Secretary Galley and uh, members of the board. Nick Luizos with the California Association of Health Plans. Um, we share OCA's long-term vision uh, with respect to affordability, and we really appreciate the uh, the thoughtful uh, discussion uh, and debate that was had today. Um, CAP and its member support a multi-year spending target um, that is uh, subject to annual review and adjustment uh, by the OCA board, you know, taking into uh, consideration certain factors. Um, we've under uh, we've argued that the underlying rationale needs to be thoughtfully um, developed, and the suggestions in our March 11th comment letter really revolved around the issues of attainability, um, achievability, and we were happy to hear comments from several board members today that really touched upon those ideas. Um, many of our specific comments were um, in the slide earlier, so I won't uh, go over them point by point. I would just say um, on that score, you know, uh, we were happy to learn that the board was not going to take action today and is really taking its time to consider um, all the feedback from the various stakeholders, particularly the entities that will be responsible um, and accountable um, for the uh, spending target. I will say, you know, Dr. Pan brought up an interesting point earlier. Um, on a process note, it would be helpful for stakeholders like CAP to, to understand uh, what form the actual and eventual motion uh, will be in. Um, some insight to that would be helpful so that we're appropriately and more thoughtfully and specifically linking any suggestions and comments to um, to that motion, so, or proposed motion. Um, um, I will leave it at that, and thank you very much. Thank you. Going virtually to Benjamin, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for letting me speak uh, to you all today. Uh, my name is Ben Armfield, and I am the Chief Financial Officer for Stoma Valley Hospital. 
which is a small independent district hospital uh, located up here in the North Bay. Um, certainly appreciative of the opportunity to share my thoughts on these proposed spending targets, um, as well as the uh, potential negative implications that this would have uh, for smaller standalone hospitals like Sonoma Valley and ultimately uh, patients in rural communities such as ours. Um, currently, right now, we are already stretching every dollar we are receiving uh, to meet the diverse medical needs of patients in our community. Uh, we do have robust plans to leverage both innovation and technology to increase and access, enhance access to care for residents in our community. Um, but there are real barriers right now um, that are impacting our ability to achieve this. Um, and we are concerned about how this target would both A, um, consider these factors and B, um, impact our go forward ability to meet the growing needs of our community. Uh, factors such as inflationary pressures, we are still dealing with the fallout from the pandemic, especially from a financial perspective. Um, we are seeing large double digit percentage increases in a lot of our support agreements, many of which were held flat uh, during the uh, uh, years uh, that directly followed um, the announcement of the pandemic. Um, not uh, uh, unique to um, us, we are still navigating through a severe staffing shortage, um, which has required us to rely more and more on traveler and, and registry resources to fill mandated ships. Um, so those are uh, some needs right now that we are trying to work through further. There are additional factors that are concerning to us that we feel uh, need to be part of the calculus for how these targets will be derived. Um, such as community def demographics. We have an aging population here in Sonoma Valley. Um, about 30% of our total population is age 65 years or older. Um, and our hospital inevitably shoulders higher healthcare costs uh, because of that. Two minutes. Um, and these costs are not arbitrary. They reflect the reality of providing specialized care uh, for an aging population. So um, along with seismic compliance, we have infrastructure upgrades that we're needing to be made, um, cybersecurity um, impacts as well. None of these costs are in our baseline. Um, and I believe while we are supportive of initiatives and efforts that result in more affordable health care for communities and consumers of those communities, we would welcome um, the conversations on how we contribute to making this happen. I believe implementing this target as is without considering some of the nuanced realities specific to healthcare rural communities um, could potentially be fatal for these smaller independent hospitals such as ours. And ultimately, uh, we do fear that this puts these types of hospitals at further risk for closure, uh, which obviously would be catastrophic for patients in these communities. Thank you. Thank you to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Sochi Reyes. I first want to thank you for um, taking the time and all of the effort um, going through this, starting somewhere. We have to start somewhere. I'm a school psychologist. I work for, for the Salinas Union High School District. I'm a, um, a mother of four. So I just want to share a story that, that happened to me in December. Um, I thought I was having symptoms of having a blood clot and I can't go the cheapest plan in my network, um, I can't go to the hospitals in my county. So I drove myself and I had to leave. I had to drive myself because I have four kids and my someone had to stay with the kids. And so I, as I was driving, you never think about things until you're like in it, until you're in the moment. And you, hyper, you think like, what would I do of this? And you don't know until it happens. And so I'm driving and I'm like, if I crash, if I something happens to me without you know, and I think about my kids and I think about it, it, it's a blood clot because I had every symptom because I had had surgery and I had flown and I just you think and and I get there and my husband's like, are you OK? Um, and I'm just thinking, like, why do I have to drive to another county because I'm shopping Target versus Walmart versus Dollar Tree type of cost? And I'm thinking. I'm like one paycheck away from if something like a medical catastrophe happened to me from filing bankruptcy. I'm a very healthy person. I'm a very active person. I'm hardly ever sick. So these like to me, even today, I'm on spring break. My kids are back home. But this is important. Got on the road with my colleagues at 530. And I just want you to know, like, it doesn't matter until it matters. 
until it happens to us personally or to someone that you really care and love, True. then it matters. So please, I have hope. And I walk away from here knowing that Rome wasn't built in one day. And we don't have the perfect answers. And we can get back to it. And this is a start. And I just, I want to say thank you. And uh, my hope is in you. That's all I can say. You know, I, I work. I've been a school psychologist for 20 years. I love what I do. I serve the public. Um, and I believe in you guys. You know, I believe regulations, just how, like when we don't meet test scores and the state takes over us, over school systems, I believe in you guys. And I want to thank you. I know you guys spend time away from here, away sometimes from your families to do this work. I appreciate it. And this is my livelihood. I'm just trying to keep up with groceries and utility bills. Three minutes. And I want to be able to have affordable care within my own town. And I want to not be able to think like, am I going to be able to pay this bill? Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing no hands raised, noting for the record, there's roughly 72 virtual attendees going back to the individual at the podium. Good afternoon, Katie Bassler, uh, Monterey County resident. I want to echo the comment that was made that Monterey County is the canary in the coal mine. And you're going to see a line of folks in behind me, and I imagine many of them are from Monterey County. And it's because the hospital systems have gone unchecked for too long. And so the work that you're doing here is so very, very valuable for so very many people. And you, we thank you. Thank you. No virtual hands. Going back to the podium. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Vicki and I live in the Monterey County and I know I've been here before just because I'm appreciative of what you guys do. And I got diagnosed with fiber hereditary hemochromatosis. The first year I did treatments two days a week, Monday and Friday, which I had to use my days off just so I could keep my insurance. The contract that we negotiated with Local 19 for our employment, our raises that we were supposed to get are going towards insurance. It took six months for me to get be told what was wrong with me. And unfortunately, I'm going to end up at one of those hospitals again, CHOP, Natividad, Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. Unfortunately, I am. My cancer will take me back there. Treatment will not end until the day I pass. Now they're doing it every four months, but I would like to invite you to go out there and do an investigation. Why do they get to charge the prices that they do? And again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Seeing no virtual hands, back to the podium. Thank you, Robbie Francescini with Blue Shield of California. I um, just want to thank the staff and the board for um, the really meaningful discussion today and analysis of the public comments that came in. Um, we're really excited to see the policy discussion get to this point um, as an early supporter of the office's creation. Um, while we do support the setting of a multi-year target, um, we do prefer a, a, a glide path approach um, kind of along the lines of what Secretary Ghali supported today. Um, so we look forward to further discussion on um, setting the target. Um, and then just additionally, I um, want to thank staff for the, the sort of news item today around creating a provider organization directory. We think that's going to be really critical to payers in our data submissions this year and in the data analysis as well, um, and to other state initiatives like the data exchange framework too. So thank you. Thank you. No virtual hands, back to the podium. Good committee. My name is Wilder Amaya from uh, Union Monterey Local 19. Uh, I'm here to respectfully request that you consider implementing a 3% cap on hospital prices in Monterey County. This will provide much needed relief to our community members who are struggling to pay high medical costs. As you are aware, the current state of medical billing is causing financial hardship on many individuals and families. A 3% cap will help ensure that patients are not forced to choose between paying for essential health care and other basic needs like housing, food, and utilities. I believe this measure will help to reduce financial stress and bankruptcies, support the well-being and stability of our community, 
help make healthcare more affordable for families and individuals. I understand that this request requires careful consideration and collaboration with healthcare providers and stakeholders. However, I firmly believe that it is within your power to make a positive impact on the life of countless individuals and families in our coastal area. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. No virtual hands. Back to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, just like the other ladies from Salinas, I also we have to drive this way uh, three hours and three hours back because this is a very important for us. Uh, Monterey County is one of the most beautiful places that you can live in, and also it's very expensive. If we add that, the cost of living and now the burden that we have to pay all the money that we're supposed to have for our salary going to towards uh, healthcare. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> we really appreciate you guys looking into uh, working it out. Hopefully we can get to the no more than 3% cap. And we also would like to invite you to visit Monterey County so you can see firsthand how beautiful it is and, that's, and why it's so expensive also. Thank you for your time. All. Thank you. Come back to the individual at the podium. Hola, soy miembro del United here, Loco 19 de Monterrey. Hello, um, I'm a member of Unite here, Local 19 in Monterrey. Mi nombre es Josefina García, trabajo en Asilomar. In Pacific Grove. Uh, my name is Josefina Garcia and I work at uh, the Silomar Conference Center in Pacific Grove. In el condado de Monterrey. Hace tiempo mi esposo se enfermó y lo llevé al community hospital en Monterrey. Después de una semana hospitalizado, él murió. Um, so a while back, uh, my husband got really sick and I took him to CHOMP, to the community hospital of Monterey. Um, he was really sick, was hospitalized for a week, and he passed away. Uh, fue muy duro para mí. Además, yo estaba recibiendo una factura grande y me preocupaba mucho cómo pagarla porque este hospital es muy caro. Uh, and as you can imagine, it was really difficult for me. Um, but on top of it, I was worried about the bills I was going to be receiving uh, because I know that this is a very expensive hospital. Afortunadamente, cal uh, califique para unos programas que no tuve que pagar, pero no puedo imaginar cómo hubiera afectado en mi economía, ya que me había quedado viuda con tres hijos. Um, I was able to qualify for different programs um, and didn't have to pay the whole amount, but I can't imagine how it would have affected me economically because I was left a widow um, to care for three children. Pienso también que si yo no hubiera calificado para esos programas, ¿cuántos miles de dólares hubiera tenido que pagar la aseguranza por mi esposo? I also think about if I hadn't qualified for these programs, how many thousands of dollars my health fund would have had to pay for my husband. Por eso yo les pido que investiguen por qué cobran tan caro estos hospitales en Monterrey. That's why I am asking you all to investigate why these hospitals in Monterey County are so expensive. Yo invito a ese comité a que venga a Monterrey a escuchar las historias de mis compañeros que no pudieron venir todo este camino hasta Sacramento a dar su testimonio. So I'm inviting, I'm inviting this committee to come to Monterey and hear the stories of my coworkers and my community who can't make it all the way to Sacramento to give their testimony. Yo apoyo el 3% spend the target for a, por año, pero no se tiene que Pero se tiene que investigar qué está pasando en Monterrey. And while I support the 3% spending target, 
uh, we need to investigate what is happening in Monterey County. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Bill, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Um, let's see, we're looking for William Barcelona. You are unmuted on our end. You have to unmute on your end. All right, we will come back around, going back to the individual at the podium. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, come to just have to say thank you for all the time you take it for us to listen a little bit. The whole stories we have in Monterey County. I come from Monterey County, and I have. You speak into the microphone, uh huh? Yep. I a housekeeper, um, hard worker. I, I luckily I never get sick very barely. I am single mother. My son does for his life already, but I imagine myself to get sick and go to the hospital and see myself how can i gonna afford the bills my salary is only for leave the cost pay rent full so how i gonna pay if in case i got sick so i just want to see why so spencer the three hospitals we have in uh monterey county the salinas valley memorial Hill, and um natividad and chump this is the hospitals i be in my area and I know Trump is very, very expensive. I don't have the experience. I well have in the past, my son went to the hospital for one day overnight, and um, I got received the bill after my insurance was $30,000 for being in there, pay half of the insurance and they got the bill. I lucky um, at that time, uh, my son was a student and an employee and I the only supported. So some ways they help us with some program to pay the bill, but I still pay like $3,000. So I don't know why we have this. I know Monterey is a very expensive, but I was still has to get regulations and medical is to have a nice health treatment. Um, we can support it. So Thank you very much, everybody, and appreciate it. See, welcome to come to our town. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Lynn, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Craiglin, and I'm the director of the Maureen Church Coburn School of Nursing at Monterey Peninsula College. I'm here today to talk to you about the nursing shortage across the state and how our community hospital is helping us to address this crisis. Healthcare stands as an essential pillar of society. However, the demand for skilled nursing professionals continues to surge. We're faced with an alarming shortage that is putting patients at risk. California faces severe need with projected shortage of over 44,000 nurses by 2020, 2030. Um, more than 55% of California nurses are over the age of 50 and expected to retire in the next several years. Our goal is to have every patient receive the care that they deserve where, and where aspiring nurses can empower, be empowered to fulfill their calling. The community partnership between our healthcare system and the college makes this possible. Community Hospital established our nursing school in partnership with Monterey Peninsula College in 1982, and we have since then um, graduated over 1,600 nurses. Um, due to our partnership, the school is able to avoid two significant challenges in nursing education, the nurse educator recruitment and retention, and also securing clinical placements um, and giving our nurses real world skills uh, and the hospital setting. Both of these issues plague nursing programs across the state and create a barrier which le leads to some schools to decrease enrollment, further exacerbating the nursing shortage. Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula supports our nursing school, um, not only by supplying nurse educators as nurse leaders in the hospital, but also bridges the gap in healthcare workforce and cultivates, cultivates a culture of excellence and compassion in healthcare. The nursing school enables hospitals to rely on, not rely on expensive traveling nurses, um, which can exacerbate costs also. And it also um, enhances patient outcomes and reduces wait times and elevates the standard of care. 
In addition to the partnership, grant funding from the Montage Health Foundation and Auxiliary have provided qu equipment and have a robust scholarship program. Am I out of time? You're at two minutes. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Back to the podium. Hi everyone, my name is Luis. I drive here from Monterey County. It's gonna be a six hours um, trip. And then um, I support the 3% uh, that I'm seeing, uh, um, thinking is uh, a little too much because this hospital, Sean, Salinas Valley, and also Natividad is already expensive. And then I invite uh, the OCA board to visit in our community. That way you can hear for the community what is going on and that way you can see how expensive these hospitals are already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking virtually, Yasmin, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Yasmin El Sherbini. I'm a director of community health and wellness at Aspire Health, which is an entity of Montage Health. The mission of my team is to inspire and support every individual to live their best life. And on any given workday, my team and I are tackling the highly prevalent health issues facing our local community, from the prevention of type 2 diabetes and childhood obesity to the prevention of drug overdoses from opioids and fentanyl. Type 2 diabetes prevalence in Monterey County is higher than for the state of California overall, and we know that type 2 diabetes can run in families. Our Healthy Together program partners with local pediatricians and schools throughout the county to refer at-risk children into our family-based lifestyle coaching program, which is offered in Spanish and English. Over the past several years, we've seen over 6,000 referrals into our program, demonstrating a huge need in our local community. Our program reaches children at the developmental stage when they're forming health patterns that they will carry into adulthood. And over six sessions, we educate children and their families on how to eat healthier, move more, reduce screen time, and set goals together as a household. In addition, the U.S. continues to face an opioid overdose epidemic. Monterey County is not immune. Our Prescribe Safe program partners with local schools to help support teachers educate their students about the dangers of substance use by providing tools for schools, including a curriculum, posters, and educational pamphlets. Our team supports substance use and overdose prevention efforts throughout the county with awareness campaigns, community events, and free naloxone distribution. All of these programs are free to our community, and none of these programs are a revenue source for our organization. They are all completely underwritten by Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula and the Montage Health Foundation. Without over $3 million in support over the past several years, my team simply could not implement the population health programs in our community, and we would not have the health impact that we see every day. We are fortunate that Montage Health supports our population health efforts to address the current and emerging social determinants of health needs of our community. Thank you for your time. Two minutes. To the individual at the podium. Good afternoon. My name is Chizuko Kyahun. I live in Seaside, California. I am local 19 union member. I worked at Hyatt Monterey for 35 years, housekeeping supervisor, and now I work Monterey Tizer Hotel Banquet Server for eight years. I am very happy to work there. I saw members and other people are suffer because they cannot afford some basic need of living here. The cost of medical is getting higher and higher every year in Monterey. Cost of medical is making life harder for the, those that, need, that really need help. Do you know Bay Area hospitals are very low cost than Monterey Peninsula? Bay Area, they have so many hospitals. We have few hospitals. The spending of, spending of community hospital ensure fairness to everyone, no matter their income is. We also need to focus on a cap so that no one is surprised with extra expense that we are really can't afford. Can we count on you guys to support 3% spending target per year? Because the community hospital is cost so high, should be investigate from state Please take this matter to Oka 
And also, I want to ask this committee to come to Monterey because there are many people who cannot come all the way to Sacramento because very far away, they have had to take off uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing that we have a dial in. Where is it? All right, looking virtually, uh, William Barcelona, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yes, but we can hear you. All right, William, uh, we can no longer hear you. Going to the individual at the podium, we'll circle back. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Renato. Thank you for the opportunity and to listen to everybody. I know we have a... <laughs> I'm so emotional. Um, long time ago, I have a, suddenly she hit me. I was one mile inside the car. So I was handling my arm. So I was pray and pray to stop the car. So finally she stopped the car and uh, I opened my eyes. I was in the hospital. And I was, wow. So this is why I know how this is to pay, because it's very expensive. And for me, 3% is hard. And uh, all people who are working hard, especially I work in banquets. So I'm so excited I can speak. Please help to count the rates more low. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So looking virtually, we see a dialing caller 916-606 with those three starting digits. Mm -hmm. Caller, you are unmuted. I'm gonna go ahead. Thank you. It is Bill Barcelona, America's Physician Groups. Thank you for letting me through. I just wanted to address the earlier comments that the industry had not submitted suggestions um, in comments regarding the cost target. America's Physician Groups uh, has indeed submitted a number of suggestions. Um, we've also had two presentations by our members, Sharp Healthcare and Memorial Care, on cost targets. I wanted to remind the board that the 2013 Berkeley Forum uh, vision contains a number of strategies to achieve cost uh, control while improving quality and access within the state. And these are strategies that are supported by the industry that were actually formulated by the industry and been, have been demonstrated over the past decade, um, which is also evidenced by the recent IHA data that shows that the integrated systems are delivering care at a 3.12% cost versus fragmented delivery models at a 9.93% cost trend. So we do have suggestions that I believe can be helpful in this area, but they derive from the fact that we need more first dollar coverage models that support alternative payment models for providers. This is how we do generate the right kind of cost control and access at the same time. I'd also like to endorse the position taken by Secretary Gawley today for um, a ramp up in terms of how we impose the cost target. That seems to be a very thoughtful approach. And lastly, I would also like to endorse um, the adoption of a statewide provider directory. Thank you. Thank you to the individual at the podium. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosaura, and I live in Morode since 25 years. Uh, I'm a housekeeper for 20, 20 years also. Uh, I live in a tourist, beautiful 
place with nice sightseeing places and a wonderful weather. It makes expensive place to live. Um, also, I, I'm a volunteer in the insurance uh, and I am encouraging my family, myself and my co-workers how to live healthy, how to be out of the hospitals the most possible, uh, but sometimes it, it's, not, it's not enough, right? It's not enough. When you have an illness or something, medical help is not a business. Uh, the choose if you take it or not. Medical emergencies is something that you plan, you don't plan or not. Hospital is a place where you don't want to go, but you have to go when you need it. Um, also, I want to say to you guys, um, last year we didn't have any raise. We have been making $20, $21 uh, for a long time because that play, uh, when we negotiate a contract, we, we use 550 cents for the insurance per hour. And in this time, for because the bills cost, they, they are uh, requesting $1.85 for our money that we don't have it. So that's why we didn't have any any increase in salary. Um, also, um, that way it makes more poor. Uh, all community talk about the hospital prices are too expensive. We urge to the board to investigate why prices are so high. I think price has to be affordable for all community even people who visit more rural Bay Area. Where I live, I have been seeing this so many times, uh, people that have been uh, coming here and visiting us, they have been having emergencies that had to go to, the, to go to the hospital and receive a huge bill comparing to the place where they are coming yes. from. Today, I'll, I took my day off to drive, like my, my, my friends and co-workers, six hours back and forth, and you know, everyone can do that. That's why I invite once again to the board to come to Moruray and hear a community concerns. Also, my co-worker, family, and I think that 3% is, is more than enough for a spending time target if our prices is already too high. Thank you so much, and see you, uh, see you guys there. <laughs> Thank you. So the individual is going to pass. Good afternoon, Teresa Stark with Kaiser Permanente. We want to first thank the OCA staff and the board for all of the work and the hours of robust conversation that you have had on this topic. We know this is just a fraction of it, so we, we do appreciate it and for utilizing the full time you have to adopt this target. Um, as we've said, we fully support OCA uh, and the mission and goals of the organization in improving affordability. We agree the status quo is not sustainable. Um, we do appreciate the suggestion today by Secretary Galley to consider a phase in, although it sounds like it would still start at a pretty aggressive starting point. But we do think that such an approach would help achieve our mutual goals, very strict still, but in a, in a, a measured and more achievable way. It would create a bit more space um, for us to learn as the results come in and we can adjust accordingly. As I said, it still will be challenging even for Kaiser Permanente, a, a high performing integrated delivery system, um, because there are still costs that we are experiencing in our system uh, that will exceed that despite our best efforts. For example, pharmaceutical costs, the obesity drugs as a specific example, um, those are going to be very costly and very difficult. And inexplicably, Americans are paying five to 10 times more for those drugs than many other countries. That is just one thing that will be going on under that lid uh, that hopefully we can all work on together to begin to make a meaningful difference from all the folks you've heard from today. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, Daniel, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daniel Tobaya, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Montage Health. Our hospital has been in the community for over 90 years now, and we are proud to be a preferred employer and provider of care in this community. Now, we exist to serve the needs of our community, and we take that responsibility very seriously. We also agree that uh, healthcare is expensive uh, for all Americans, and that we need to do something to address that cost. Monterey County is an expensive place to live. Uh, and that's why our philosophy is to pay our staff at 
the 75th percentile of all our Bay Area wages. And this applies to people that cook, people that clean, as well as those that take care of our patients at the bedside and in the offices. Uh, but this does not uh, compute with the, the payer mix that we have in this community. 80% of the services that we provide are to patients covered by either Medi-Cal or Medicare, whose patients only cover a bit of our costs. Despite that, we still continue to pay our staff at the 75th percentile of the Bay Area averages. So while we agree that the cost of care needs to be addressed, I mean, the best way we feel as a, as a community is to get at the table and talk about it and discuss many, many opportunities and options that are available to be able to reduce the cost and take advantage of everything that can be done at the negotiating table. We appreciate the efforts of OCA and the people that are involved to discuss this very important subject and look forward to further opportunities to make a difference in the care that we provide. And we do encourage OCA to come uh, to Monterey County so that they can see for themselves and we can get an opportunity to discuss with you uh, our goals and our intentions. Two minutes. Service. Thank you. Thank you. And the individual in the room. Hi, uh, my name is Veronica. Um, I'm a Monterey County resident. I was born and raised in Salinas. Um, I'm also the proud daughter of farm workers, um, and I work now with Unite Here Health, um, helping um, all of the, the folks that went before me, housekeepers, folks that work in food service, learn how to use their insurance. And um, I, I actually work with a national plan, um, so think about cafeteria workers and different stadiums and universities across the country, many who have won the union and have won um, health insurance for the first time, so teaching folks how to actually use their health insurance. Um, my favorite part of my work is I get to work with um, members who are learning how to navigate the healthcare system and are also managing chronic diseases. So um, every week I talk to diabetic folks um, about you know, how they should be following uh, all of the things that their doctors are telling them to do. Um, but the conversations look a lot different with uh, members in Monterey. Um, with members in Monterey, it's more about how am I supposed to pay my medical bills and rent and food and care for my children? So I, th I think overall, um, while you know, I'm going to echo what everyone has been saying before me and invite you all to come to uh, Monterey to do an investigation because the pricing is just too high and 3% um, is way too much uh, of a spending uh, target for Monterey. If anything, we should look to investigate why it's so high there, why, um, why the cost is so high there. So thank you. Thank you. To the individual in the room, please. Members of the board, staff, I'm Steve McDougall, still with CFT. Um, hasn't been a coup d'etat since the last little bit. I'm still, still in leadership there. And there's a new thing that happens, kind of like the old, uh, the old uh, fable of Rumpelstiltskin. If you say his name three times, he appears. If you hear from three montage employees in this meeting, I magically appear at the podium. Now, montage has been busy late last year moving forward. They've been busy forgiving medical debt for quite a few folks in Monterey County. Only after a Bloomberg article, a Cal Matters article, and a local Monterey County periodical published something about hospitals in Monterey County, including Montage. Montage recently had their state of the organization shindig recently, where they announced they're donating $5 million to just teachers only. Uh, Montage must re think that only teachers work in schools and nobody else does. I guess only doctors and nurses work in hospitals and nobody else does. They do all the administrative overhead and cleaning and cooking and everything. Um, but uh, um, taking $5 million from their $1 billion reserve is akin to, well, one half of 1%, but it's also akin to pulling up to the intersection, seeing the person you know, with asking for a, a donation in the median who's down on their luck, noticing that some neighbors next to them looking at them and they bypass the pocketbook 
they bypassed the silver in the ashtray and they reached down to that penny stuck on the floor mat and they reach out the window and hand it, hoping they've been seen doing something good. Well, we're on to you. When you put out a press release that you've worked with unions and savings don't go down, give me an example of that. Unions had a meeting with Montage on March 5th because the unions asked for one, but give me an example of where they've worked with unions and savings didn't come down to somebody. I, I, I show me some evidence of that. Show me some evidence of that that they're doing what's best for the community with their pricing between four and five hundred percent above Medicare. Tell me what they're showing doing well from the community when the CEO in 2021 made 2.4 million dollars. I don't know what it is today. I assume it's more, you know, with inflation and everything. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing no hands raised, noting for the record, we have roughly 65 virtual attendees. Looking back to the individual at the podium, please go ahead. Hi, Ivana Krajcinovich with Unite Here Health. Um, Steve, you know, always a mistake going after Steve, so a little bit of my thunder. I wanted to share some data that um, some of the providers are not sharing, particularly in Monterey County. Uh, when you look at CHOMP's um, financial data on the HCI financial data, they had double digit operating margins um, every year from 2014 to 2021, um, an average of 12.5% over this period, much higher than the statewide average of 3.4%. Um, on top of that, they have the $1 billion in reserves, which makes them you know, very generous to write off debt and to have wellness programs because they're using our money to do that. Um, so while they don't talk about their healthy operating margins or their reserves. You do, as you heard from a previous speaker, talk about their payer mix. Um, Chomp and Salinas Valley Health have claimed that the Bay Area hospitals have 50% more commercial payers. Um, we're not really sure what this refers to. Again, we looked at 2020 HCI data, and there's only a 6.4% difference. 21.4% of discharges at Chomp are third-party managed care compared to 27.8 in the 12 Bay Area counties. Moreover, this difference in payer mix doesn't seem to explain the huge difference in prices. Um, I've testified before that in 2022, we paid 559% of Medicare uh, at CHOMP, and we just finished 2023 data with three months of runout, and it is at 521%. Um, moreover, just to drill down a little bit to see, since those are averages, we took a look at, we had three admissions for DRG057, which is degenerative nervous system disorders without major complication or comorbidity. The Medicare DRG um, price is $14,436. We paid CHOMP for uh, the three cases we had between $73,000 and $250,000. So the hospitals maintain that they need to charge commercial payers like ourselves more to make up for a shortfall in revenue from other sources. So the question is, what percent of Medicare do they need? 500 percent? I mean, honestly, you don't know why, didn't, why they stopped at 500 and didn't go up to 800 or 900,000. They could fund a lot more in Monterey with that money. Um, the Nashby Hospital Cost Tool Estimate uh, estimates CHOMP's commercial break even is between 245 and 275 percent of Medicare, which is still above the 222 percent statewide average. Um, so like the other speakers have said, um, we'd really suggest that OCA perform a cost and market impact review of Monterey County to get to the bottom of all of this. Um, between data from RAND, HCAR, HCAR and other third party sources, it's pretty clear to us that Monterey hospitals are outliers and they need a sector target well below the 3% target. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing one hand raised. Kevin, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks again for your time. Kevin Kazi uh, with Montage Health. Um, all I'll say in relation to the last couple of speakers is that again, they, you know, conveniently look at math through specific and don't at all look at all of the public health work that we do that's been articulated by a couple of other people uh, from our team uh, that are countywide, free to the public. We provide scholarship support for people wanting to get into healthcare in the first place. Uh, we spend on average about $40 million a year to uh, underwrite the losses of Montage Medical Group because we pay every one of those physicians a salary. But the condition is they have to take every patient who comes in the door regardless of their insurance capacity, uninsured, underinsured, or insured. 
We're agnostic. We take care of literally everybody who will walk in the front door. That's hundreds of thousands of people every year in a county of about 450,000 people. The last two the people that got up and spoke speak on behalf of 0.02% of the people that live in this county. We take care of wonderfully many, 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 many more people than that, many of whom have no ability to pay or very little. So we structure ourselves to be a true community health system to support everybody in this community that needs our help. We are agnostic about it. And I, for one, am very proud of that work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Back to the individual in the room. Beth Cabell with Health Access California. We have supported the staff's recommendation for 3% over five years. We have also been in conversation with others. We have reviewed all of the comments that were provided to you, both in writing and at the advisory committee. They seem to fall roughly into two camps. There is one that is, I would say, business as usual. The cost of health care is the cost of health care. Pay us the cost of health care. Without any regard for the damage that you've heard about time and again, caused by the lack of affordability. The second group of comments, um, and I find myself in an unusual place in that some of the health plans shared this approach, was to start with consumer affordability. And we have some differences with them over the specifics, but they started there. And that's an important distinction. I wanna go back to something that um, Dr. Kronick said earlier and then a number of you have echoed, which is that somehow we need to change the decision calculus of those who run health systems. All too often they're focused on generating revenue. And when they come and complain about Medi-Cal doesn't pay enough, even though hospitals receive more than 100% of Medicare from Medi-Cal, when they come and complain about there's not enough money and they has to cost shift, that's all about revenue generation. We are starting to have some conversations about how to manage costs and to do it in a way that manages costs to improve quality and improve equity. And that's the conversation we had hoped we would be having here. And so we're glad to see a little, a green shoot or two coming up. Two um, and to begin that conversation, that's the conversation that we had hoped that OCA would precipitate within the healthcare industry. Thank you. Thank you. Looking virtually, seeing no hands raised at this time, noting we have roughly 60 virtual attendees. Looking to the room, anybody like to make public comment, please step to the podium. So seeing that, no one at this time, that concludes public comment. And that does conclude our agenda for the day. Yes, no, Board I Member Hernandez. I was just gonna ask, unless there's something else that you or your team wanna do, I think we would appreciate everybody who took their time away to come and talk to us today. Um, super powerful stories and we're very appreciative of that as well as all the public comment. And I think we stand adjourned until we see each other again next month. Thank you, everybody.